love getting in the weeds. My brain is just exploding, is the thing. Shrek is my best friend. Shrek is the only thing I can think about. Are you done? Hi, my name is Haley Whipjack, and today we're talking about Shrek. All of it. You see, there was just an announcement that Shrek 5 is in the works. I don't believe it's hit pre-production, much less production yet at this point, but it is in the works. It is coming. And we must be ready. So in this video, I will be watching, summarizing, discussing every single installment of the Shrek franchise so that we can be prepared. And I'm attempting to speed run it because time is always of the essence. My goal, my big pie in the sky dream is that this takes me a week to watch and record all of these segments, not the edit, Lord. Seven days, seven days of complete Shrek immersion. I will become the swamp. I will understand the ogre. My mental health means nothing to me in the face of Shrek. If you don't know what Shrek is, you're a liar. Yes, you do. If it's been a while since you've experienced Shrek, Shrek is a cinematic universe consisting of four main movies about our ogre, Shrek. And we're going to get into all of his sort of misadventures and shenanigans. But what you need to know is Shrek is a perfect franchise. Shrek is a perfect fairy tale. Shrek has never done anything wrong. And we're going to be Shrek experts. Do you think you know all the Shrek franchise installments? I bet you don't. I bet you don't. We are going to hit all of them in order of release date, even the ones that I don't want to. <laughs> I asked you a question and then I didn't provide you an answer. And, and I am sorry about that. There are 21 things we're going to discuss. 18 of which I would consider installments in the franchise. But there aren't 18 movies. I didn't say movies. I said installments. And I have 21 things to watch for you, for me, for us so that we're all caught up and no man is left behind. When I tell you we are going to leave this experience as collective shrek spurts, I would never lie to you. Sitting here right now in day zero, I don't know how long this video is going to be. I don't know what we are going to look like by the end of it, but there's only one way to find out. And that is simply by beginning. Yeah, this one doesn't even count. Chapter zero is Shrek. It's a book. It's still day zero. By the way, even on the same day in between parts, I intend to change things up a little bit, keep myself sane, keep it a little funky and fresh in here. This one doesn't count because it's not something you can sit down and watch and it's not part of what I would consider the modern day Shrek franchise, but it is what inspired Shrek 2001 the very first time around. Yes, Shrek started out as a book. If you want to hear me describe this book and gush about it for like 20 minutes, you are in luck. It's on my channel. It's the first link in the description. I'm not gonna do it again here for you. We just needed to acknowledge it and I needed to remind you yet again to go purchase this 30 year old children's book. It's fantastic. Next. April 22nd, 2001, the world changed. The first dominoes fall. This is when the public is first exposed to a movie using state-of-the-art animation technology, 3D computer-generated graphics developed specifically for this film. A movie made to parody and subvert other animated fairy tale stories, adding in commentary about the types of morals often present in those stories. And are those even good for kids? A movie that was selected for preservation with the National Film Registry in 2020 by the Library of Congress for its cultural significance. Shrek begins. And this is where I have to say, officially, I guess, spoilers for Shrek. The movie opens with Shrek, voiced by Mike Myers, reading a fairy tale and then promptly telling us that the fairy tale is stupid and wrong and he doesn't like it. And it cuts to the classic All-Star by Smash Mouth opening. Somebody want, don't Somebody want. This opening informs us that Shrek lives alone, likes it that way, and is generally really, really gross. And we also come to understand his place in society very quickly as a mob of pitchfork-wielding humans comes to get him. This is the part where you run away. 
After Shrek terrifies them off, he finds a flyer saying that you could turn in fairy tale creatures for money, which is odd. But the thing is, Shrek doesn't care about literally anybody's life except for his own. And nobody's going to start rounding him up because of how big and mean and scary he is. So he just continues about his day. However, if you zoom the camera just a little bit further into the trees, you will find a group of fairy tale creatures being sold. One of those creatures is Donkey, voiced by Eddie Murphy, who is in the process of being sold as a talking donkey as much as he's trying to convince them that no, he's not, he's so normal. Don't you want to let him live free? He lets it slip that he can talk. He can talk. Uh, uh, that's right, fool. Now I'm a flying talking donkey. He runs away, the guard pursues. He runs directly, ass first, into Shrek. This is also where we see Lord Farquaad's logo, symbol? For the first time, and it looks exactly like the Facebook logo. It's just the F in the blue and the white. And I think this movie definitely came before Facebook got big. So why did Facebook do that? Anyway, Shrek scares off these people too, and now he's stuck with Donkey, who refuses to be bothered that Shrek is an ogre, even when Shrek is actively trying to push him away, both physically and emotionally. He doesn't do well with other people. Donkey insults Shrek's swamp and then immediately starts to try and overcompensate for that by complimenting very random little things, such as the boulder that he sees. I like that boulder. That is a nice boulder. Donkey, nowhere to go, alone in this world, seemingly not a single person who wants to put up with him, begs to stay with Shrek, who reluctantly agrees to it for a single night. Uh, but he has to stay outside. And Donkey's still really annoying about it. And Shrek doesn't handle it well, okay? Because man's an introvert. And he doesn't have a lot of practice with patience. And the donkey sings a lot. However, it's at this time that Shrek discovers that his home and swamp are being invaded with those displaced fairy tale creatures, including those that are being sold earlier. What are you doing in my swamp? <laughs> so I guess... The being sold was just for a reward for the people who took them off of their lands so that the crown could seize their lands and displace them? This entire conceit is like never really explained. Farquaad doesn't like fairy tale creatures. He mentions it, but uh, why this? And if you really wanted them gone, some of them are just like mice. I think your people could have handled that one. Shrek tells all these fairy tale creatures that he's gonna get Farquaad to send them back to where they came from. And they're also stoked that they see him as a hero because that is what they wanted. <laughs> so they go to visit evil Lord Farquaad, voiced by Harvard graduate John Lithgow. And Lord Farquaad is short. He's little, a small man, a short king, a little guy. Any joke in this movie about Lord Farquaad is gonna be about that. <laughs> and a lot of them are good. I'm sorry to say, a lot of the short jokes are good. They're good short jokes. He doesn't quite measure up. Men of his stature are in short supply. Come on. Meanwhile, at Lord Farquaad, the gingerbread man is being waterboarded um, and taunted with his own severed legs until he will give up the locations of more fairy tale creatures. And oh my God. Oh my God. The Muffin Man? The Muffin Man! This scene does introduce us to Thelonious, who is a torturer under Lord Farquaad. And he's, he's got like an executioner hood, but we never see him doing an execution. And I do like Thelonious. I wish he wasn't doing that to the gingerbread man, but I think we all deserve somebody in our lives as ride or die as Thelonious is for Lord Farquaad. And I think if he just had better friends, he would be a much better man. I know what to tell you, I see a bit character with no real role, I adopt them as one of my own. Uh, Thelonious, you were saying? Anyway, Lord Farquaad has a magic mirror brought to him and he demands a wife because he can't be a king without one. I don't know why, he just can't. The magic mirror shows him multiple options as though he's going through some sort of women catalog where his options are Cinderella, Snow White, and Fiona. When they go to Snow White, the magic mirror says, Although she lives with seven other men, she's not easy. Anyway, encouraged by Thelonious and everybody else, Lord Farquaad chooses to go with Fiona. The only issue is that Fiona is locked up in a tower, guarded by a dragon, and Lord Farquaad is not gonna be the one to go get her. So he will hold a tournament to decide who gets the honor of picking up his wife delivery for him. Like it's fantasy DoorDash. Hoard, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Shrek's 
Shrek and Donkey arrive in Duloc, the place where Lord Farquaad is, and it's very theme park. It's very uh, Disneyland. <laughs> And our two boys arrive just in time to crash the tournament. Some of you may die, but it's a sacrifice I am willing to make. Where immediately Farquaad changes the rules last second to say whoever kills the ogre wins. Because Farquaad, not an ogre fan, does not like those guys. The ogre wins, obviously. It is a full... WWE match set to Bad Reputation by Joan Jett. The soundtrack for this movie is so good. <laughs> Sometimes I do ponder about if Shrek was made now, what kind of music would be on it. And I do know Uptown Funk would be there. I know for a fact Uptown Funk would be there. Bruno Mars just makes Shrek music. The more I'm thinking about it, Bruno Mars makes music for Shrek movies that don't exist. Maybe Shrek 5. Farquaad agrees to Shrek's terms that if Shrek and Donkey go pick up his package from the post office, uh, he will once again relocate the fairy tale creatures. Doesn't say where to. Doesn't say what he's going to do with them. Just that they won't be in the swamp anymore. Don't like that. Hey, Shrek, ask some more questions. I know you don't care about any of them. Life is not sacred to you, I understand. <laughs> so our heroes travel to the castle where Fiona is locked up. And on their way, Shrek tells Donkey that ogres are a lot more complex than just being these killing machines that everyone sees them as. They have layers, just like... um. Like something, something that has layers. Puffy. And they eventually arrive at a big spooky castle surrounded by a moat of lava. Sure, it's big enough, but look at the location. <laughs> oh, Shrek. Donkey goes looking for stairs to get to Fiona. Shrek goes looking for the dragon. Donkey finds the dragon and she's beautiful. I love her. Dragon corners Donkey and he panics compliments her a bunch <laughs> and, she, and she whisks him away. I don't know why that's his panic response. I respect it though. It's very barred energy. Shrek however gets physically launched into Fiona's room in the highest room of the tallest tower and she is not impressed with his romantic gestures. Fiona, voiced by Cameron Diaz, has had years and years and years and years to practice in her head how this scenario is going to go when she is saved by her true love. And he takes her away from this place. And Shrek is not hitting any of the checkboxes that she created that he did not know about. It's a travesty. And before they can leave the castle, they do have to go back and save Donkey from the dragon that has immediately become infatuated with him. And to do so, they trick her into tangling herself up in chains so that she can't follow them out. Um, and she sets the rope bridge on fire as they go and they leave and she can't follow them. And she makes like a legitimately... Sad yelling sound. Her and Fiona had to be close, right? They were all each other had for years and years and years. I just feel like they had to kind of know each other. It's sad that they're gone. <laughs> Fiona demands to see the face of the brave knight that rescued her. And he really doesn't want to, to take the helmet off to show her he's very nervous. Uh, but he does eventually reveal that he is an ogre. And Fiona immediately demands that Lord Farquaad come and get her himself. Because she does not know that guy. And how silly of a request that is for him. So Shrek just picks her up like a bag of potatoes. Carries her off. And Donkey immediately starts asking Fiona for relationship advice about Dragon. It's very cute. Say there's a woman that digs you, right? But you don't really like her that way. Now, how do you let her down real easy so her feelings aren't hurt, but you don't get burned to a crisp and eat? How do you do that? Just tell her she's not your true love. And while the boys just want to keep traveling overnight, Fiona does make them stop and camp so that she can hide away and sleep. Which is when we get a really genuine conversation between Shrek and Donkey about how people immediately make assumptions about Shrek based on his appearance, based on what they think they know about ogres, and how it's safer for him to be isolated and push every single person away than it is to let a single person in because of the damage that they could do. They genuinely bond here and become friends, and they talk about constellations and what Shrek thinks all the constellations are. And I like it, and it's cute, and it's a good scene. And then the next day, Shrek and Fiona start to really bond and actually get to know each other. And they're attacked by Robin Hood kind of out of nowhere. And then Fiona kicks all their asses again, kind of out of nowhere. I bet Dragon taught her how to do that. I bet they ran drills, sparred, had to get boring up there. In the fight, Trek gets an arrow to the ass. 
So Fiona sends Donkey off to go get flowers so that she can help, uh, which is also where we learn that Donkey is colorblind. So that's a fun little canon fact you can keep in mind. One's blue flower, red thorns, blue flower, red thorns. This would be so much easier if I wasn't colorblind. I said that like I know for a fact they're going to contradict it later and I'm going to catch them in it. I, d I don't think they do. I don't think they do. It's just a fun Donkey fact. <laughs> Shrek and Fiona end up getting caught in a little bit of a compromising position after they stumble. Uh, and Donkey makes fun of them and then immediately passes out at the side of blood. And then Shrek picks him up and they keep going. I have to assume that Shrek loves just being able to throw people over his shoulder and go about his day. He does not stop doing it. Any opportunity for him to have a person over his shoulders or in his arms as he goes about his tasks, he is taking it. Rattle montage, Shrek and Fiona continue to get closer, getting to know each other and realizing they're both gross, but in a way that they're both into. The scene where they're like shoving each other with their shoulders as they walk down the path is like actually, like it, Ugh, I'm weak. <laughs> and then they both organically just start lying to Donkey, saying that he looks injured and sick. And oh, we definitely have to stop and camp again tonight. We can't, we can't make it to our destination tonight. We need to stop it so we can travel another day together. It's important. Making excuses so they can spend more time together. It's sweet. It's sweet. <laughs> I think I need a hug. Shrek even invites Fiona to come visit him in the swamp sometime. He hates people visiting him! But out sunset, Fiona panics. Runs to make herself a shelter so she, that she doesn't have to be out in the dark. She's telling them she's afraid of the dark. Donkey tries to convince Shrek to tell Fiona about his feelings. Shrek is emotionally constipated about it. Donkey goes to find her himself, and he does find her. Transformed into an ogre! Turns out that Fiona is cursed to turn into an ogre every night until she has true love's first kiss. And then she will take on love's true form, which she assumes means she doesn't have to turn into an ogre anymore. By night one way, by day another, this shall be the norm. Until you find true love's first kiss, and then take love's true form. She hates this about herself. She hates this form. She was taught to loathe it, and she does. She calls herself an ugly beast. And in fact, Shrek overhears her saying, who could ever love a beast so ugly? Princess and ugly don't go together through the door. As he was going to come in and try to talk to her about his feelings for her, uh, he assumes she's insulting him and immediately storms off through the night to go get Lord Farquaad so he doesn't have to talk to her again. Fiona makes Donkey swear to secrecy. He does. I do like this as a moment establishing that those two also very much trust each other, even though they haven't necessarily had an explicit bonding scene before this. It's good. In the morning, Fiona does decide she should tell Shrek the truth about her. Tell him. I tell him not. I tell him. But he has returned to tell Fiona he heard everything and agrees no one could love a hideous, ugly beast, which is the worst possible miscommunication in both directions. I hate miscommunications as a trope. They're all over children's media. I, I hate just talk to each other for like 15 seconds. 15 seconds! But Lord Farquaad is here with all of his knights. He proposes, Fiona accepts, and requests they get married literally immediately before the following nightfall. So they have like 12 hours to plan and execute a wedding. As somebody planning a wedding right now, I don't, I don't think that's how it works. I don't think that's right. Shrek screams at Donkey about how they aren't friends and he doesn't even like him and then leaves alone to go back to his now empty swamp. Yeah, you, you know what? You thought wrong. Where did the other fairy tale creatures go? Where did he send them? Another montage, this time set to the song Hallelujah, God, this soundtrack is so good. We see Fiona's sad wedding preparations. We see sad Shrek eating alone. Watching Fiona interact with other human beings makes me wonder how jarring that is for her after being alone with Dragon for so long. And all of a sudden she meets two people, hangs out with them for a little bit, and then is surrounded by people and about to get married. And I'm just expected to believe she adjusts, no problem. They don't address that. I don't blame them for it. That, that would be a weird thing for them to sit down and really get into the psychological issues Fiona has from being isolated for a really long time. But I did think about it during this montage. So now I'm telling you. Also in this montage, we see Thelonious hyping up his guy Farquaad. 
me waving my Thelonious fan club little flag. And we also see Donkey finding Dragon, weeping by a river. I don't know how Dragon got out of the castle, and neither do you. And that's okay. I was about to say the next day, all still the same day, because it's pre-wedding. So I guess a couple hours later, uh, Shrek finds Donkey in the swamp, insisting that because he did half the work, he gets half the swamp. So he's building a little wall, like a like a duct tape line down a room. And Shrek calls him a stubborn jackass. This movie really takes advantage of the fact that technically a donkey is called an ass and it's not a swear word if you're Saying it to a donkey, it's child logic. I love it. Donkey sets the record straight. They are friends and they need to forgive each other. He tells Shrek that Fiona wasn't even talking about him. So Shrek genuinely uh, apologizes for his actions. It's nice. It's good. It's the first, like, I think real development we've seen from him. Like, he started to make a couple friends. That's great. That's awesome for him. But this is kind of the moment where it's like he has changed and he actually cares about this guy, this donkey, enough to try and mend a relationship and make it work. I'm sorry. I guess I am just a big, stupid, ugly ogre. Can you forgive me? So they realize they need to go to Duloc to get Fiona before the wedding so they can all be gravy again and Fiona doesn't have to marry that guy. And they get there on the back of Dragon, who is at this point Donkey's new paramour. I'm not lying to you. I think the donkey and dragon relationship is potentially the best part of this franchise. Just all of it. Fellas, is it weird to fall in love with the giant lethal woman who briefly held you captive in a castle? Is it weird to hype her up and encourage her to explore the parts of herself she's never had a chance to, the sides of her both violent and nurturing? Is that weird? And Shrek does interrupt the wedding. <laughs> And he does it because he knows that Farquaad does not love her, that he just wants to be the king. And when asked, what does he know about true love? Farquaad makes fun of him. The ogre has fallen in love with the princess. And so what if he has? Hmm? 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 However, the sun sets. Fiona procrastinates just long enough to watch it go down. And she turns into an ogre so that Shrek can finally understand. And he does. He, he fully immediately understands where the miscommunication from. What are you doing? And Lord Farquaad, noted disliker of ogres, is horrified and demands that Fiona be taken away and sent back to her tower, which it is now unguarded. He doesn't know that, but it would not be a very effective uh, thing to do for her. And he also demands that Shrek be killed. For what crime? Interrupting a wedding? But amidst the chaos, pff, a window shatters. Dragon breaks in, donkey astride her, and she eats Lord Farquaad whole. She swallows him down. And donkey cheers for her the whole way. Cause that's his girl. Shrek and Fiona confess their feelings to each other. They have true loves. First kiss, and Fiona undergoes a magical girl transformation, but stays exactly the same. She's an ogre. Forever now, this is love's true form. And she's confused because that's not how it was supposed to be. She even says, I'm supposed to be beautiful. And Shrek looks at her and says, But you are beautiful. They sashay off. They get married at the swamp with all the other fairy tale creatures there. So I guess they're all fine still. Where did they go? What was happening to them? And I'm a believer by Smash Mouth plays in the background. Shrek and Fiona head off for their honeymoon in their onion carriage. Snow White and Cinderella, the ones who were not chosen to get married to Lord Farquaad. This would have been a very different movie if he picked anyone. But Fiona uh, both go for the bouquet when Fiona throws it, but Dragon gets it. She's gonna get married. A big happy ending. Then the movie ends. Ta-da! I couldn't leave her if I tried. 
God bless us, everyone. I would have loved to go through every single joke, pop culture reference, throwaway bit that made me happy in this movie, but that's the whole goddamn movie. If you haven't watched Shrek 2001 in a while, you should go back and watch Shrek 2001. It's a good ass movie. This movie establishes all of our main characters we're gonna hold on to for the rest of the franchise so that we have that grounding point as we continue to add more and more and more as there's more and more movies. We can always go back to the principles of these characters and how they were in this movie, where they started, how they are, and it does a great job. I love Shrek. And you might think that now it's time for Shrek 2. You'd be wrong. We're doing every short. We're doing every bit of bonus content. It's not time for Shrek 2. <laughs> Shrek in the Swamp, Karaoke, Dance Party, 2001, the same year as Shrek 2001. And that is because this was available with Shrek 2001 home releases. This short is short. It's three minutes long and it's truly just a who's who of available karaoke hits from the year 2001 as performed by various background characters from Shrek 2001. It is set at the wedding, at the end of Shrek 2001, at Shrek and Fiona's wedding. So it's during the wedding, it is before Shrek and Fiona get off in their onion carriage towards their honeymoon. A teeny tiny bit of a mid -quel, even. Shrek starts off serenading his beautiful wife Fiona with just the way you are because he loves her just the way she is. And then Fiona comes in with Like a Virgin by Madonna. First off, she interrupts him, that's rude. Second off, why? It's a good song. And then Donkey interrupts, again, rude, with Baby Got Back by Sir mix -a -Lot. All right. <laughs> I like big butts and I cannot lie. You other brothers can't deny. Robin Hood and the Merry Men are here for some reason. The Gingerbread Man and the Three Blind Mice are here singing, Do You Really Want to Hurt Me? By Culture Club? Is that a reference to how he got tortured in the movie? The best part of this is in the middle, where Farquaad, deep in dragon's bowels, hits us with staying alive. Incredible. And I do want to take this to mean that Farquaad is just in there for the rest of the series somehow, just like quietly suffering and bearing witness to the whole rest of the franchise. That gets contradicted later on, but it was a very fun thought while I had it. The big bad wolf gives us who let the dogs out. Get it? Cause wolves are like dogs. And then we're carried through to the end with dance to the music, occasionally with bits of happy together woven in. It works. We do find out during this scene that Canon, Fiona's really good on a drum set, and Canon, Shrek can play the organ. Jot those down. Because what if there are drum and organ Easter eggs in Shrek 5? And you miss them. And you miss them. You'll feel foolish. That's what. And then it ends with Donkey implying that Pinocchio stabbed him somewhere unseemly with his nose. Cut to black. <laughs> it's three minutes long. It's a delight. It's basically just an extended cut of the musical dance party that was already at the end of Shrek 2001. I liked it. And now for Shrek 2, no. No. I know you want to get to one of the best films ever made, but it is still not time for Shrek 2. I'm going to have the bottom. Shrek 4D 2003 was playing at Universal Studios. What the fuck is that? I'd love to tell you about it. Shrek 4D was a 4D adventure meant for a ride experience at Universal Studios Florida. It premiered there in 2003. It eventually had a DVD release as well. Uh, when they placed it in Universal Studios Florida, it replaced an Alfred Hitchcock show, just a weird dichotomy, and it closed I kid you not, January of 2022. This was available for 19 years. I have siblings that haven't been available for 19 years. I did actually get to experience Shrek 4D 2003 the way it was meant to be experienced um, as a child on vacation in Florida being jostled about in a chair, but that was forever ago. I distinctly remember part of the pre-show where you're kind of walking through the building to get to the theater where you can sit down and watch Shrek 4D 2003, um, involving the three little pigs being locked in cages above your head, like, like wiggling about like there were physical cages in the air with little animatronic pig faces and 
like recordings of them asking for help. It was weird. <laughs> anyway, the actual show. If you have never experienced a 4D show in a 4D theater, you might be thinking, literally what the hell does that mean? 4D is like 3D, except your chair wiggles and sometimes you get water sprayed on you and like lights will flash around to make you really feel with all of your senses like you're there. Sometimes they even pour in smells. And if 3D was all the rage in 2003, you can imagine how groundbreaking 4D was. As I'm explaining to you and showing you bits from Shrek 4D 2003, just sort of like wiggle your chair about during the action scenes and you'll, you'll feel how it was meant to be. We open on a frog that attempts to eat a fairy, fails to eat the fairy, but resulting fairy dust explosion makes Donkey float away. Oh, Donkey's here. And so is Shrek, who's examining a map. Lost. This picks up right after the events of Shrek 2001. So Shrek and Fiona are on their way to their honeymoon. I don't know why Donkey's here. <laughs> he was not in the carriage at the end of Shrek 2001, so this does imply that he like chased him down and jumped in at some point. I bet they both loved that. Uh, and now they're lost on the way to their honeymoon locale and Fiona's crying in the onion carriage because of how it's an onion. But worry not, ride goers, movie watchers. I found a shortcut. A spider comes down on the screen literally just to be a 3D effect. That shit is so charming to me when you're watching early 3D projects and you're just watching like things fly into the camera for literally no reason. It's always so awkwardly done, but it's just so they can get the 3D effects in there. Uh, there was also an effect on this ride called a leg tickler on the seats to simulate spiders on you at points when that was relevant. Very cool and fun. I don't remember it personally. And then who appears out of nowhere? Thelonious. Thelonious is here. And he kidnaps Fiona. Come on, dude. Shrek and Donkey give chase, causing some destruction and some shenanigans. And eventually they end up in a graveyard. This graveyard does have a good visual bit where Donkey smashes Humpty Dumpty's headstone, knocking his statue off of his headstone wall. I thought that was cute. That was a good little Humpty Dumpty bit. They also find at this graveyard in the middle of nowhere, Lord Farquaad's grave. Why was he buried here? It doesn't matter, he was. And there's a huge statue for his headstone depicting him fighting dragon. And it's at this point they work in a little bit of dramatic irony. The audience gets to learn something that the characters do not know. Lord Farquaad's ghost makes itself known to us. We're so special. I mean, look out, Shrek. <laughs> Donkey whistles to try and summon Dragon, his girlfriend Dragon, to come in and help them. But instead his whistle accidentally animates the stone dragon? Or it was Lord Farquaad using his ghost powers to animate the stone dragon. But Shrek says wrong whistle. Like that means anything. Like this is just a supernatural ability the donkey has. You know, he talks, he sings, he charms dragons, he animates inanimate objects with just a single tone. Donkey. And now Farquaad's ghost makes itself known, known to the characters as well. And he sicks the stone dragon on them to kill them. But then the real dragon shows up. The whistle worked and she saves our heroes. They continue to pursue Fiona, but they are being pursued by the stone dragon. And then there's a trench run sequence, like from Star Wars A New Hope. I'm almost positive that's what the imagery is supposed to be from. But at the same time, while I was watching it, I felt like maybe I was missing something else. The stone dragon gets caught and her wings rapidly erode away and she falls to her death. But the ghost of Farquaad is still in pursuit. His plan, he reveals, is that he's going to kill Fiona so that he can marry her ghost and become the king of the underworld. And we don't have time to unpack all that. Why would that make him king of the underworld? Is he lord of the underworld right now? Surely not. Fiona fights Thelonious, and he's such a delight, he kind of just 
lets her do that, and then she throws him over a waterfall. Shrek and Donkey swoop in to save her, but the raft that they end up on in this quickly moving water falls over the edge of the waterfall. And now this is where, if you've, you've been jostling your seat about during the action scenes, during the chasing, if you have some sort of liquid nearby that you can just sort of spritz on yourself as you fall down the waterfall, that would be great. But wait, Thelonious was hanging onto a branch of the waterfall and he catches them. He saves their lives. And then his handhold snaps because the four of them are much heavier than just Thelonious and they all fall. You did your best, bud. Don't worry. Dragon saves them all at the last minute. Of course she does. Of course she does. I swear to God, they use Dragon for everything. The heroes are in trouble in any possible way. Don't worry, Dragon will fix it. Dragon will fix it. She's a dragon. Why would she not be there to fix it? And then Dragon, again saving the day, breathes fire at Lord Farquaad and I guess kills him again? He certainly seems obliterated. So it's good to know that dragon fire in the Shrek universe is also like magical supernatural. It affects ghosts. That's cool as hell. And then Dragon drops the happy couple off at the hotel that they were meaning to get to this entire time to celebrate their honeymoon. All the background characters are here for some reason. They were just at the swamp when the wedding ended. I guess they got here sooner because of how Shrek got lost. But why did they come here at all? This is not their honeymoon. But it's the end of a theme park ride, so Shrek is not that mad. He's just kind of fondly annoyed at their interruption, and he declares that it's time for the honeymoon to finally begin. I guess this is why, canonically, Farquaad, like, never gets brought up again. Man was obliterated twice before we even get to the sequel. And that's why I think that he's not just in Dragon's stomach the whole time watching the franchise unfold and being upset. I think he did die for real in there, in between the dance party and Shrek getting lost in the woods and then his ghost manifested and went for one last hurrah and failed pre- pretty miserably, which is kind of par for the course. Best part about Shrek 40 2003 is obviously the Thelonious Redemption arc. Now here's the thing is I'm watching this shit in order and then coming to report it to you. I don't know that Thelonious isn't in any other Shrek media, but I'm pretty sure I don't remember this man in anything else. I'd love to see him again though, Shrek 5. Come on. You may now, of course, dismount the ride, get back into a non-jostling chair, dry your face off, uh, wipe away any of the phantom feelings of the leg ticklers. You're safe. The day was saved. I feel like a lot of theme park experiences talk directly to the viewer and they're like, you are helping us save Shrek. The Marvel Universe will fall apart if you're not sitting in this chair being wobbled around to these various screens. Shrek 4D 2003 is like, no. Come look at Donkey be silly and dragon save the day, huh? You love that. We've had Shrek 2001. We've had the extended scene of the ending of Shrek 2001. We've had what happens directly after Shrek 2001. Ladies and gentlemen, are you ready for the movie of all time? Because I am... Let's talk about Shrek 2. But first, real quick, all that was day one. This is day four. I don't know who that was that told you seven days. I don't know who broke into my house and lied to you. They were an intruder. I don't know them. Obviously, it's going to take longer than seven days. Obviously. Obviously. But in a fun twist, in nine days, I'm moving states. And I'm not going to have a recording set up for a while. So I, I do have a deadline. And it's, it's nine days from now. I hope when I offhand said that my mental health means nothing in the face of Shrek, I hope I fucking meant it. I really hope I did. This video might devolve quickly. Fair warning. Anyway, Shrek 2. (laughs) This movie premiered at the Cannes Film Festival in 2004, and it's the perfect sequel. It's possibly the perfect movie. The film, I'm so sorry. Shrek 2, 2004 is literally better than Shrek 2001. I don't know how they did it. Shrek 2001 is so iconic, it's so classic, but Shrek 2 
is incredible. This is also the movie that introduces us to a lot of characters that are such standouts that really stick around for the rest of the franchise. I was so excited to watch this again. Turns out I didn't remember like a good chunk of it, but I was just so excited to see what was in there. So let's begin. Just like in Shrek 2001, we open up on a fairy tale storybook, but this time it's Rupert Everett's Prince Charming reading out Fiona's backstory about how the fairy godmother locked her up in the tower to wait for her Prince Charming. But when you transition to the actual Prince Charming arriving to a broken bridge and no dragon, there is also no princess. And instead, the big bad wolf informs him that Fiona is already gone and on her honeymoon. She's on her honeymoon. Honeymoon? With who? And then we get a montage. The Shrek franchise simply loves its montages. This one is of Shrek and Fiona's honeymoon set to accidentally in love. It's already matching the soundtrack energy of Shrek 2001. Uh, and includes a bit where they're being hunted by an angry mob to remind us that ogres are not liked around here. We are not ogre fans. We can assume everything happening in this montage is happening after the events of Shrek 4D. And then Shrek and Fiona arrive back to the swamp from their honeymoon to find Donkey in their home moping. Uh, he tells them that Dragon has been really moody lately. So Donkey just left her to hang out with his buddies. So I thought I'd move back in with you guys. At the swamp, some royal folks with trumpets arrive to summon Trek and Fiona to a royal ball to visit Fiona's parents in Far, Far Away. They are the king and queen of Far, Far Away as she is Princess Fiona. This is a royal ball to celebrate her engagement and marriage and also to get her parents' official blessing and stamp of approval on her husband. <laughs> Shrek correctly and reasonably assumes that this is not going to go well, uh, but Fiona and Donkey convince him that it's a good idea and that they should go. So they get in their onion carriage and they set off. We are not going, and that's final. Hey, come on, Shrek, we don't want to hit traffic. And immediately the other fairy tale creatures that they know start throwing a rager in their empty home. It's a really far journey. We don't know exactly how far. We know it's over 100 miles because at one point in the montage, there's a sign that says it's 100 more miles, but it's it's far, far away. Do you, um, do you get it? It's because it's because the place is called. Are we there yet? Yes. Really? No! We get to far, far away. Funky Town starts playing and it's fantastic. We see Far Far Away has its own Hollywood sign. It's very Sunset Boulevard and it's imagery. Shrek is immediately uncomfortable. It doesn't get better when they get to the castle. Fiona's parents, Harold, voiced by John Cleese, and Lillian, voiced by Julie Andrews, um, are not excited to see two ogres pull up in an onion carriage. That's not really what they were expecting when they invited their princess daughter, whose curse had been broken, to come home to meet her husband. Shrek and Fiona and the king and queen meet up here. Shrek implies that he thinks Fiona's mom is hot. Well, um, it's easy to see where Fiona gets her good looks from. <laughs> and then we cut to an incredibly silent and like intentionally confusing dinner where Harold is glaring at Shrek like he can explode him with his mind. Also in this dinner, Shrek calls Lillian Mrs. Q, which took me way too fucking long to realize probably was for Queen, m m like Mrs. Queen. I don't know if he knows her name. <laughs> Shrek and King Harold have an argument at dinner in which Harold makes a lot of negative assumptions about ogres and Shrek has a lot to say about the choice to lock Fiona in a tower as a child. That is assuming you don't eat your own gun. Dad. Oh no, we usually prefer the ones who've been locked away in a tower. Shrek, please. And Fiona storms off and goes to hide in her room. I don't blame her. This is literally possibly the worst this could have gone. Fiona's crying in her childhood bedroom and the fairy godmother voiced by Jennifer Saunders is summoned in a rain of bubbles. She does a musical number to tell Fiona that she can give the princess whatever she wants, including hot men and dogs and dancing furniture. Hey, have a this is where you should instantly fall in love with the theatrics and the drama of the fairy godmother. And if you didn't, I can't help you. You watch movies wrong. Shrek busts in and the fairy godmother's appalled that Shrek is her husband. 
it's a running theme. Uh, Atrex decided that they're leaving immediately. I don't blame him. Good call, maybe, dude. Fairy Godmother gives them a business card that if you cry on it, she will be summoned. Happiness is just a teardrop away. Thanks, but we've got all the happiness we need. Happy, happy, happy. So I see. <laughs> then she bounces. She's got a lot to process. Shrek and Fiona argue about how Shrek didn't even try with her parents, which is unfair. He tried a teeny bit. Uh, and Fiona says he's behaving like an ogre rude. Uh, Shrek says he's not going to change. Fiona points out that she has already changed for him and that she feels like there's this unequal sort of give and take in their relationship, which is very uh, real. That's very real. In the kings and queens quarters, Harold rants and raves to his wife, Lillian, who is honestly pretty accepting of the situation. She says she just doesn't want to lose their daughter again. Sad. Like, it's not Lillian's fault that Fiona got cursed, and I don't think she wanted to put Fiona up in the tower in the first place. She has Fiona back now. Okay, she's green. That's fine, Fiona's home. But Harold keeps ranting until he is snuck up on by the fairy godmother. He has a quick reference to his involvement in the Crusades, um, and then gets kidnapped, essentially by the fairy godmother and her goons. This is where we learn that Prince Charming has just returned from his failed quest to rescue Fiona, uh, and also that he is the fairy godmother's son. After I endured blistering winds, scorching desert, I climbed to the highest room in the tallest <laughs> tower. Mummy can handle this. He endures blistering winds. They stop at a fast food drive through so that the fairy godmother can stress eat. She references the deal that she made in the past with Harold that she knows Harold doesn't want her to take back and tells him that he has to fix this. The threat is that if he doesn't break up Shrek and Fiona's marriage so that Fiona can marry Prince Charming, the fairy godmother will go back on whatever deal they have. So King Harold goes to the poison apple. It's like an evil fantasy tavern. It's a real den of rascals. And I just want to know why the king doesn't have a better way to hire an assassin than by walking directly into villain town. I like my town. With a little drop of poison. Whatever. I think the poison apple slaps, quite frankly. Harold finds the ugly stepsister, voiced by Larry King, and he asks for somebody capable of killing an ogre. There's only one fella who can handle a job like that. And the ugly stepsister, whose name is Doris. Her name's Doris, by the way, and she's perfect to me directs him to a spooky assassin shrouded in shadow voiced by Antonio Banderas, and they're really trying to not immediately let you know that it's a cat, but they show the cat eyes and he's drinking milk. So yeah, it's Puss in Boots. They direct him to Puss in Boots to go kill Shrek. Back at the castle, Shrek finds Fiona's childhood diary and realizes she had a childhood crush on the concept of Prince Charming. And because he was never a teenage girl with an all-consuming infatuation of an untouchable male figure, he feels very insecure about this because he doesn't get it. Other things to note about this scene, Shrek can't sleep, so the song, I Need Some Sleep by Eels plays in the background. I need some sleep, time to put the old horse down. We find out that Fiona had to miss Sleeping Beauty's slumber parties as a kid because of her curse. Also, Fiona's room has a poster of Sir Justin, who is very clearly supposed to be Justin Timberlake, which I'm mentioning right now, and we will uh, we'll, we'll pick that back up later. Don't worry about it. Shrek, and I guess by extension Donkey, are invited on a hunting trip by Harold. And they go, and they immediately get lost. Um, which is a shame because Shrek is admitting that he does want to put in the effort for Harold to get that man to like him. He's actually, he's trying. He's trying to try. But, oh no, they are attacked by Puss in Boots. Pray for mercy from Puss. Love Puss in Boots. Watching Puss in Boots reminded me a lot of how much I love Diego from the Ice Age movies, actually. So I guess me and Orange Cats are like this. <laughs> <laughs> Puss is a really great fighter. He puts up a good show. He hurts them a little bit, but eventually Shrek, who's much bigger than him, sort of picks him up and dangles him in the air, 
shakes him around until Puss reveals that it was the king that paid him to kill them. He also says that his mother is sick and his father eats garbage, like trying to give Shrek his tragic backstory? <laughs> Whatever, Puss is here now. He says he is honor bound now to come with uh, on their journey until he saves Shrek's life. And he, he does a really cute little face about it. The classic Puss in Boots face to convince them that he should come with. And Shrek is so susceptible to it. Oh, let's keep him. Say what? They use that fairy godmother business card to find out that she has an office where she sells these potions and hexes. And that's where they're gonna go to find a way to make Fiona happy. Well, it's not like I wouldn't change if I could. I just, I just wish I could make her happy. Fiona wakes up in the castle alone, her diary open on the table, and her parents, unsure or unable, to tell her where her husband is. This is most of what she does in this movie now. <laughs> Fiona spends Shrek 2, 2004, angry at Shrek and then worried about Shrek. And that's sort of what, uh, what she does. And it works, it works. She spent Shrek 2001 locked in a tower and then getting carried out of a tower. So <laughs> our new golden trio arrive to the fairy godmother's Factory. Uh, Shrek and Puss are already best friends at this point, which Donkey is not a fan of. They enter the factory. Shrek claims that they're here on behalf of the union, and the front desk guy is so quick to let them in without checking anything else uh, that it's apparent what sort of working conditions that they're all under here. And it's really sad. The state of labor laws in far, far away. <laughs> well, but we don't even have dental. They don't even have dental. They do find the fairy godmother actually pretty easily, but she's super rude to them. It seems that Fiona's not exactly happy. Oh, oh. there's some question as to why that is. So they break away, sneak around, and they steal a happily ever after potion so that Shrek can finally be the man that Fiona needs. And they cause a big ruckus about it. And they have to escape as everybody chases after them. It's a whole action scene. Charming is here, uh, finds out that Shrek stole from his mom, his mummy. He's furious. Uh, but they find out which potion Shrek got away with, that happily ever after potion. And they seem to believe that they can make this work for them. He will rue the very day he stole my kingdom from me. Oh. Put it away, Junior, you're still gonna be king. Away from the factory, Shrek and Donkey both end up drinking the potion, but nothing happens right away. You love being a I movie. know. <sighs> but I love Fiona more. That's very sweet. Let's work on that self-actualization though. Bud, huh? Shrek, Donkey, and Fiona back in the castle at Far Far Away all fall into a magical sleep. Um, right before she falls asleep, Fiona tells her parents that she's gonna go get Shrek and bring him back to the swamp where they both belong, that it was a mistake to bring him here. And then she falls asleep. And she falls asleep. In the morning, Shrek has awoken a human man. And Donkey's a beautiful white stallion. Uh, um, they are in a barn with a group of women who are fawning over Shrek kind of uncomfortably, but Donkey's so stoked to be a horse that it makes the whole scene fine. Look at me, Shrek. I'm trotting. That's some quality potion. To stay like this, to stay a human, Shrek has to kiss Fiona by midnight. So he rushes to the castle. It's always midnight. Shrek, for the first time, experiences the world as a regular human man. He's going through far, far away, entering it again. But this time he's making eye contact with people on the street and they're smiling at him. He's not having to hide away. It's like a really big moment for him. It's his first real societal acceptance and it's because he does not look like who he is, which is inherently tragic. And back at the castle, Fiona freaks out because she is also human again. <laughs> the fairy godmother's plan here is to have Prince Charming pose as Shrek because Fiona hasn't seen human Shrek yet. So maybe human Shrek looks like this guy. Fiona's not stoked, not stoked, not convinced because Charming does not 
act like Shrek, weirdly. It's me, Shrek. The fairy godmother corners Shrek before he can get to Fiona and convinces him that allowing her to marry Charming would be what's best for her. And because Shrek loves her, and from his perspective, a few floors up and away, she looks happy with the situation. He leaves. Don't you think you've already messed her life up enough? I just wanted her to be happy. This movie reinforces a few different times that Shrek has learned that he has to make sacrifices for Fiona, that he wasn't sacrificing enough to start with. And he's decided he's willing to do whatever it takes to hold on to this. Which hurt, it hurts my feelings. It hurts my feelings. Because even though he's decided he'll do whatever it takes, he'll give up his own identity for her. If that's still not enough to make her happy, then it's still not enough to make her happy and he'll go. You love Fiona. I, and that's why I have to let her go. So our trio goes to the poison apple so that Shrek can mope and drink. Captain Hook's still on that piano. It's what he does. But then who's that? Sneaking into the bar, it's King Harold. Here to meet with the fairy godmother because Fiona does not like Prince Charming and is not into this. FYI, not my fault. No, 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 of course it's not, dear. I mean, how charming can I be when I have to pretend I'm that dreadful ogre? But the fairy godmother gives Harold a love potion to spike Fiona's drink so that she will fall in love with Charming as soon as they kiss, right? She's gonna drink the, the love potion and then she's gonna fall madly in love with that first man she kisses, which, uh, you know, fairy godmother says, that better be my son, that better be my sweet boy. Harold does initially say no, because he knows it's not what Fiona wants, but the fairy threatens him again, so he he backs down and takes a love potion. But Shrek, Donkey, and Puss in Boots are eavesdropping. They hear about that plan. They're immediately discovered, and they're immediately arrested. <laughs> the gingerbread man, Pinocchio. The three little pigs, the three blind mice, and the big bad wolf, the swamp squad, are watching TV at the swamp from, you know, Shrek's home where they immediately started throwing ragers the second he left. They're watching the royal ball, okay? They see the fairy godmother shows up, does her crowd work, everyone loves her and they're correct too. And then it cuts and they watch Donkey Shrek and Pussy Boots get arrested on TV, including getting fantasy maced. They figured out the way to do it. Uh, they recognize them, even though they're human, because Shrek is yelling out that, that he is Shrek. He's married to Princess Fiona, and he still sounds like Shrek. So all of his friends have realized, uh-oh, something bad happened far, far away. King Harold makes two cups of tea and pours a love potion in one of them so that he can drug his daughter. Uh, but Fiona tells her father that Charming is... Clearly not her husband. Uh, he hasn't just changed. That's not just Shrek who's a little different. Oh, he's completely lost his mind. And that she would do anything to get her old Shrek back. And then she drinks her tea. The Swamp Squad comes in, breaks the trio out of jail. Pinocchio has to do a bunch of lies to grow his nose so that Gingy can go reach them. It's classic. Shrek has changed his mind. He's going back for Fiona. He can't let them do this to her. And he has to get to her before she kisses Charming. But to do so, they're gonna need a ride to the castle. So Gingy takes them to his good old friend, the Muffin Man, who makes them mongo. <laughs> it's alive! A humongous, absolutely monstrous gingerbread man. At the royal ball, Fiona is not impressed with how charming Charming is, goes to leave. That's unacceptable. So the fairy godmother immediately dedicates a song to them to keep them there and dancing. And that song is holding out for a hero, baby. If it has been a while since you have watched the holding out for a hero scene from Shrek 2 2004, or if somehow you have never seen the holding out for a hero scene from Shrek 2 2004, I would actually encourage you to go watch it right now. You should go, you should right now go watch the fairy godmother's cover of Holding Out for a Hero. It's so good. Our swamp squad storms the castle. Gingy's getting attacked. 
Fiona and Charming are dancing. The fairy godmother's absolutely killing it, draped across a piano. Boiling milk is poured on Mongo, and his arms detach from his body, and he falls into the moat. It gets completely submerged. Gingy is saved last minute. Shrek makes it inside. Puss takes on a squadron of soldiers to repay his debt. You remember that thing where he was honor bound to, to, to save Shrek's life? You remember. Shrek makes it to the dance floor. There's a scuffle to get the fairy godmother's wand. She turns Pinocchio into a real boy and then immediately back into a puppet. That's the saddest thing you could do to that man. Don't do that to him. And then, grossly enough, Charming forcefully kisses Fiona to make the potion work, but it doesn't. She doesn't fall in love with him. Instead, she headbutts him and knocks him out because Harold swapped the drinks. He couldn't drug her when she'd already found her happily ever after. He wants her to be happy on her own terms. That's right, Harold. That's right. So angry about that, the fairy godmother tries to kill Shrek, uh, but Harold jumps in the way and the spell bounces off of his, his metal breastplate situation he's got going on and ricochets back to her, killing her instantly as she dissolves into bubbles. And it seems like Harold has died as well. There's just an empty breastplate laying on the ground. Turns out Harold did not die. He is a frog. Harold? Dad? That deal that he made with the fairy godmother that is no longer in play because of how she is dead was to turn him from a frog into a real boy because he had fallen in love with Fiona's mother, Lillian. That's right, baby, he was the frog prince. He's been the frog prince the whole time. Lillian didn't know. Lillian didn't know that her husband used to be a frog. I feel like that's a hard thing to disguise. I feel like if you've lived your entire life as a frog and then suddenly you're not a frog and you're instantly trying to woo a woman, I just feel like it would come up even and especially unintentionally. Like you just don't know what human women are into if you've only ever known frogs. That's all I'm saying. But Lillian reassures her husband that she loves him, that he's a better man today than he's ever been before because of how hard he's trying and how much he did for their daughter. Harold approves of his daughter's marriage to Shrek. He just wanted what was best for her and he wasn't sure if she was making the best choice because it's not an easy life that she's chosen, but it's a happy one. And Fiona intentionally turns down the chance to stay human because she knows that she and Shrek were happy as ogres. They don't need to change now. This is love's true form, baby. So everyone reverts back. Donkey is devastated. That man loved being a horse. And I feel like there's gotta be a way to make him a horse again. He was so happy. They don't got a horse potion around here? Hey, you still look like a noble steed to me. Whatever, this ending is so sweet. Hey, isn't we supposed to be having a fiesta? Once again, we get a musical number to close the movie. Donkey and Puss sing together to show that they're buddies now with no bad blood, no more jealousy. Uh, the song is Live in La Vida Loca. A bop, a banger. Mongo's apparently not dead. He's just singing from the bottom of the moat. Please, please, someone go get him. Please, somebody get him out of there before he dissolves. He's a cookie. Please, 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 please. And this song carries us through the cast credits before we get another cover of Holding Out for a Hero that's fine. But I don't know why you would give me another version of Holding Out for a Hero when 20 minutes earlier I heard the best version of Holding Out for a Hero. This movie, Shrek 2 2004, has a mid credit scene where Dragon shows up. We have not seen her once this movie. My best girl, not once. And we find out, and Donkey finds out the same time we do, that Donkey and Dragon had six little babies. <laughs> <laughs> Which I guess that's a decent explanation for why Dragon hasn't been in this movie and also why she was so moody that Donkey had to leave. That makes it ruder of him that he left. Even if he didn't know, your pregnant wife was upset. So you ran off and went on a whole quest? Anyway, she was on maternity leave. That's fine. I do wonder 
about the gestational period of dragon donkey hybrids, which is maybe not something I'm supposed to think about, but this movie picks up right after Shrek and Fiona's honeymoon, which happened right after Shrek 2001. And I don't know how long their honeymoon was. I assumed like a couple of weeks at max. So was Dragon only pregnant for like a month? Because that, I don't feel like that's long enough. They're big creatures. But whatever, you're not supposed to think about that. That's not the point. That's not what they want you to think about. Technically, these are called dronkies. I was calling them drag keys in my head, which I did like better. But dronkies is a little less gross in the mouth. And also, according to the Shrek fan wiki, these six dronkies have names um, they're listed as Bananas, Debbie, Coco, Peanut, Parfait, and Eclair. One of them is way redder than the other ones. is kind of more dragon than the, the other five. They're all perfect. They're all perfect. We don't get their names here. We get no information about them except that they exist. They love their father very dearly and that they're perfect. And that's the mid-credits scene. And that is, in fact, Shrek 2. 2004. I just realized I forgot to put the 2004 on the whiteboard. I'm sorry that I failed you. This movie is more complicated than Shrek 2001, and I'd say by quite a bit, but it's also so action-packed. It's so interesting. It feels faster. It's absolutely iconic. It's just a really good movie. Even if you kind of take it out of the context of the franchise, this movie is good. It doesn't feel like it wastes any of its time. Go watch it again. Have a good day and watch Shrek 2 2004 again. Go get Funky Town stuck in your head because that's what I did. This is a high for the franchise, but it is not the franchise's entire peak. And thank God it's not because we have so much more to go. Is that glitter on your lips? Mmm, cherry flavored. Want to taste? Ugh, what is with you? But muffin cake. If you were lucky enough to be a child of the DVD or VHS copy of Shrek 2 2004, you probably spent hours and hours on Far, Far Away Idol. I was certainly one of those children, and I could have sworn to you that this bit was minimum an hour long, maybe two hours long, with how much it was burned into my brain as a child. It's a parody of American Idol, which is a show I was obsessed with as a kid, just covered with Shrek, the perfect franchise, making it the perfect bit. So I think I just assumed it was as long as an episode of American Idol. It's six minutes long. It's six minutes long. Okay, but what is it? So let's start with American Idol. American Idol is an American singing competition where a hopeful young bright-eyed vocalist would stand in front of three judges, uh, traditionally Paula Abdul, Randy Jackson, and Simon Cowell, and get belittled in front of the entire country for being a little flat. It's produced a couple actual celebrities, uh, Kelly Clarkson, Carrie Underwood, Ruben Studdard, kind of, uh, Clay Aiken, who didn't actually win. Um, Jordan Sparks did that one song, one time, and David Archuleta was on iCarly. So it's a really culturally significant show, is what I'm trying to say. It actually was in 2004. 2004 is when it was still making those celebrities. So contestants would get up on stage, sing a song, get told if they were good or not. If they were good, they got to go to the next level or win if they were in the end game. And if they were bad, they had to go the fuck home. In Far, Far Away Idol, our judges are Shrek, Obs, uh, Fiona, Obs, uh, and the actual Simon Cowell, who is not a fairy tale creature, but is, I guess, enough of a mythological figure on his own to be present here. He's a little uncanny valley. He's a little difficult to look at, but it does look like Simon Cowell. They did an all right job. The bulk of this very short segment is a menagerie of side characters singing snippets of popular songs, with Simon Cowell coming in after every performance to say something mean about them. I'm hungry for some talent here. And all of these songs were chosen as like, like bits. Like it's funny that that character was singing that song. And they also only each get like 15 to 20 seconds. Donkey sings Disco Inferno and his dragon wife sets him on fire. Pinocchio does Mr. Roboto because of how he's not a real boy, which uh, hurts a little more because this happened right after Shrek 2 2004 where he was briefly for like 10 seconds a real boy. 
Simon Cowell tells him to get real. That's rude. I know Simon Cowell doesn't know, doesn't know that Pinocchio experienced the reality of humanity for approximately 13 seconds, but it's still mean that he said it. Doris sings girls just want to have fun, and then Fiona questions if she's a girl. I wish we didn't do this to her. Bad Wolf sings hungry like the wolf. Charming does too sexy for my shirt. There is a line after Fiona drops Charming in a trapdoor where they say the artist formerly known as Prince Charming. That's funny, actually. I, I do love, maybe it's just the living in Minnesota of me, but that is funny. The blind mice, do I can see clearly. Now, Gingy does sugar, sugar. Captain Hook, the pianist of Poison Apple is here. He does Hooked on a Feeling by Blue Suede. Puss in Boots does, these boots are made for walking. Shrek and Fiona do, that's what I like about you. Which, hey, judges are not allowed to do that. Paula Abdul did not just walk her ass on the stage in the final four and insist that actually she's competing now. That's not how this show works. This is lies. This is lies and slander about American Idol. I can't believe Simon Cowell is standing for this. The viewer then, at least on the DVD version, uh, got to choose which performer got to win. Uh, but on the VHS version, there was a link that came up to a now non-existent website where you could uh, register your vote with millions of other Shrek fans. You had to go to a website and say who you wanted to win. Obsessed, obsessed. I could not find, by the way, who people voted for to win on that website. I could not find who won by the popular vote and I was devastated. <laughs> if you somehow know that information, please tell it to me. Please give it to me. I need to know who the masses chose. Cause I know it wasn't just Shrek. Now, there are only three options that you, the viewer, could choose where Simon Cowell, who's now the only judge since the other two went fully rogue, accepts your answer and allows that performer to have a little encore. There are three choices where Simon Cowell says, okay, that's allowed. You will not be surprised to learn that those choices are Shrek and Fiona's duet, uh, Donkey, and Puss in Boots. J just the main characters. Those are the only ones that he will allow to win. If you choose anyone else, Simon Cowell has a throwaway line about how you picked bad and then declares himself the winner and performs a rendition of My Way by Frank Sinatra, except it's not Simon Cowell actually singing. They brought in somebody else to do that part because the man doesn't sing. However, we are here to discuss canon, okay? We need to know all the facts so we can catch every single Easter egg in Shrek 5, which I'm sure will be landing on my desk Post haste. Simon Cowell had a different throwaway line about how you chose bad for each character. And there is only one that is used in all current iterations of Far, Far Away Idol 2004 on streaming and on other releases, which means we know who was actually canonically chosen to win Far, Far Away Idol before Simon Cowell stole their throne. We have an answer, okay? And it wasn't Shrek and Fiona, and it wasn't Donkey, and it wasn't Puss in Boots. The line he says is, No, you've got to be joking. And that line, that particular bit of rudeness, is associated with the viewer choosing Pinocchio, the rightful heir to the far, far away idol throne. Pinocchio, I will avenge you. That man threw your, your puppet status in your face, and then he stole your crown. I cannot believe this man did that to you. We will have our vengeance. We will have it at my hands. I'm so sorry, Pinocchio. Anyway, that's that. Next. We have arrived. It's the one nobody likes. Shrek the Third, 2007, is widely considered to be the worst of the main Shrek movies, and everyone who says that is not wrong. It's fine. It's it's literally fine. If Shrek 2, 2004, was more complicated than its predecessor in a way that made it like more interesting and action-packed, this one is more complicated in a way that makes recapping it feel a little bit like recapping the fifth Ice Age movie. The jokes aren't as good, the bits go on too long. We spend way too much time with Shrek in like a high school setting. It's not where he belongs. But I am of course getting ahead of myself. Let's uh, shake this one around and see what rattles. The internet informs me that this movie takes place three years after the events of Shrek 2 2004. If that's true, that would be very cute because it was three real life years between movies. 
We'll just say that's true for the sake of our recaps. This is our first main Shrek movie without that fairy tale book opening, but we do see Prince Charming riding a fake horse on a stage to rescue his princess at a dinner theater, playing out his fantasy of how he wanted that event to go. Uh, our Swamp Squad, Sans, Shrek, Fiona, Donkey Puss, are watching in the audience. Uh, the audience cheers for... Shrek, or the actor playing Shrek when he comes on stage instead of cheering for Charming. Prepare, foul beast, to enter into a world of pain with which you are not familiar. Happy birthday to thee! Happy birthday to thee! Do you mind? They laugh at Charming after the set falls apart and the fake tower falls on him, and Charming storms out, insisting that someday they'll all be sorry. You know, you'll rue this day! You'll rue it! Literally, how did Charming get to this point? Is he not a prince? The son of a fairy who had a successful potion and hexing empire? He didn't have any inheritance? Why is he doing bad dinner theater? It's been three years, he blew through everything that fast? Prince Charming vows to the memory of his mother that he will avenge her, he will get the throne. He is our primary antagonist to this movie, which I do love as a choice. I love Charming as the antagonist. I promise you this, mother. I will restore dignity to my throne. Shrek and Fiona are not in the swamp. They are at the castle in Far, Far Away, woken up by donkey, by puss, by all the baby dragon donkeys. And we find out that King Harold is very, very sick. And that Shrek and Fiona are next in line of succession and they need to go about and do all of the things that Harold should be doing if he wasn't, you know, dying in bed. Also, Puss in Boots seems to have appointed himself as Shrek and Fiona's like advisor secretary, which I do love for him. I feel like he would genuinely be good at that. He strikes me as very detail oriented. You have a very full day filling in for the king and queen. There are several functions that require your attendance, sir. Great, let's get started. And we get our very first montage right away of Shrek doing a very bad job doing his kingly duties. He stabs a guy during the nighting, he breaks a ship during its send off, he gets a really intense makeover that he hates. We all have to experience an incredibly drawn out bit where Shrek needs a man to scratch his butt for him because he can't reach it in the fancy clothes. And it goes on forever. And then we also get the classic Shrek franchise scene of one thing breaks and it sets off a chain reaction of everything falling apart and getting set on fire. So basically, Shrek is not having a good showing here. <laughs> and they already immediately pull the Puss in Boots cute face gag, like like six minutes in, like six minutes into the movie, nothing's happened yet. It was the Puss in Boots cute face gag actually that got me worried that I was gonna have a really bad time rewatching this movie, because if they're just gonna repeat the things that children liked from the first two movies over and over again, I just watched those movies. I don't need to see them again, but in a format where they don't work as well. I literally just I just watched them. Fiona assures Shrek that this whole thing only has to go until Harold gets better. She also hints that when they do get back to the swamp, there might be a little ogre feet running around and Shrek is not into it. Don't you ever think about having a family? Right now, you are my family. This conversation gets interrupted and Shrek says, Somebody better be dying. <laughs> I'm dying. I love things like that, it's such an easy joke. <laughs> and yes, King Harold is still a frog. I don't know why I expected him to not be a frog anymore. He's still a frog. He's been a frog for the past three years and he's been a successful king all the same. Who was doing all the nightings? Surely it wasn't the frog. This deathbed scene does have its moments. Uh, Shrek calls Harold dad, Harold calls Shrek son, that's lovely. This same scene contains two really obnoxious death fake outs where we have to watch the frog like gasp and groan and, and then it turns out he's fine. That happens twice. 
in the same scene. The last thing that Harold ever tells Shrek is that there is another heir, that if Shrek can't take the throne, Arthur can. And Harold says he knows that they'll do what's right for themselves and for the kingdom, and then he dies for real. And we jump directly into a second montage of everybody grieving, set to the song, Live and Let Die. Live and let die. That's insane. Honestly, hell yeah, that's, that's, cam that's camp. That's camp. And they send him off in a Viking funeral in a fantasy shoebox. It's literally a fantasy shoebox. This man was king. Charming has gone to the Poison Apple, that villain tavern, ready to recruit. Captain Hook is still on the piano. That man knows what he's about. And we meet Mabel, who is the other ugly stepsister. Apparently Doris isn't welcome here anymore. Charming kind of rallies and talks up the villains about the unfairness that has plagued all their lives, um, including Rumpelstiltskin. And you, Frumpy Pigskin. Rumpelstiltskin. Where's that firstborn you were promised, eh? He's a regular looking small man. I'm mentioning him specifically for, for no reason in particular, but Rumpelstiltskin is here. Once upon a time, someone decided that we were the losers. There are two sides to every story. And Charming convinces them that he can get them all the happily ever after that they deserve that was taken from them by the heroes of their stories. And they all party and break stuff and Charming still clearly finds them all very distasteful. <laughs> And I do like that dynamic. Charming is trying to connect with them, make it seem like he understands them. He still very much views all the villains he's working with as beneath him, as lesser, the same way he views everybody. Shrek, Donkey, and Puss in Boots are going to find Arthur. Puss tells a whole host of street cats that they're the loves of his life. He's a real ladies' man. Donkey says goodbye to his wife and children. This is where I realized there are only five donkeys present. If you'll recall from the mid credit scene of Shrek 2 2004, there were six. There were six donkeys present. Also, if it's actually been three years, these children have grown none. They've grown none. They're the same size. I made so many people check that mid credit scene and make sure there were actually six Dronkies present because I was doubting my ability to fucking count. This movie, this movie made me think I didn't know how to count. There were six and here and now there are five. That redder one, that one that was a little more dragon than the other ones, gone. The fan wiki tells me that it's Eclair that is missing, who has been missing since the ending of Shrek 2. I think they made that shit up because these children do not have in-movie stated names at this point. I don't know where they got those names from. I am not calling the Shrek fan wiki a liar. I am not, but I did not see a source cited. Anyway, Fiona tries to convince Shrek to just stay, but he's determined to go. And as they sail off, Fiona tells Shrek, and he's immediately so upset. And you, my friend, are royally. He starts having stress dreams about babies, hitting him with geysers of vomit, uh, about his entire home being filled with ogre babies, putting themselves in danger, breaking everything, swarms of ogre babies destroying his home. We also get horrific imagery of Donkey and Puss, but with ogre baby faces. Donkey, Donkey, wake up! I didn't like it. I didn't like it. Shrek asks the rhetorical question, how did this happen? And Puss starts to explain how babies are made. Shrek stops him, but Donkey asks him to clarify, implying that he does not know how babies are made, which, um, um, basically Shrek does not think he's capable of being a good parent because ogres are not known for being nurturing or caring. And I don't know if you know this about Shrek, he's got some self-esteem issues. He has some problems with his internalized ogre phobia. Having a baby is not going to ruin your life. It's not my life I'm worried about ruining. It's the kids. The trio ends up at a place called Worcestershire that ends up being a magical elite high school. 
they're at a high school. They're making jokes about high school for far too long. For far too long, I had to watch Shrek and Donkey and Puss in Boots experience a screenwriter's idea of what high school is like. There's a hotboxing visual gag. There's cheerleaders. There's valley girl voices. I'd rather get the black plague and lock myself in an iron maiden than go out with you. Totally. Pardon me. Totally illus. Yeah, totally. There's that fake, like, my friend thinks you're hot and wants to ask you out as like a bullying tactic. The, why is that in here? Donkey gets shoved into a locker. There's a just say nay assembly. I'm speeding through this part and you should be grateful for it. There's a fake out gag where they think that Arthur's the big strong man jousting on a horse, but it's actually the scrawny nerd child that's next to him. Wah, wah, wah. So Shrek pretends to submit himself into a mascot contest to get a hold of Arthur Pendragon who has run away from him because he's uh, big and scary. They find Arthur hanging from a basketball hoop. It's not the jocks who hung him up there, it's the chess nerds. That's how much everyone here hates Arthur Pendragon. The marching band does play a cover of All Star by Smash Mouth. I, that I did like. This is where we actually meet Arthur for the first time. He goes by Artie. Artie is a 16 year old kid voiced by Justin Timberlake, which is a little bit weird because Sir Justin, who looks exactly like Justin Timberlake, is a very well-known knight in this area who Fiona was in love with as a child. It is weird that Justin Timberlake is in this movie. Obviously, they don't have to address that because it's just the voice of Justin Timberlake. And I don't know what Sir Justin sounded like and neither do you. In front of the whole school, Shrek tells the child he gets to be king. The whole school laughs at him because they all hate this kid for no visible reason. He's a cute kid. He's fine. He doesn't seem to fit into any of the groups anybody has going on, but he's not mean. He's like a little bit. <sighs> okay, so he gives a whole speech to the gymnasium full of people. Uh, once he learns he gets to be king, saying he might banish the whole jousting team and tells the pretty valley girl he's in love with her. And it's like, maybe next time you'll think. So like, he's a little bit obnoxious. He's 16, he's in high school. That's, that's, they all suffer from that sin, baby. Enjoy your stay here in prison while I rule the free world, baby. All right, let's not overdo it. I'm building my city, people. What a rock and roll. We just overdid it. I know it's supposed to make me feel bad for Artie, that he's an outcast that nobody likes. But here's the thing, if the whole school doesn't like a guy, there's usually a reason. <laughs> this is a movie, this is a movie. And he's an outcast so that I feel bad for him. And he never did anything wrong. He's a perfect little boy. Back in Far, Far Away, Fiona and Lillian host a baby shower. Guests include Cinderella and Snow White, who did also attend Fiona's wedding, if you recall, as well as Sleeping Beauty, who was Fiona's childhood friend, who she could go to her sleepovers, as well as Doris and Rapunzel and Gingy and Pinocchio and Dragon and the Wolf and the Pig, the whole Swamp Squad. Everyone there seems to genuinely love and respect Fiona. Nobody's like questioning her life choices. Her princess friends don't seem to be upset that she's an ogre. It's very nice. It's nice. Snow White does gift Fiona one of her dwarves. I... <laughs> but I, I can't accept this. Oh, think nothing of it, I've got six more at home. But what's this? Charming, attacks far, far away with an army of witches and other villains. They cause a lot of generalized mayhem. There's a Hooters joke. And then they all head for the actual castle. They immediately trap Dragon under a weighted net. The smartest move these idiots could ever make because it's always Dragon that saves the day. Gingy, Pinocchio, the wolf, and the pigs distract Charming long enough for all of the princesses to safely escape into these like secret passages in the walls. Charming and his goons threaten the guys. Gingy is fully actually triggered and hit with torture flashbacks from Lord Farquaad when he is threatened by these people. That's such a wild thing to include. Like the real actual trauma of the gingerbread man is present in this moment. 
They go to Pinocchio for answers because they know he can't lie. So he talks in crazy circles to avoid lying and also avoid telling them anything. Um, and then one of the pigs gets so upset about all the circle talking that he just straight up tells them that Shrek went to go get Arthur. It wasn't that annoying. So you do know where he is? On the contrary, I'm possibly more or less not definitely rejected the idea that in no way with any amount of uncertainty that I undeniably Sorry. do or do not know where he should probably be. So charming since Captain Hook after the trio specifically requesting that Shrek is brought to him. Back to the A plot with the trio and Artie. Artie's really excited about being king until they get on the ship back to far, far away and Donkey and Puss start talking about all of the many responsibilities that a king has and how dangerous that job can be, which scares Artie off and he doesn't want to do it anymore uh, because of how he's a child with no political training. Of course he doesn't want to do it anymore. He heard king and thought, cool, crown and princesses. And then you tell him somebody might want to poison him because he's the king and he just never thought about it. There's a big scuffle. Shrek and Artie break the boat and then the ship crashes into an island. Uh-oh. Shrek starts yelling that Artie has to go back to far, far away and that he's going to be a father. It's Freudian slip implying to us that Shrek is having some issues with the idea of people shirking the responsibilities they don't want and didn't ask for and maybe think they're not qualified for Shrek has problems. You said father. You're, I said king. You're gonna be king. You're gonna be king. Yeah, right. Realizing that he made a mistake, Shrek goes to chase down the teenager uh, and attempts to connect with him by using a lot of outdated teen speak. I believe that was outdated in 2007 as well. And it's painful. If it doesn't groove or what I'm saying ain't straight tripping, just say, oh, no, you didn't. You, you know, you're getting on my last now. They coincidentally run into Artie's old teacher, Merlin. Merlin was the old magic teacher at Worcestershire until he had a mental breakdown, left, and is now an island hermit. Icon behavior. Merlin won't give them directions back to far, far away until they get Shrek out of his rage spiral and take a journey into his soul. He believes that it would be irresponsible of him to send them back off to far, far away in their current emotional states. He's supposed to be like a weird hippie dude who eats rocks, but he's also not wrong. <laughs> All right, all right, journey to the soul. So to take that journey into their soul, they have to look into the magic fire and say what they see. Shrek sees a baby carriage, but lies and says he sees a pony and nobody calls him on it. It's a bad journey into the soul you're taking. Artie sees a baby bird and a daddy bird and a nest, but the daddy bird flies away. And when the baby bird tries to fly, it doesn't know how and it falls. And Artie's like, I get it. I have abandonment issues, so what? <laughs> we don't know who Artie's dad is, by the way. I don't even know how he's related to the dead king because the king was a frog. The king, hang on, the king was a frog. <laughs> All right, the fan wiki has informed me that apparently Artie is related to the queen by blood. She's his aunt, so. It's possible I forgot that you can be someone's uncle through marriage. Shrek and Artie go to have kind of their big heart to heart, where Shrek says he knows what it's like to not feel ready for something because he's gonna be a father. Uh, and Artie says he can't be king. I agree. Why are we not letting Lillian rule? She's incredibly capable. She's very politically trained. She was the second in command for the country for a very, very long time. I didn't get the idea that Far, Far Away is like incredibly patriarchal. Can we let Lillian do it? She's a very healthy woman. She's like still in her prime. Let her do it. Shrek and Artie both have daddy issues. Shrek's dad, he tells us, tried to eat him. So mm. Shrek says he's finally stopped believing that he's a monster the way everyone else believes he is. And Artie agrees that Shrek is all right. He just needs to yell less and they're cool now. The power of bonding over bad fathers, I guess. The princesses back at the castle are shuffling down those dark secret passages. They're all bitching at each other and calling each other jealous of their good looks. Cause you know, women, I guess. 
Something about the way they interact made me very uncomfortable. It's not like your attitude's helping, Snow. Well, maybe it just bothers you that I was voted fairest in the land. Oh, you mean in that rigged election. I like the princesses. I like that they're here. I like the little personalities that some of them have. The way that they interact with each other and the way that they interact with Doris is bad to me. But I gotta admit that charming makes me hotter than July. <sighs> they do find a way out. They sneak out through a window that they have in the secret pass, whatever. And Fiona sees them building some kind of big set for a performance. And then they run directly into a trap because Rapunzel has fallen in love with Charming and betrays the princesses for him. I don't know when she had the time to do this. I don't know when she met him. I don't know uh, how long has this been in the works. <laughs> they don't tell us that, but they do tell us she's gonna be the new queen because she's gonna marry Charming, who apparently promised her that he wouldn't hurt the others. He does say, Not here, kids and whiskers. Don't even discuss it later. Don't say that. And they'll get locked in a tower, undoubtedly bringing back some unwanted memories for Fiona. On the island, the trio is found by Captain Hook, who brought his piano to play while all of his goons do the fighting. I respect it. I've said it before, that man knows what he's about, and it's the piano. Hook reveals to Shrek that Charming has taken control of Far, Far Away. Donkey Puss and Artie are trapped in a net, and a cannon's aimed right for them, but Shrek moves it, so it destroys Hook's piano? That's all he had. You monster. And then the bad guys all disperse immediately. What was the point of that? Surely there was another way to let Shrek know that Charming had taken control of Far, Far Away without destroying Hook's piano and wasting my time. I don't know why I'm getting mad at this movie. I really, it's fine. This movie's fine. Shrek tries to convince Artie that he needs to go back to his magic school and be safe. Um, Artie says no, and goes to convince Merlin to just magic them all back to Far, Far Away because of how they don't have a boat and Merlin's kind of their only option. Merlin should just say yes, outright since they already did that journey to the soul thing with the fire. That's why they did that in the first place. Uh, but Artie does fake a full like manipulative weeping tantrum <laughs> breakdown to convince Merlin who goes along with it. Um, and for some reason, this also earns more of Shrek's respect. He likes Artie more now. Merlin magics them back to far, far away. <laughs> Somehow this process makes puss and donkeys switch bodies and that is the basis of every joke for the, either of them for the rest of the movie. How in the hands, Christian Anderson, am I supposed to parade around in this goofy boots? Hey, 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 hey. Very careful with those. So I hope you think that concept is hilarious. They rush into the city, which now has a sign up front that says, go, go away. They discover Pinocchio, who is now strung up as a puppet in a little machine that you put a quarter in and then he'll dance for you. That's really fucked up. That's a really fucked up thing to do to my boy, rightful winner of Far Far Away Idol, Pinocchio. He lets them know that Charming has Fiona locked up somewhere and that Charming has some big plan. And then the curtains fall on his little puppet show and they fucking leave him there? Guys, that is your friend. That guy sprung you out of jail a few years ago and you're going to leave him strung up as a puppet in a machine? They find posters hanging up for a show called Happily Ever After with a tagline saying it's Shrek's final performance. And a bunch of knights show up to come get Shrek because everybody in the city is trying to get Shrek for charming. Puss tries to do his cute face thing again, but he's in Donkey's body, so it doesn't work. They change tactics and start acting like Shrek is a diva who needs everything ready for his performance. We're dealing with Avatar. He's a star, people. Hello. I'm so sorry about this, Mr. Shrek. I'm gonna lose it. Now it works for some reason. Charming is up at the castle. The set's almost completed. Also, he's wearing pink leg warmers. And that's funny because Pink is for girls. Shrek finds Charming in his dressing room. Charming presses a panic button. A bunch of knights come in. Charming holds a knife to Artie's throat. He's like fully ready for murder these days. Fully ready to be the one doing murders, which is such, it's such character growth for him. Good for Charming. 
Shrek starts lying and saying he was just using Artie. He just needed someone to replace him because Shrek was actually next in line. Something Artie still did not know. Shrek calls Artie a loser and tells him to leave. You catch on real fast, kid. Maybe you're not as big of a loser as I thought. Artie is devastated that Shrek would betray him like this. And he leaves. But wh why? Like, I get that it's not fun to have the cool older male figure that you just connected to about how you don't have a dad. It's It sucks to have him call you a loser to try and hurt your feelings and reveal that he was lying to you. But Artie was terrified of the position of king like four hours ago. And he mostly seems sad that Shrek was lying and Artie doesn't get to be king. Artie didn't want to be king. He's 16 with no political training. And then we have another sad montage. This one set to Nine Crimes by Damien Rice. And maybe you don't know that song. I do. That's a song I love that I did not know was going to be in this movie. It's about cheating. It's about infidelity. And it's really sad. I got no excuse. Is that all right? Yeah. It really threw me off. Everybody's sad. Shrek is captured by Charming. Artie just fucks off into the city. Up in Princess Captivity Tower, Cinderella is stress cleaning. Sleeping Beauty is sleeping. And Snow White is bitching. Shut up, Cindy. Yeah, shut up. No, you shut up. Huh, just stay out of this. Who cares who's running the kingdom anyway? Cinderella and Sleeping Beauty have reverted back to their old coping mechanisms. And you know what? Snow White just has a lot to say. And honestly, that feels healthier than what the other two are doing. Donkey and Puss get trapped with the princesses. Why would they not put them somewhere else? Whatever, it works for us. They tell Fiona that Charming is going to kill Shrek tonight, which inspires Fiona to say they need to leave right now. Lillian headbutts the wall and it breaks? She says, You didn't actually think you got your fighting skills from your father, did you? No. I think she got them from Dragon. We've talked about this. Princesses all activate their fighting mode and rip up their dresses. Snow White has a dopey heart tattoo, but none for the other dwarves. Unless they all have one and they all got to like pick where their tattoo went and only Dopey picked to be anywhere on her arms at all. I think she just picked a favorite and that's a little mean, especially to just display it so publicly. You have seven of those guys, but they all escape to go free everyone. Shrek is being held captive and the Cyclops that's guarding him has brought his daughter that he loves to bring your kid to work day to really rub it in that Shrek has finally maybe come to terms with that he's gonna be a dad. Even though he's a monster, he can still be a good dad, but now it's too late because he's gonna die on stage. To get through the gates of the castle, Snow White is singing with her woodland creatures to distract them. And then that song turns into the immigrant song by Led Zeppelin and all the creatures kick the trees asses. <laughs> Puss and Donkey save the five Dronkies that were also in captivity. They also go back to get Pinocchio out of the little marionette box, and Gingy out of a bakery window where he was placed to be sold and eaten. We have already addressed his trauma this movie. Don't do this to him. They also get the pigs and the wolf. Doris distracts some guards with how nice her legs are and then beats them up. Puss and Donkey have to explain to Artie that Shrek lied to protect him after they completely coincidentally, accidentally run into him so they can even have this conversation. Artie seems so confused that that was even a possibility. Artie, it's not like it seems. <laughs> it's not? I think it seems pretty clear. He was using me. But he's also immediately convinced and is now on their team to go get track. Charming puts on his big show with his big, big, beautiful set. Rapunzel's playing the part of the princess to be saved, and they have a musical number about how he's here to save her. Princess, my love, at last we shall be free. 
Will you tell us all the other villains beyond the tech crew, like moving the props around and making the sound effects and being the ensemble? Like, they're all so excited to be putting on this show with him. Shrek is revealed on stage and he's unimpressed with the whole affair and starts making jokes about Charming. And the audience laughs at all his jokes, clearly on Shrek's side of this whole thing. It, it For a moment, devolves into just the roast of King Charming. Your time is done! Oh, if you don't mind, could you kill me and then sing? Be quiet! He's had enough. He goes in with his sword to kill Shrek when his sword is melted away by dragon. Obviously it's dragon. The whole posse comes in to save the day. Also, in this little bit, we find out Rapunzel was wearing a wig and was bald the whole time. Is that why she was evil? But wait, the whole squad is swarmed by the villains. The evil queen from Snow White in particular grabs Lillian and puts a knife to her throat from behind and it looks fucking personal. Like they take just a second to show it, it's, uh, it's intense. Also, this whole situation looks really dangerous, but Dragon is present and unrestrained and could put a stop to this in three seconds if she was asked. Never fear. Arthur is here, demanding that they all quit it. Who really thinks we need to settle things this way? Artie gives a speech to convince the villains that their lives can be better and they can be integrated into society. The villains say it's hard to come by honest work when no one trusts them or thinks they can be better when they're just kind of inherently disliked. And Artie comes back by saying, even when people think you're a monster or a loser, that doesn't mean you are, you're whatever you wanna be. So all the villains start talking about their real dreams they've always wanted to pursue. It's very tangled 2010. I've always wanted to play the flute. I'd like to open up a spa. In France. I grow daffodils. And they're beautiful. The ugly stepsisters, Doris and Mabel, reunite. Everyone seems to be swayed. The villains just straight up agree to change and be good people. It's so fast. <laughs> but Charming is pissed. He does not care what that child has to say, and he tries to kill Artie again. Shrek jumps in the way of the sword. Much like Harold did with the spell at the end of Shrek 2 2004, it's almost like we don't have ideas for different ways to make it really tense at the end. Uh, anyway, and it looks like he sacrificed his life for Artie. Shrek appears to be stabbed and dying. And Charming declares he is now king. But wait, it was a ruse. <laughs> Shrek is fine. It's the third death fake out of the movie. You need to work on your aim. Shrek says he won't give up on his happily ever after, pushes Charming across the stage. Dragon, obviously, knocks the big set tower down on top of him to mirror the way the set fell on him at the bad dinner theater at the beginning. And Charming is dead. Rocks fall. Charming dies. Hey, was Rapunzel still in the tower? When Dragon knocked it over? That would be bad. Or maybe it wouldn't be bad, because she was bald and a liar. Artie accepts the crown that has remained and is now king. A 16-year-old with no political training who did not want it. Amazing. Merlin appears and puts a donkey harass him to switch their bodies back, and he does. Shrek unfounded, says that he thinks Artie's going to be a good king. And Fiona, equally unfounded, says Shrek would have been a good king too. Why is Lillian not allowed any amount of political power here? Is she just going to be left to basically raise and train up Artie and teach him how to be king? Because no one else is going to do it. The only option is like Lillian's the regent until Artie knows what a king is. Anyway, it's a happy ending. Uh, Shrek and Fiona go back to the swamp to raise their <gasps> triplets with help from their friends in our last montage of the movie set to Losing Streak by Eels. For a franchise that really likes to pick songs with on the nose titles, Losing Streak is a weird one for your happy ending, but it's a nice song. <laughs> 
The babies are Fergus, Farkle, and Felicia, and Felicia wears a pink bow because how else would you know that that one's a girl? Ogres love traditional gender roles. Donkey, dragon, the dronkies, and puss are all there. Um, and so is Lillian. Who is helping Artie far, far away is going to collapse in like two weeks time. Movie ends with a crying baby waking up Shrek and Fiona and Shrek volunteering to take care of it. He's a good dad. He's trying. He's being the father that he didn't have and he's breaking cycles. That I can appreciate. I can't explain to you why parts of this movie got under my skin as much as they did. All I can explain to you is that it got under my skin and I wanted it to be half an hour shorter. I don't know where they would have taken that half an hour from, but I wish there was just less of it overall. I am just glad that now I don't have to watch it again. Next! And the only person standing in your way is you. Me? Get him, lads! Yeah! No, 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 no. I hope you all love Halloween and Christmas. This ogre cannot stay away from Halloween and Christmas. Shrek the Halls 2007 was a TV special released on ABC Network. It's about 22 minutes long, 30 with commercials. And it gives us the story of Shrek's first ever Christmas. I'm not even gonna get into Christmas being a widely recognized holiday and far, far away and what that means for the history of the land, including its associations with Christ. I can't get into that right now. This special opens up on Shrek and his babies basking in the sunshine, hanging out until Donkey rudely interrupts to tell Shrek it is 159 days until Christmas. Only for Shrek to inform Donkey that he does not care about Christmas. So you better be good. I better be good. How about this? You better be scarce. Donkey comes again to tell him about Christmas in the fall. Again, he doesn't care. And then again, we cut to the swamp covered in snow, which I is not traditionally how swamps get in the winter, but... Donkey pops out of snowbank to say it is the day before Christmas Eve. Christmas Adam, if you will. Shrek informs Donkey that no one at the swamp cares that it's Christmas. A white Christmas. Oh, how perfect. And it's our first one together as a family. Shrek, isn't this beautiful? And Shrek says yes and promises her a special Christmas and that there's going to be a surprise. He's lying. Okay, you did, man. You know that, right? Um... Hold that thought, I'll be right back. So Shrek runs off, heading for town, set to Ride of the Valkyries? Literally like two minutes in and the special's perfect. Nothing else needs to happen. Shrek goes to a bookstore, gets there right as they close, and the bookseller is so excited to help explain what Christmas is all about that she gets him the book Christmas for Village Idiots that has step-by-step instructions on how to do a Christmas correctly and doesn't even make him pay for it. Just shoves him out the door. So Shrek is now dedicated to following all the instructions in this book so that he can give Fiona the best possible Christmas. He wakes Fiona up with the ruckus of him decorating the swamp. Donkey comes by with Christmas cards. Donkey also insults the decorations, which Shrek does not take very well. And Fiona tells Donkey that Shrek just wants to have a nice family Christmas. That will come up later. We get a montage. Even the TV specials love their montages. This is a cute little Christmas song. Fiona and the triplets help decorate. They get their Christmas tree. They get their Christmas feast all uh, cooking. These are all steps in the book. And the next step, actually the final step in Christmas for Village Idiots is to read a Christmas story. So Shrek begins telling his children a Christmas story. And then here comes the family. I'm here to smother you with Christmas blood. Absolutely not. Bad donkey. Go home. Donkey has brought the big bad wolf, Pinocchio, the three bun mice, the dronkeys, dragon, puss in boots, the whole swamp squad, baby. Puss immediately just becomes entertainment for the babies. They're just like pulling on him. He's a great sport about it. I love puss in boots. 
They're all breaking everything. They're burning up the Christmas feast. They bring in their own tree that does not match the other decorations. They're starting a dance party. At one point, they accidentally physically shove Shrek out of his own house. But Shrek is very happy to see his babies, his triplets, having a good time under a table playing with the Dronkies. And he gets down under there with them and starts to continue his story, the a visit from St. Nicholas. And Donkey interrupts him to tell his own version of the story with a big Christmas display and a parade and a big waffle Santa. And then, hello, Puss in Boots, Puss in Boots interrupts to tell his own version of the story with Santa Claus, a hot Latin cat. The Santa I know was a hot Latin cat. But his own storytelling is interrupted when he gets distracted by the tassel of the Santa hat in his imagination. Gingy interrupts to talk about the time his girlfriend Susie was eaten alive by Santa Claus. We just can't stop traumatizing this cookie. Now you know that's not how it goes. You are there! Fight breaks out over Shrek's book. We get that classic everything gets destroyed chain reaction Shrek scene. They're everywhere in this franchise. Shrek gets lit on fire. I feel like that's also a staple of those scenes is somebody ends up on fire. This time it's Shrek. I got it! Don't worry, Shrek. Everything is under control. Oh. Oh, my. Shrek yells at everybody and sends them away for ruining his Christmas. But Fiona also leaves with the triplets, insisting that that was their family and that Shrek doesn't get it. And then we get a sad montage. Yeah, this thing is 22 minutes long and we fit in two montages. That is the Shrek way, baby. Shrek 5 better be montage only. This montage is set to the song Stars Shine in the Sky Tonight by Eels, a song that I don't know, but I do recognize Eels from the first word now because the Shrek franchise loves those aquatic snakes. I recognize them anywhere. What are you doing? Fiona catches up to the Swamp Squad to tell them what Shrek's plan originally was, and Shrek also comes to apologize. And he struggles through it, you know, because he's had some development these past uh, th three and a half, prob probably about four years that this franchise has covered. Um, and, and he's doing his best, but he does still say the sentence, some people can't help being annoying as part of his apology. That's very funny. I shouldn't have lost my temper back there. Apology accepted. Let's go eat. But he also reveals that this is not only his babies' first Christmas, not only the first Christmas for his family, but it's his first Christmas. And everyone is surprised by that information, which feels a little weird because I don't know what about Shrek and his backstory to them said festive, said family occasions, family getting together and having parties. But okay. Everyone's immediately very understanding. They assure him there's no right way to do Christmas, that it's okay to not know what you're doing, that the whole point is just to have the family together and, and to celebrate each other. So on Shrek's invitation, they all go back to the swamp. Shrek tells a new version of the night before Christmas where there's ogre claws and ends it with the phrase, Smelly Christmas to all, and to all a gross night. But what's this? They hear bells outside. They go out to see Santa and his reindeer up in the sky, gingy, terrified because of the aforementioned eating of his girlfriend, runs inside. So can canonically, Santa's real. Santa is real, he eats sentient cookies, and that's all we need to know about him. With his little Santa magic, Santa puts ogre ears on the moon, and that's how it ends. It's short, it's sweet, it's festive, it's a good time. I think it would be a very cute thing to watch with your family in the lead up to Christmas. I think it's hilarious to canonize Christmas as a thing celebrated by these characters. I don't know why that tickles me so much, but I think it's very funny that they celebrate Christmas. Halloween, which we'll talk about later. We know how much they love Halloween. I get it. These are Halloween people. Christmas? <laughs> they love Christmas. You need to decorate for Christmas. You need to get a tree for Christmas. You need to cook a meal for Christmas. And you need to tell a story for Christmas. These are the things we know about canon Christmas in the Shrek universe. So if it gets mentioned in Shrek 5, I swear to God, if they contradict any of this.
God, I love musicals. I love musicals so much. I am so excited to just have an excuse to watch a musical, a musical I've never seen in the middle of all of this. Shrek the Musical 2008 began production all the way back in 2002, just one year after Shrek 2001 premiered, but we did not get the musical until 2008. Shrek the Musical premiered in Seattle and then it also ran on Broadway from 2008 to 2010 and then it had national and international tours. Shrek the Musical is a very faithful adaptation of Shrek 2001 with a couple of little changes, a couple additions, but overall it's the familiar story we all know and love. For this one, I'm going to go through all of the songs listed on the soundtrack, tell you what happens in that song, and then rate that song for you. That's gonna be how we break down the plot here. The version that I watched is the official Broadway pro shot. That means it was recorded on Broadway, legally and officially by the people producing the show to then be distributed at a later date. That means this version has the original Broadway cast performing for two hours over the two acts, uh, making it the longest thing I've watched so far for this. And I went in completely untainted. I did not know a single thing about this musical. I knew it existed. I didn't know what its reception was like. I didn't know if people enjoyed it. I just knew it was real. I don't even think technically I would be required to watch this based on the conceit of this video, but here I am anyway. Yeah, I'm glad I did watch it. There are some bits of canon placed into the Shrek universe through Shrek the Musical 2008 that I do need to discuss. So let's begin. Big, bright, beautiful world. The intro is sung by Mama Ogre, Papa Ogre, and Shrek. Yeah, we get to see Shrek's parents. I haven't seen those guys since Shrek 1990, the children's book that the whole franchise is supposedly based off of. They tell seven-year-old Shrek he is finally old enough to leave home and celebrate his departure, and they warn him that no one's gonna like him. Basically just telling him, hey, it's a big, beautiful world out there, but not for you. I gotta be so honest with you. The makeup and the costumes in the show are so good. <laughs> They're so fun. I'm so into it. If a single one of you tries to tell me that the people on the stage look scary, you know what they look? They look theatrical. That's how they look. Adult Shrek appears by breaking his outhouse apart. Um, but overall, this entire intro is it kind of slow. Honestly, it's a lot chiller than I expected it to be. Uh, the energy picks up when Adult Shrek, played by Brian Darcy James, shows up and takes over and turns it into this big I Am song, which is weird. So in musicals, there's a lot of different types of songs, and usually a protagonist in the first few songs of the musical will get what's called their I Want song. It's sort of the big introduction to their motivations, their purposes, what they are doing in this musical overall. We don't get that from Shrek here, not in the opening. He just sings about what ogres are like. That's what we'd call an I Am song which is not usually what a protagonist gets. And we will talk about I Want songs more later. Uh, six out of 10, this was an effective opening, but honestly, it was kind of boring. <laughs> the immediate next song is Story of My Life, sung by all of the fairy tale creatures. That's the story of my life. Cannon, one of the three little pigs is prone to panic attacks. Cannon, one of the displaced fairy tale creatures from Lord Farquaad's decree was the fairy godmother. Like Prince Charming's mother, the fairy godmother, she's here. This song gives some backstory to different members of the fairy tale creature ensemble about how their life is hard, they're being resettled, they're being threatened with execution if they go back to Duloc because of Farquaad's order. The big bad wolf drops the tea slur. When I tell you I did not know anything about this musical, I really didn't know anything about this musical. And then 12 minutes into the musical, the character I really like, the big bad wolf in the dress, uses a, uses a transphobic slur. I physically recoiled. I was halfway across the room. <laughs> Have been made aware that in modern productions, almost all of them don't say that. Um, they replace the word with granny. <sighs> And I did, I needed to say that it happens. I needed to warn you that it happens in case you go and watch Shrek the Musical 2008. But it, nothing like that happens again in the musical. It is a, a single instance, 12 minutes in. Anyway, this song is, um, 
upsettingly catchy and more of an I want song than they've given Shrek so far. These guys have like goals and desires and weirdly immediately seem to be framed to be like the main characters. To me, it's like the intro was setting up the world and then now we're here with our characters. <laughs> I can't give this one a rating. It's really catchy and it's fun and it's, it's just learning it. This is worse than that time I caught the jump disease in Tijuana. Next is story of my life, Tag. This is the little tag that the creatures sing to convince Shrek to go petition Farquaad for them and save their lives. You're our only this is where Shrek really starts to talk. And the thing about Brian Darcy James as Shrek is he has a great singing voice. There's a lot of power in his singing voice, but whatever he's doing with his accent and his speaking voice does not work for me. They stay on my swamp and avoid large crowds or haven't you read the story? <laughs> and it's not like he's doing a Mike Myers impression and failing. He's very much not sounding like Mike Myers at all. But whatever accent he's taking on just sort of removes all of the presence and power from his voice. It makes him really awkward. I, I don't like it. And I'm going to be honest, I did not warm up to it at all during the entirety of the show. Anyway, four out of 10. <laughs> Next is the goodbye song, again, sung by the fairy tale creatures. You'll notice um, the entire last three songs, Shrek hasn't sung at all. Um, this is just a big send off from all the, the creatures in the swamp and it's 20 seconds long and it's big musical energy. Eight out of 10. And then we get Don't Let Me Go, sung by Donkey. Don't let me go, don't let me go, don't let me go, oh, 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 oh. Shrek saves Donkey, played here by Daniel Breaker, and Donkey's gonna show him the way to Duloc. And Donkey's wildly flamboyant in this one, gang. All of his mannerisms are very here, and here, and hip-hopped, and legs. He's fun to watch. I feel like Daniel Breaker was really having a good time up there. And he's trying everything to convince Shrek to take him with on this adventure and be his friend. Six out of ten. <laughs> Under arrest, eh? Regiment is sung by the guards, introducing the fact that Lord Farquaad exists. Here, we, <laughs> we also get to see the gingy prop, which is really fun. Uh, we get my main man, Thelonious, back in the scene. And we get to see Farquaad's costume, which I think is really fun to make him short. He's on his knees the entire show, but the pants the real man is wearing are black. And then he has these bright yellow legs like taped to his thighs with the shoes on his knees. We're on to I Know It's Today, sung by Fiona. Actually, three different versions of Fiona. Now I know. The magic mirror shows us Fiona's backstory after Farquaad chooses her as his new future wife. The song starts with seven-year-old Fiona locked up in the tower, giving us a canon age of when she was sent away, baby. Yeah. Seven years old. <laughs> She's reading the story of Rapunzel, which is weird because her friend Rapunzel would also be a child at this point, but who cares? Child Fiona is so cute and she does such a good job. And then we transition to teenage Fiona, still waiting, still knowing it's today that her prince is going to appear. And then we get to adult Fiona, Tony Award winner Sutton Foster in this pro shot anyway. She's impatient, she's tearing her books apart. We get canon, Fiona's good at bowling, and canon, it's been 8,423 days, which is 23 years. Hey guys, hey guys. I do love knowing that she's 30. I love knowing we're getting away from that Disney princess, they're all teenagers thing, but 23? Years? And at the end, all three Fiona sing together. Nine out of 10. This one is really cute. It's a beautiful little I want song for Fiona. And I love that they let her talk and have a character moment earlier on in the story than in Shrek 2001. Day number 23. Day number 9. Day 50 number 8,423. What's Up Duloc is sung by Farquaad and the Duloc performers, the ensemble. No one from the gutter in Duloc. He's in a Embrace the cookie cutter in Duloc. It starts just as the Welcome to Duloc song from Shrek 2001. Welcome to Duloc. And then it transitions into Farquaad's 
first song, which made me realize he wasn't introduced with this song. I don't know. I would have preferred this to be his introduction, but whatever. Technically, this is a villain song about how Farquaad is cleaning up Duloc and making it perfect. The costumes continue to be the best part of this musical for me. The little outfits they've got the Duloc performers in, I want one. I want to wear one. <laughs> 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10. I was smiling like crazy. This whole number is great. What's up, Duloc Reprise, sung by Farquaad, and again, the Duloc performers. Um, in this version of the story, instead of a contest where people have to fight to see who's gonna go get Fiona, there's a raffle drawing. Also, Farquaad actually says he has a package he needs picked up, which is the exact joke I made when I was talking about Shrek 2001. How did he know that? But just like in Shrek 2001, uh, Farquaad sees Shrek, changes the rules, Shrek gets to go. Uh, eight out of 10, it's perfectly fine. And it ends with a wicked joke with Farquaad imitating Elphaba, doing the little ah from Defying Gravity. That was cute. And it draws on Shrek's storied history of pulling jokes from other stories in its same medium. So basically, it's the perfect joke, is what I'm saying. Onions have layers. Oh, yeah, get it? We both have layers. Oh, you both got layers. Hey, it's been seven full songs since we've heard Shrek do a single note. So it's time for Travel Song, sung by Donkey and Shrek. So I'm singing and I'm having with you. Ha <laughs> ha, see? Makes the time go by faster. Shrek continues to be the worst part of this musical for me. This is the second time he's sung at all and Donkey is dragging him into it, kicking and screaming. This song feels like the musical's response to the Shrek franchise's love for montages, just sort of showing them traveling through different environments, passing different things. There's a Puss in Boots cameo. He's a little puppet in the background. Little melody, counter melody action representing their different attitudes, which actually switches at one point when they go to cross the rope bridge and Shrek gets happy and Donkey's sad to be there. This is also the song where we got a really good look at how much Daniel Breaker is fucking sweating in the full body fur that is the donkey suit they've got him in. I cannot imagine putting in that much energy into a performance when you're sweating that bad. I would have been a puddle. I would have been a puddle. Six out of 10, just cause Shrek is getting on my nerves for some reason. Here we go, here we go, donkey pot pie. This song is sung by Donkey, Dragon, and the skeletons of some dead knights. Donkey gets found by Dragon. And you might, th you might think to yourself, well, how do they represent Dragon on the stage? They just, got, they just got a lady up there in a dragon suit. No, they do not. No, they do not. There is a huge, beautiful, dragon puppet, massive. But dragon is also represented by three female singers in these amazing like dragon scale outfits and mohawks. They're a trio, which feels so cool. Cause like dragon is so big and her presence is so massive that it takes a full trio to represent what she sounds like. Are you kidding? That's so cool. I'm sorry. <laughs> Basically, this is a rock song about how bad Dragon is gonna eat Donkey, just all of him forever. I'm gonna make you, I'm gonna make you a donkey pot pie. What? Uh, that then turns into a sort of rom-com-esque ditty where Donkey is complimenting her. And then we go back into the rock song where Dragon's singing about how she's gonna love him and keep him forever. Including the line, I'm gonna squeeze you, I'm gonna tease you, I'm gonna please you. That was a bit much. But truly, actually, for real, 12 out of 10. 12 out of 10. Obsessed, obsessed, obsessed with how they portray Dragon and how it was performed. Oh, it was so good. It was so good. In some productions, there's a different song that replaces this one called Forever that actually makes Dragon kind of sympathetic. And she sings about how no one's ever going to come to her rescue. Basically about how she can't believe that Donkey would want her, that he would come save her. It rules. It's a very, very good number. Um, but Dragon is not a trio of sexy women with mohawks in it. So take that as you will. This is how a dream comes true is sung by Fiona and also our dragon trio. This is how a dream comes true. This is how I pictured you. 
Fiona sings to Shrek after he rescues her. Like, this is how it was always meant to happen. This is how the dreams come true. But also you're doing everything wrong and this isn't how I planned it. Because she's had 23 years to plan it. Our Dragon Choir does some really intense vocalizations for the chasing of Shrek and Donkey and Fiona. Um, Fiona spends the entire time in her delusion era, pretending there's no danger, everything's fine, her dreams are coming true, and then they escape the castle. Six out of ten. In the end, remember, all your dreams come true! Who I'd Be is our act one finale song sung by Shrek, Donkey, and Fiona. They do that whole revealing that Shrek's an ogre thing and Fiona goes to hide for the night. And then Shrek and Donkey start talking about if they could be anybody, if they couldn't be who they are right now and they had to be somebody else, who would they be? And this is finally Shrek's I Want song. We finally get an actual musical number about what the man wants, and he wants to be someone respected and powerful, someone people don't immediately hate upon first sight. He doesn't want to be alone anymore. He wants a happy ending, and it brings back bits of Big Bright Beautiful Worlds, that opening number. An ogre always hides, an ogre's fate is known. We also get transformed Ogre Fiona in the back, singing bits from I Know It's Today, weaving in. The three of them are all singing together. Nine out of ten. Great end of the act. Big, energetic, emotional. Loved it. Of course I'd be a hero And I would scale a tower To save a hothouse flower I'd carry her away Intermission. Act two. Act two starts with Morning Person, a song sung by Fiona and a bluebird. Back to human Fiona singing, excited to be out in the world after 23 years in the tower. She's a morning person. She's adorable. Sutton Foster is great at what she does. I've always been a morning person, a morning girl. <laughs> Fiona meets the Pied Piper. She takes his flute and uses it even better than he does to make some rats dance. And there's a really fun bit where the curtain is behind Fiona almost all the way down, okay? And there's tap dancers behind the curtain with shoes that look like rats. So all you can see are these rat shoes dancing along. It's really good. Fiona gets a saucy little costume change. There's a dance break. Nine out of 10. This is another one I was just smiling through the whole time. And I just love the set and the costumes so much. I'm just happy that it's a new day. I Think I Got You Beat is sung by Shrek and Fiona. This is their first actual duet. And I think the weakest part of this entire show is when they have Brian Darcy James's Shrek just do jokes verbatim from Shrek 2001. It's not good. <laughs> Let me put it this way, princess. Men of Farquaad stature are in short supply. <laughs> this song is Shrek and Fiona comparing their unhappy childhoods to see who had it worse. Honestly, I spent the whole time bored. I spent the whole time bored. I read a review of this show after watching it where they brought up I think I got you beat specifically to say it was kind of the moment where Shrek and Fiona clicked for them. I don't see it. I personally don't see it. I think I got you beat. I think I got you beat. <laughs> they do connect at the end. They stop fighting and start singing together because they realize they were both sent away as children. They're actually both sent away at age seven. That's true love, baby. Also, canon, Fiona was sent away to the tower on Christmas Eve, which is devastating in particular because we know from Shrek the Halls, Fiona loves Christmas. Four out of 10. I don't know, I, I swear I like musicals. <laughs> the Ballad of Farquaad is sung by Farquaad and the guards. Thelonious speaking line, my man Thelonious gets a speaking line. It's just to tell Farquaad that Fiona's on her way, but he talks. <laughs> We've just gotten word, my leech. Princess Fiona has been rescued. She's on her way. This song gives us Lord Farquaad backstory. And I know that you think you don't need Lord Farquaad's backstory. You are wrong. You are incorrect. Canon. Lord Farquaad's father is grumpy, like of Snow White's dwarves. This is such a choice. Daddy didn't talk much. He barely said hello. He simply muttered, hi-ho, and off to work he'd go. That does mean that Farquaad is a fairy tale creature. It does mean that Farquaad is at least half 
fairy tale creature. You know, the race of people that he said had to leave the kingdom forever or be faced with execution. He also threatens his father in particular with execution in this song. A a man he has not seen in years. Seven out of 10, the song's just fine. The backstory reveal bowled me over. Why does everyone in this franchise need daddy issues? Every single one of them. The guest list will be major without a minor minor. Air guitar crossover sung by Shrek and Fiona. It's Shrek and Fiona playing air guitar at each other, falling in love about it. Three out of 10. It's like 15 seconds long and I was not charmed. Make a move sung by Donkey and the three blind mice who are here now. Donkey has noticed his friends falling in love, sings with the three blind mice about how Shrek needs to make a move. Think Kiss the Girl from The Little Mermaid. Five out of 10, it's fun, it's bouncy, it happened. When Words Fail is sung by Just Shrek. I don't like, he has a good singing voice. The parts of the song that are him singing, he's really good. But when it goes back into that kind of talking in rhythm, I just, I don't know what he's doing and I don't like it and I feel bad about it. (laughs) And by big, I don't mean chubby. Obviously, you're not fat. This happens while Donkey is learning Fiona's ogre secret, um, and Shrek is practicing his speech about his feelings. He's worried that he's not going to actually be able to tell her because he's nervous. And it ends with the same miscommunication from the movie, where he overhears Fiona talking about monsters and princesses not going together, and he's like... (sighs) I can't believe she's talking about me. Three out of 10, let's pick it up a little. Morning Person Reprise, sung by Fiona. Looks can be deceiving, but feelings cannot lie. Fiona's human again, even though she was just an ogre in the last scene, which is a trick to pull off in musical theater, but they have this fun little thing that they do where ogre Fiona actually isn't painted green in these scenes. She is just lit in entirely green, like spotlighting. So she just needs the the prosthetic nose, the little ears, and she's good to go. This song is Fiona admitting to herself that she's in love with Shrek, and then it has the same miscommunication as the movie where she thinks Shrek knows her secret and he's mad at her and thinks she's gross. Uh, Six out of 10, 20 second song, I love Sutton Foster. The arrival of Farquaad, sung by Farquaad. (laughs) (laughs) Whoa, plastic horse. Farquaad shows up and just sings Fiona's name a bunch in a row. That's the whole song. Eight out of 10, I think I just really like Farquaad. Build a wall, sung by Shrek. This is Shrek singing about how he needs to build a wall around his whole swamp to keep everyone out. I'm going to build me a wall as the repeated line of your song hits differently now than I assume it hit in 2008. A 10-foot wall. But check, it's not what you think. Just let me explain. I'm going to build me a wall. It's kind of a long song and a lot of energy. It's really energetic for a change of heart that we know as the audience who's seen Shrek 2001 before is going to be like immediately reversed. Yeah, I bet Shrek is gonna say bitter and hardened forever. What story is this? (laughs) Six out of 10, this song would be really fun to belt while driving actually, because heartbreak songs always are. What a fool to think she might love me. Freak Flag, sung by the fairy tale creatures, who we haven't seen since the beginning of act one. (laughs) Because Shrek successfully retrieved Farquaad's package, all the fairy tale creatures get evicted from the swamp. And they all sing about accepting what it is that makes them strange. Let your freak flag fly. Let your freak flag wave. The guy doing Pinocchio, by the way, is doing a great movie Pinocchio impression. I, that feels like it'd be really difficult to maintain that long. He does it while he sings too. Raise it way up, Anyhow, they take it upon themselves to approach Lord Farquaad to go crash his wedding and confront him. That's such a fun change from Shrek 2001. Nine out of 10. It's a really cute ensemble piece. It's a little heavy handed and it's messaging, but ain't that just the way. It's time to do what we should have done a long time ago. Wedding procession sung by the ensemble. Wordless vocalizations uh, from the ensemble. It's really pretty uh, to lead us into Fiona arriving to her wedding. Four out of 10. Big 
Bright, beautiful world. Reprise, sung by Shrek. Shrek has crashed the wedding. Fiona's asking him to explain himself, and he's singing to convince her of his feelings, um, including the line, if true love is blind, maybe you won't mind the view. That was sweet. Okay. I'll tear down a wall and clear a spot for you two. 10 out of 10. I actually cried. And I don't even like this Shrek. <laughs> a princess and an ogre, I admit, is complicated. He's just so earnest. He's like begging for her to just hear him out. And it's all sung as well. The ogre has fallen in love with the princess, oh good lord. <laughs> Cathedral Sunset, sung by the ensemble. The fairy tale creatures have just crashed the wedding to taunt Farquaad with his father. They brought Grumpy with. Uh, Fiona's an ogre, sun has set. And then the ensemble does some very pretty vocalizations for Fiona's magical girl transformation to staying exactly the same. You know how it goes. Also, Dragon kills Farquaad, smashing through the big cathedral window and burning him with dragon fire. Eight out of 10, the song part's just fine. I don't understand how they broke the cathedral window like that. How'd they put it back together? They gotta put the set back together at the end of the night. They, they got, what, they're probably doing like eight shows a week. Beautiful Ain't Always Pretty, sung by Shrek. This song is exactly one line long and it's the words, beautiful ain't always pretty. Six out of 10. Finale, sung by Like Everyone. This is a song about how they're telling their own stories now. It's a final message of self-acceptance and how they all love each other for who they are. Seven out of 10, it's a finale. You know musical theater, how, how all finales sound? It sounds like that. We are different and united. You are us and we are you. Except, <laughs> it's not the finale. I'm a believer. Like my smash mouth? <laughs> yeah, that's their closing number for the show. Uh, they do a big dance and they sing I'm a believer by Smash Mouth. That's more like it. I'm a believer, 10 out of 10. It's I'm a Believer by Smash Mouth. And that's the end of Shrek the Musical 2008. I don't recommend watching the entirety of Shrek the Musical 2008 unless you're already a big musical person. Um, except you should listen to What's Up Duloc, you should listen to Donkey Pot Pie or Forever if you'd prefer, and uh, maybe Morning Person as well because Sutton Foster is truly such a delight and she's so good. At, at musical theater, good career choice, Sutton. Uh, and I think that's it for that. I forgot to tell you we're on day five. That th we're Welcome to day five. Day five gets pretty weird, but not as weird as day six will be. Next. God bless us, everyone! Shrek Forever After 2010. The first thing I need to say is that the original title for this movie was Shrek Goes Forth because it's the fourth Shrek movie. Are you kidding me? I am obsessed. It's terrible. Shrek Goes Forth. Where is he going? Where is he going? It's the last one. <laughs> I mean, obviously it's not anymore because we will be blessed with Shrek 5 any day now and we must be ready. But this was advertised as and originally intended to be the final film in the primary Shrek franchise. I say the primary franchise because Puss in Boots 2011 was very much already in the works, but we'll get to him. This movie is also widely seen as being just uh, fine. Like 57% good if you ask certain fruit websites. Trek 2001 was setting up a story, an environment, a character. It was creating a cultural moment. Shrek 2 expanded on that story and deepened its themes. Shrek 3 said, what if we put him in a high school for 15 minutes and brought in a bunch of other princesses and gave them babies? And Shrek 4 says, what if we did some alternate universe fan fiction? <laughs> if you've never seen it before, this movie gets kind of weird. Let's just get into it. <laughs> Shrek Forever After 2010 does start with a storybook opening again about Fiona's backstory, um, meaning that officially Shrek the Third is the only one that doesn't for some reason, is if I needed another reason to be mad about Shrek the Third. And then we jump into a flashback about Harold and Lillian. 
They go to a fantasy trailer park inhabited by witches and vampires and monsters, and they make a whole show out of locking their carriage doors. Okay. And they're here to meet someone recommended to them highly by King Midas, so we know he's gonna be good. Should also make it clear, Harold, human. Not a frog, human man. King Harold and Queen Lillian are about to sign over their entire kingdom to Rumpelstiltskin because they're smart and they make good choices. Few things, Rumpelstiltskin has a very mean goose named Fifi. This is not what Rumpelstiltskin looked like when we saw him in Shrek the Third, 2007, which means we have to assume that Rumpelstiltskin is a really common name in Far, Far Away. This is just a different one. You know, sometimes you go somewhere and there's three guys named William and sometimes there's two villains named Rumpelstiltskin. It happens. This deal that the king and queen are so ready to sign is that Rumpelstiltskin will lift Fiona's curse in exchange for the entirety of Far, Far Away. And they do not ask very many questions of the man. I kind of get it. If Fiona's been gone for 23 years, I'd be a little desperate too, right? That's my daughter. I want her back. It's not like she's uh, getting any younger. Right before they sign, the royals learn that Fiona has been saved and the deal is off. Uh, who saved her? That was way back in Shrek 2001. So now in the times of Shrek forever after 2010, Rumpel is an outcast who wishes that Shrek was never born and also gets kicked out of a bookshop that Pinocchio is working at. I'm glad to see that he's out there making his living even after Far, Far Away Idol snubbed him. I'm still not over it, man. I'm fighting for you. Apparently the kingdom of Far, Far Away is in a time of great peace. So I guess King Artie is doing fine. Good for him. We don't see him once in this movie. We don't hear his name. Once in this movie, it's kind of like Shrek the Third never happened except for how Shrek and Fiona have babies. That's the only consequence of that entire movie on this movie. That's not a joke. It just makes me feel like either Shrek the Third 2007 or Shrek Forever After 2010 is out of place, doesn't belong here. If one of them doesn't matter, why are they both here? And I know that that is saying a lot from the person sitting here subjecting themselves to every single piece of Shrek media. But listen, it means I am entitled to deciding what matters. (laughs) At the swamp, the triplets wake up Shrek and Fiona and they're talking, at least Felicia's talking. A fantasy like tour bus comes by, like those tour of celebrity homes that I've heard you can take in California uh, to see Shrek and his house. Puss in Boots and Donkey come visit for dinner and Donkey brings his babies and they all get along and they're happy and fulfilled and Shrek and Fiona are great parents. It's domestic bliss, honestly. And they lived happily ever after. <laughs> And then we see the same beats of that day play over and over and over again. The tour bus comes by every day. The babies are gross in the same way every day. They're waking up early every single day. Puss and donkey keep coming over for dinner. How dare they? And Shrek is tired of it. He fought so hard for his happily ever after for three movies. Ended the last movie, Shrek the Third, by pushing Charming to his death and saying he wasn't gonna give up on his happy ending. And now he's already sick of it. It has been less than a year and he's sick of it. (laughs) Come on. His life is very hard. He misses being a a feared swamp hermit. He literally gets out his old wanted poster to get nostalgic over. I understand missing simpler times, but man. (laughs) Dragon flies Shrek, Fiona, Donkey, and all eight present babies uh, to the triplets' first birthday party. They're one year old. The guys from the mob in Shrek 2001 show up to the party uh, to ask Shrek to sign their pitchforks and talk about how scary he was back when he was a real ogre. Inside the party, a child asks Shrek to do the roar, do the roar. He's a big, big fan. 
to the roar. Do his big scary ogre roar for him. Shrek says no multiple times over the course of this scene. This child and his father will not leave him alone. <laughs> the muffin man is there making the babies a big cake. Doris is here. I'm so glad we're still friends with Doris. Actually, Mabel is also here. So we got both ugly stepsisters. No Cinderella. No Snow White. No Sleeping Beauty. Again, because Shrek the Third, 2007, didn't happen as far as we're concerned. But uh uh-oh, the three little pigs eat the whole cake and the triplets are crying and Shrek is being pressured to roar because he's just seen as a commodity now. And Pinocchio is freaking out and running in circles and everything's falling apart and Fiona's asking what's wrong and Shrek roars and it's huge and scary and he does it because he's mad and he needs a release for these feelings. But then everybody cheers because it's like a cool little performance he put on. His emotions are like a fun little performance. They're all so happy. Shrek is not happy. Puss brings up a backup cake that he found and Shrek smashes it, smashes it with his big ogre fist and that people do not cheer for. People actually don't like that he did that. And then he storms away from his baby's first birthday party and he yells at his wife. He says Fiona isn't a real ogre and straight up tells her that the life that he misses is the one he had before he saved her. Like explicitly in those words. You mean back before you rescued me from the dragon's keep? Exactly. Basically Shrek misses when he was exactly all the things that he spent three movies, proving that ogres don't have to be. He misses when he was just a big hulking meanie with no other feelings. Even though he had, he had the feelings the whole time, the whole point, the, the whole point of all three of the movies, of all three of the movies, is that he's always been a complex creature. People just didn't treat him like one because they didn't see ogres as people. But now, they still don't see him like people. They see him as like a commodity. I understand why he's frustrated. I fully do. He is a valid in this. And Fiona is not doing a great job hearing him out. But my God, man, don't say that to your wife. Also, how weird is it for like the primary issue of this movie at the beginning, at least, to be about the pressure of celebrity when all three of the previous movies were about feeling like you don't belong in a world that doesn't trust you? That, that's weird, right? Rumpelstiltskin was here. He was digging through the trash for scraps to eat because he's a raccoon uh, with his monstrous horse-sized goose, Fifi. I don't know why she's that big now, but she is. Uh, he sees Shrek storm off and he follows. He has a plan. The plan involves Rumpelstiltskin getting under a cart and feigning distress like he's stuck to lure Shrek in to come help. Um, And he does because Shrek is a nice man and always has been at his core. Uh, Rumpelstiltskin baits Shrek about whether or not he's a real ogre or an ogre at all. And he gets Shrek into the carriage with the promise of drinks. Liquid vision to ease the frustration of all while in this very nice carriage. I don't know why Rumpelstiltskin is like rooting around the garbage for scraps. This carriage is beautiful on the inside, whatever. Shrek complains that he's no longer a real ogre. So Rumpelstiltskin offers him a deal, an ogre for a day deal. Shrek will have one day to be a real ogre in exchange for one day from Shrek's childhood. And initially, Shrek insists on knowing the catch, right? He knows it's not a for freebies, what do you want? Um, But he doesn't ask enough questions about this give a day, get a day arrangement, especially when Rumpel says he'll just take a day Shrek doesn't remember, a day from when he's a baby. Shrek is so down. He doesn't ask enough questions. I never needed to ask for anyone's permission before. So why start now? Shrek signs the contract and is immediately sent to the Shrek was never born AU, alternate universe. (laughs) Yeah, Rumpelstiltskin stole the day he was born. Obviously. Now Shrek does not realize that that is the AU that he has been transported into and has just a little joyous montage causing problems on purpose. The tour bus is terrified of him. Villagers flee. The woods are full of wanted posters again, except... They're not of Shrek. They're of Ogre, Fiona. Shrek finds the swamp empty, the woods destroyed, himself captured by witches. 
to be taken to Rumpelstiltskin. The witches have like lanterns at the front of their brooms and cauldrons hanging out their back and poison apple smoke bombs. I love them. I would love to be a Shrek witch. In the sort of like transport prisoner carriage that Shrek gets put into, he's being pulled by Donkey, who is being used both as the beast of burden pulling the carriage and also the radio. The witches are making him sing. Yeah, I'm driving, so uh, I'm in charge of the music. Yeah. Donkey does not know who Shrek is, has absolutely no idea who he is, and Shrek is still not getting it. They arrive in Far, Far Away, and it has been ruined, but the new palace is huge and shiny with a big R on top. What could possibly have happened, Shrek? What's going on? In the streets of Far, Far Away, we find out that Gingy is fighting in baked good gladiatorial matches and honestly seems to be having the time of his life about it. Inside of the castle, we see there are a few ogres performing manual slave labor. And just a little further in from that, there's a huge dance party with disco lights happening inside the castle, attended exclusively by witches and Rumpel's big goose Fifi. And you know they're all witches because they're all wearing identical pointy hats, as though it's like a part of their body, like witches in this universe, just grow that hat. That's what I think. And the big bad wolf in the castle, his job is putting different wigs on Rumpelstiltskin. Pinocchio is here to sign a deal to become a real boy, uh, but he gets interrupted and can't even sign the no doubt bad deal he was going to get into. He can't experience real boyhood for even a moment. And this is where Rumpelstiltskin reveals to Shrek that he stole Shrek's entire existence. Ladies, this is the guy that made all this Awesome. Because in this reality, Harold and Lillian signed over the kingdom of Far, Far Away, which apparently caused them to stop existing. That, I don't know why that happened. I don't know why that happened at all, but they're gone. They turned into dust. And at the end of the day, at the end of this day they're currently in, Shrek will meet the same fate turning into golden dust. This is the point where I realized that almost every primary Shrek antagonist is an effeminate royal man that wants to be king. And two of the three effeminate men that want to be king are tiny effeminate men that want to be king. I don't know what that says. <laughs> I just noticed it. It's a pattern that you pick up on when you watch all of Shrek as quickly as possible. Shrek steals a broom, grabs donkey, and escapes the castle, smashing a, a huge a hanging ball into a window and getting out that way. Donkey is scared of him. He's convinced Shrek is going to eat him. Uh, Shrek sings a little song to try and convince him they're friends and Donkey bolts. Cause what the fuck was that? You've got a friend. Donkey does come back after Shrek sits down and cries over his daughter Felicia's little plush ogre uh, because he's showing genuine emotion and is no longer seen as a threat. Donkey is also horrified that Shrek signed a Rumpelstiltskin contract, but does let him know that there are always secret exit clauses. And this one can be nullified with true love's kiss. Ain't that just the way? Hey, well, you're gonna have to take me to dinner first. <laughs> so now they have to find Fiona. But in a world where Shrek didn't exist, Fiona would still be locked up. No, she wouldn't. No, she fucking wouldn't. We saw in Shrek 2, 2004, okay, that almost immediately after Shrek got Fiona, Prince Charming arrived to get Fiona. Max two weeks. Max two Two weeks after Fiona was rescued by Shrek, she would have been rescued by Prince Charming. Are you telling me that Fiona was at her absolute limit the day that Shrek got there? That if he was two days later, she would have burst out the window? I don't think so. I don't think so. And we know that Harold and Lillian were dissolved into golden dust like two moments after Fiona would have been rescued. So... <laughs> <laughs> who rescued Prince Charming would have rescued Fiona, okay? Acting like nobody else could have made it there. He literally made it. He made it into the highest room of the tallest tower where he saw my friend, the big bad wolf, hanging out, reading Pork Illustrated. I remember it well. Unless Fiona was literally on the brink. In Shrek 2001, 
This makes no sense. However, they go to the castle where Fiona was locked up, which I really thought was further away. Remember, they have until the end of this one day. Okay, and they go all the way to Fiona's castle to find out that Fiona is not there. And instead, Shrek finds a wall covered in tally marks and her crown abandoned, her favor, handkerchief abandoned. He says, if I didn't save Fiona, who did? It would have been Rich Charming. I'm fine. Uh, Shrek tries to use Donkey as a bloodhound to track down Fiona's scent, but um, instead Donkey finds a plate of waffles set up in the middle of the woods. Uh, surprise, it's a trap, and Donkey is whisked away underground. Shrek follows him to find an entire colony of ogres living in secret. Uh, they immediately accept Shrek as a comrade in arms and shove him in some armor, welcoming him to the resistance. Let's go, Wait a minute. The one who welcomes him is named Brogan and is voiced by John Hamm. John Hamm? I didn't know you were gonna be here. I, I would have dressed up. <laughs> We also meet the chef of the colony, Cookie, uh, because he's trying to take Donkey to go cook and eat. But, you know, Shrek puts the kibosh on that. And there, hark, returning to camp. Ogre Fiona, still cursed, but it is nighttime right now. Uh, she is the leader of the army of ogres here to revolt against Rumpelstiltskin. For some reason, Shrek is surprised. She doesn't know who he is. And he tries to just tell her their shared backstory in front of everyone. A patrol of witches come through the whole colony, enters like a hiding mode. Uh, and Fiona tells them that after tonight, there should be no more witch patrols to worry about. That's my wife. Well, I see who wears the chain mail in your family. In Rumpelstiltskin's like, court, his like meeting room. He says, we're not just an empire, we're a family. That's some obnoxious corporate bullshit if I've ever heard it. He also threatens them all with a goblet of water, uh, making it clear that the water is going to kill them, canon. Um, in fact, he does kill the one that gives him a good idea of how they're going to get Shrek back, which is to hire a bounty hunter, which is rude. It's a rude thing to do to that lady. So he's going to go hire a bounty hunter. <laughs> In Ogre Colony, Fiona leads a war room, which is where we realize that she is comically smaller than every other ogre, including other female ogres. So I have to assume it's just like part of her curse. I don't know why she's so much littler than them. Shrek is also smaller than the other ogres, but only by a little bit. So like maybe he was just underfed as a child. <laughs> Fiona has planned an ambush to kill Rumpelstiltskin and free far, far away. Cookie insists on bringing his chimichanga stand to the ambush. If you watch this movie as a child, but then like never again after that, you probably remember the bits about this man and his love for chimichangas. Trust me, Fiona, y'all gonna be really hungry after this ambush, okay? Go and finish your little speech. Shrek has absolutely zero concern for the revolution and is fully focused on how to woo Fiona. Uh, in his explanations, he tells Donkey that Donkey's a father of many donkey dragon hybrids, and Donkey's so excited. Donkey is so excited to be a dad. You remember how when Shrek learned he was gonna be a dad and he was like, whoa, no, 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 thank you. Donkey learned that he is somehow already a father to five mutant babies. And he's like, oh my God, what are their names? Do they like me? <laughs> he's so pumped. Shrek goes into Fiona's tent while she's not there and finds Puss in Boots. He's Fiona's pet house cat and he's very round. And he no longer has his boots because he's retired. Feed me if you dare. Shrek tries to woo Fiona with a gift basket when she comes back to find him trespassing in her private space. She's not into it. Um, the woman is running a revolution-ending ambush in a few hours, and Shrek keeps trying to kiss her against her will. It's not a good look. The audience learns that the bounty hunter that Rumpel is hiring is the Pied Piper who speaks only by playing the flute and demonstrates his abilities on skeptical witches, making them break dance. That's a whole scene. At the ogre camp, Donkey has a party trick where he sucks up eyeballs from the eyeball stew and pushes them into his nostrils and then like talks. So it's like the eyes and the mouth and it wins over the other ogres and they don't want to eat him anymore. And that's 
a whole scene. Fiona's off training alone, getting ready for the ambush, and Shrek sneaks up on her and interrupts and does a bad job trying to convince her that he's like also here to warm up and train. Uh, Fiona gets his name wrong while addressing him and says he's gonna get himself killed, girl boss. I think I can take care of myself. <laughs> Well, let's see about that. Then they spar. He like meets her on her level, does something she's interested in, and it's the first moment she can even sort of tolerate him since he's gotten here. There's some actual sparks in this scene. It's nice. And then Fiona's afraid of her own feelings and she leaves. Now go get ready for the mission. I will, but Fiona- That's an order. Puss in Boots is encouraging Shrek's efforts because if there's one thing we know about Puss in Boots that stays constant this entire franchise is that Puss is a romantic. The ogres execute their ambush, but most of them end up kidnapped by the Pied Piper because, or at least not helped by, Shrek distracting Fiona from where she scouted ahead he ran off, distracted her, and they all almost entirely lose their chance to even try. And the worst part is that he's really sweet, and it's a really sweet scene. It's a dumb thing that he did, but he's doing his best, and he's really sweet to his wife, and I, I liked it. He says to her, And I know that you sleep by candlelight because every time you close your eyes, you're afraid you're going to wake up back in that tower. Excuse me? But anyway, the carriage that the ogres were ambushing was fake. Anyway, it was just an excuse to get the Pied Piper close to them, and all the ogres are made to dance, being led towards the castle. And Cookie's kind of into it. He's having a good time. Shrek, Fiona, Donkey, and Puss escape uh, because Donkey and Puss pick up Shrek and Fiona and take them away from the Piper, and the Piper's flute was only set to ogres. So only ogres were affected. Donkeys and cats... They're fine. After escaping, Shrek convinces a very angry Fiona to kiss him to fix everything, and nothing happens. Because she doesn't love him right now. But I'm your true love. Then where were you when I needed you? And it makes her more angry. She reveals that it was her that got her out of the tower, I guess. She was on the brink, or somehow Shrek not being born means Charming did a bad job. I don't know. Uh, and then Fiona storms off to go save her friends. Rumpelstiltskin is furious that the Pied Piper did not get Shrek, and he offers a wish to anyone in the kingdom who can bring him Shrek, which everybody wants because their lives here under Rumpel's rule are bad. Gingy shows up to try and get Shrek and turn him in. He does a bad job. He's a single gingerbread cookie. Uh, but he does reveal to Shrek in that moment that Rumpelstiltskin is offering that wish and then Puss in Boots eats him. That was Gingy's greatest fear. You monster. <laughs> Shrek turns himself in to Rumpelstiltskin. And he can't use his wish to get out of his contract because that can only be nullified by True Love's Kiss. But he does use his wish to free the other ogres so that they have a chance. And Rumpelstiltskin frees all the other ogres except for Fiona because she isn't completely an ogre, which is also where we find out that Fiona got captured, which, does, yeah, that does make sense. She tried to storm in there all by herself. And there's a lot of witches in there. <laughs> Fiona is very grateful for Shrek's sacrifice in this moment. And then she and Shrek are made to fight a dragon, who's here, for the amusement of all of the witches. During this fight, we find out that Puss and Donkey and all the other ogres had snuck back into the castle inside of a new big decorative hanging ball that thing Shrek used to escape earlier. They're inside of it. And during the fight, they break out of the ball. Puss has his boots back. Donkey tries to woo Dragon and it doesn't work. She tries to eat him. Shrek and Fiona really find their stride in battle. They're really connecting. They're working together. They're like our guys we know. Dragon gets defeated. Rumpelstiltskin gets defeated. He's just being held onto real tight by the other ogres. <laughs> but gasp, the sun rises and Shrek starts to dissolve into golden dust. He tells Fiona about the triplets, about their kids. And he says their names. He says Fergus, Farkle, and she fills in Felicia because she's always wanted a daughter named Felicia. And he says that the best part of this whole day was... I got the chance to fall in love with you all over again. 
Fiona has fallen in love with the ogre, and she kisses him right as he dissolves. And then realizes, even though the sun has risen, she has stayed an ogre, meaning she has maintained love's true form. Her curse has been broken, and that was true love's kiss, and Stiltskin has lost. And the AU evaporates. Shrek appears back in his original reality right at the moment he roared at the birthday party and people are cheering for him. <laughs> like the number one most disorienting place to be put. Puss in Boots reveals the backup cake and instead of smashing it with his big ogre fist, Shrek sees his Fiona and goes to give her a big hug and then goes to all his babies happy birthday and give Felicia her little plush ogre back. And he embraces his, quite frankly, perfect life. The end. As the credits roll, uh, Accidentally in Love by Smash Mouth plays. There's a party at the swamp with other ogres from Shrek's AU day present. Cookie's there and Brogan is there and the girl one whose name I never learned but was apparently voiced by Jane Lynch is there. Uh, which has some really sweet implications that Shrek like explained everything to Fiona and they went and found and befriended all these ogres all over again. I really did like that. Also, Rumpelstiltskin is there in a cage, and Fiona explodes Fifi with her singing. And I think this is the first Shrek antagonist, at least first primary Shrek antagonist, that doesn't die. They just keep him around in a cage. And that's the movie. So, uh, kind of this movie never happened. So why does it matter for our purposes of understanding all of our canon in time for Shrek 5? because it happened for Shrek, okay? He remembers it, and presumably he told it all to Fiona, and it gave us our new ogre friends. So like, you know, Cookie and Brogan and the, the Jane Lynch one are around. And Rumpelstiltskin is alive and in a cage. And uh, I mean, I, I hope he gets out of there. I hope they let him out. The credit scene also shows classic moments from Shrek 2001 and Shrek 2 2004 and Shrek the Third 2007, which cements to me that this was the finale for this series of movies. I mean, it's not obviously because our Lord and Savior Shrek 5 is going to be coming and it was fine. Honestly, I think I would have liked this movie a lot better if it had been three years since I'd watched Shrek the Third, right? I think I liked it as a child, but because I am slam dunking all of Shrek directly into my brain, I watched this movie and went, where's Arthur Pendragon? <laughs> Which is not the point. Movie's fine, movie's fun. It has some cute moments in it. Overall, it happened, except it didn't even happen. And the soundtrack, was not even close to the other three. It's like they didn't even try. I didn't mention any of the songs because there weren't any good soundtrack songs. That's like half the fun of Shrek. So now we're like pretty much done with the video, right? We did all four existing Shrek movies. So we're, uh, we're at the end, right? Right? It's still day five and the skin on my cheekbones is so mad about the green eyeshadow that I put on it that I'm very afraid to take it off of my eyes. Anyway, Scared Trekless, 2010. It was a TV special released on NBC. It's basically like the Halloween version of Shrek the Halls. Also, do you like my canon compliant Shrek witch costume? I did remember the mandatory pointed hat. To open up this special, the triplets, Fergus Farkle and Felicia scare away some trick-or-treaters from the swamp. They're talking in their big sentences. This is, I have to assume, after their first birthday party in Shrek Forever After 2010. And Shrek and Fiona are so proud of their scary, scary, scary babies. The whole Swamp Squad is here trying to jump out and scare Shrek when they come back to the house, but they fail. And Fiona tells Donkey that ogres don't get scared. Ogres do the scaring. So Donkey's idea is to get everyone together and tell some scary stories. See who gets the most scared. Puss announces that whoever lasts the whole time is going to be King of Halloween. And I really thought they were gonna mention that title more often during the special, but this is the only time they say it. 
I want to be king of Halloween. The king of Halloween. I accept. We don't accept. Shrek says he gets to pick the location and the whole squad comes with, except for Fiona, who takes the triplets to go do some more scaring, and also the three blind mice, who get turned around because no one was guiding them. So they don't go with the group. <laughs> Shrek takes them to Duloc, to Farquaad's abandoned castle, to tell their scary stories. Pinocchio heard rumors that the castle is haunted by Farquaad's ghost. Because apparently, no one ever filled him in on Shrek and Fiona's honeymoon drama. Do you guys remember Shrek 4D? You remember Shrek 4D? Yeah, Farquaad's ghost was in that. And he died, dragon killed him. And they never told Pinocchio, I guess, because he is terrified that Farquaad's ghost is going to show up. Shrek goes to the little, like, theme park singing machine, and we get a creepy version of Welcome to Do Luck, and Donkey's scared of it. <laughs> we will jump up your head and then laugh when you're dead. They settle in to tell their stories. There are three stories in this short. The first is The Bride of Gingy, told by... Gingy. Gingy tells the group about the time that he and the Muffin Man made Gingy a new girlfriend because the last one dumped him because Gingy was too self-centered. I have to assume this is a different girlfriend than the one that was eaten by Santa Claus. So Gingy just has a, has a string of girlfriends. He's great with the ladies. Gingy picks the cutout they're going to use. Gingy puts in far more sugar than recommended, a dangerous amount so that she'll love him forever. And then they name her sugar. And he is instantly in love with her. And she has the same voice as Mabel from Gravity Falls, which I was not personally ready for. Is it you, the one I was made for? Sugar is overly obsessed with Gingy, and Gingy does not like it, and he runs off. And she can't figure out what she did wrong. He won't tell her. They have a confrontation over a big, swirling batch of batter, and Sugar <gasps> falls in. And Gingy's fine and unaffected and goes home. <laughs> that batter that she fell into clones her as it is baked into cookies, and those clones break into Gingy's house and eat him. The three little pigs run away, scared in real life as Gingy's telling the story, and then the wolf follows them out because they, they were his ride home, and he needs them. <laughs> I gotta go. Shrek does point out that the story can't be true because Gingy is clearly not eaten alive right now. So Gingy abandons ship and leaves. So this story establishes the canon that Gingy is a liar. The second story is called Boots Motel and is told by Donkey and Puss together. They tell the story of how they went to find shelter from a thunderstorm at the Boots Motel, get it, like the Bates Motel, with a very nice innkeeper with a familiar face. When Donkey tells the story, Puss gets killed, immediately stabbed to death by the innkeeper while he's in the shower, and then Puss takes over the story, and in his version of the story, Donkey breaks in to save him, and it turns out the innkeeper was charming, looking for revenge. And then Puss and Donkey just keep fighting while telling the story and it just devolves into absolutely nothing as they both keep adding details and rewriting to make the other seem foolish or die. At one point, Puss makes Story Donkey get chased by a donkey eating waffle. And then Donkey gets real life Pinocchio as they're telling the stories to spray Puss with water and Puss leaves. End of that one. I'm pretty sure that's cheating. <laughs> It worked, didn't it? The final story is The shrek -sercist. Like the Exorcist. <laughs> this one is told by Shrek telling the time that he babysat a possessed Pinocchio in a home so spooky no one else would dare come babysit. Pinocchio's dad insists that he doesn't know what's gotten into his boy. And up in his room, Pinocchio's being flung about by invisible forces and speaking nonsense. He claims that he's hearing voices. He beats Shrek up, vomits all over him, and flees the building. So, like, not a great day overall. Once out of the building, a cricket pops out of Pinocchio's head, claiming to be his conscious. It's the voices Pinocchio was hearing. And Pinocchio immediately squishes and kills him. Dead. I'll always be here. Back in real world, not in the story, Pinocchio refutes that, saying that it didn't happen, and then Shrek shows him a regular cricket, and Pinocchio's so scared he runs away. 
leaving Shrek and Donkey alone in Castle Duloc. They discuss the rumors of Farquaad's ghost because apparently they forgot that they literally fought that ghost and killed that ghost easily years ago. But it seems like the ghost of Farquaad is here to get revenge on Donkey for being involved in his horrible death. Furniture and suits of armor are coming right for Donkey. And he runs off. But don't worry, it was Fiona and the babies doing a little ghost ruse so that Shrek would win. And they all celebrate being the victors of Halloween. And to celebrate, they go egg the seven dwarves as they come home from work. Which, Fiona, I know Snow White spent the entirety of Shrek the Third 2007 being like kind of a bitch. But she's still your friend. She's very important in your life, I have to assume. And those are her guys. They don't even like egg their house. They're fully throwing eggs at the dwarves. And that's how it ends. Next. Ooh, let's do that again. Go! Day five going strong. Welcome to Donkey's Caroling Christmas Tacular. 2010. This five minute long Christmas themed short was an extra on home releases on Shrek Forever After. So like if you got the DVD, you would also get Donkey's Caroling Christmas Tacular, sometimes referred to as Donkey's Christmas Shrek Tacular. Both obnoxiously long titles. You can pick and choose your favorite. This short takes place at the Candy Apple, which is like the poison apple, that villain tavern, except it's sweet and friendly. And Christmas. <laughs> Donkey, noted lover of all things Christmas, is dictating to everyone else how to arrange the holiday decorations, and he decides that everyone should sing Christmas carols. Donkey sings an altered version of the most wonderful time of the year, and he has Rumpelstiltskin in a cage. We just never let him out of the cage? How long has it been? How much of an incarceral state is far, far away? There's no reform. We can do for him nothing. It's just he lives in a cage in the care of Donkey. Anyway, there's also a few of the other ogres from Fiona's army in Shrek Forever After 2010, Brogan and Cookie and the girl one. And also four of the Dronkies are here. The dragon is not. So I guess she's got the fifth one at home. Maybe he was sick and couldn't come to the Christmas party. Gingy is here, and he's convinced that the plate of gingerbread cookies that are out are sentient. And we again revisit his traumas as he defends them from being eaten, and at the end, in fact, whisks them all away to safety. I wish the gingerbread man therapy. I wish that for him. Nothing to eat here! You guys, this is not a place to take a nap! Wake up! Wake up! I swear to God, if anybody lets it slip to him that in the Shrek Forever After AU, he got eaten, I, I will throttle them with my bare hands. That, can, that should be a secret that everyone takes to their grave. Shrek, Fiona, Fergus, Farkle, Felicia, Brogan, Cookie, and the girl ogre sing an ogre version of Jingle Bells. A cooking, lick the spoon, try our cricket slurp. Puss in Boots gets on stage to sing Fleas Navidad, cause he has fleas. I got Fleas Navidad, my coat is itching and my eyes go sad. Point of order, Puss in Boots would not have fleas. That man takes great care of himself. He would not allow fleas to occur. I won't stand for that slander. And then everybody present, except the man in the cage, sings Fairy Tale Rock. Like, like, ji like Jingle Bell Rock. That's the fairy tale, that's the fairy tale, that's the fairy tale rock! Ah. And, that, and that's the whole short. Next? Hey, they're just cookies, it's not like they're real! What do you know about being real? Nothing. Shrek's Yule Log, 2010. We close day five with Literally a Yule log, that's all it is. <laughs> this 30 minute long Yule log video set in the swamp was bundled with donkeys caroling Christmas tacular. And I like this one way better. A Yule log, a digital Yule log is just a long video of a log in a fireplace crackling away, often with some Christmas music in the background that you're supposed to like put on during holiday events or like as you're doing holiday activities to just kind of keep you 
in the festive mood of it all. Shrek's Yulog opens with a beautiful opening shot of the swamp. Much more traditional Christmas decorations than we saw in Shrek the Halls. So either Shrek is learning what is considered more normal or Donkey got his hands all over it this year. My money's on the latter, personally. Shrek lights the fire in his home. Donkey gets a little bit lit on fire, runs off, and we're in Yule Log Land, baby. The fire burns with the sounds of gentle Christmas music in the background. And every couple of minutes, a character comes in front of the camera and does a five-second thing to remind us that this Yule Log is (laughs) Shrek-themed. The big bad wolf comes by to threaten to throw Pinocchio in the fire to add more wood to it as a goof, as you do. Yeah, I get it. I made a wood. Funny. I thought so. Donkey roasts some marshmallows. Puss comes by to let us know he's having a cookie. is like a cheat meal. Cookie's making eyeballs too, so it's good to know that he was invited. We can assume Brogan and Jane Lynch are here as well. Fergus runs in, giving his pacifier to Donkey. There's a moment where Shrek's bare feet get pushed into view. As he's like, I'm just stretching out and relaxing, and his his is just his bare ogre feet. I did not ask for that. Fiona sets out milk and cookies for Santa Claus. Gingy yells, not this year, and liberates the cookies. This happens two more times also. And I don't, d- does Fiona know about Gingy's girlfriend that got eaten by Santa Claus? Because I'm pretty sure she was there when he told that story in Shrek the Halls. And I feel like if I had a friend with cannibalism-related trauma... I would not put out things that looked just like my friend and say they were for eating. I just don't think I would do that personally. Like, I know he's a cookie, but Puss comes by to curl up in front of the fire only to get immediately bothered by Felicia and pushed off. Rumpelstiltskin shows up to try and put out the fire. In fact, he he tries a couple different shenanigans during this Yule Log, which means... Our boy's out of the cage. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. Shrek is doing everything he can to keep Rumpelstiltskin out of his home, which I think is fair. I don't know why Rumpelstiltskin is trying so hard to be in the home. He was presumably uh, locked up against his will there for some time. But, you know, whatever he wants, however he's coping... The Pied Piper shows up a couple of times. Can't imagine he was invited. It's possible he's cool in this universe. In Shrek Forever After 2010, he was hired by Rumpelstiltskin. It wasn't his idea to go after the other. So, like, maybe he's fine. I just feel like Shrek wouldn't want him around. The Pied Piper does play a flute rendition of Take It Off by Kesha, my personal favorite Christmas song. (laughs) And the second time he shows up, he plays dreidel, dreidel, dreidel. The third time he does play a Christmas song. So I think maybe he wasn't invited, showed up anyway. Maybe some woodland creatures accidentally, you know, let it slip that it was happening. And he slowly had to figure out what kind of party was being thrown. And it took him a while, but God damn if he didn't get it by the end. <laughs> Importantly, Donkey does refer to one of his children as bananas and gets him to relight the dying fire. This is the only time I have ever heard Donkey refer to one of his children by name, and it is one of the names listed in the fan wiki. So where did all the other names come from? (laughs) There's no source listed, so I have to assume someone just made them up. Probably after we knew one of them was called Bananas. Whatever, it's not a big deal. I'm not mad. Don't tell the newspaper I was mad. Uh-oh. Bananas! Why don't you come help your daddy out? Go on, fire it up, son! Woo! Honestly, Shrek's Yule Log is great ambiance, um, occasionally broken by 15 seconds of a guy storming in to tell you something. It's really nice. I was so filled with Shrek today and the last few days that I really liked having a Shrek thing with almost no Shrek things in it. Like, it really refreshed me. (laughs) 
I know that is not a glowing review. It's a nice Yule log. My brain is just exploding, is the thing. And I'm so glad <laughs> we're at the end of day five, baby. Next. Uh, am I the only one noticing that people are watching us? Welcome to day six, where this video about Shrek gets a whole lot less about Shrek. Puss in Boots, 2011. I never actually watched this movie before I began this process, which is weird because I love Puss in Boots, but I was 12 when the movie came out. And when you're 12, it's not cool to like stuff, especially stuff made for your age bracket. So it's probably why I didn't watch it. And I'll spoil it for you right now. Um, I loved Puss in Boots 2011. This is a prequel to the Shrek movies, so it's all set before Puss becomes a hired assassin who's known for being able to kill ogres, even though he's not good at killing ogres. I feel like we glossed over that too quickly in Shrek 2 2004. There's only one guy I can point you to for this ogre killing King Harold, and then he fails. Immediately. Anyway, that means we will not see Shrek, Fiona, Donkey Dragon, any of the gang in this movie. This is Puss in Boots, and whoever else Puss in Boots chooses to introduce us to. Let's begin. Puss in Boots in his voiceover intro lets us know that he's had many names like Chupacabra and Furry Lover. Thanks for letting us know. Man, I, I really haven't been involved with the community much myself, but I've heard great things. The Furry Lover. We see Puss in Boots in a morning after situation, getting dressed, getting the lady's name wrong. He steals a ring off of her human and he goes to leave, but he gets caught. He gets in a sword fight, but he gets away scot-free. He's a very talented boy. We learn that Puss is on the run from the law, hoping to eventually clear his name, but he doesn't yet tell us why. He fireworks, a big party of human beings. Puss goes into a bar and gets immediately laughed at by Rude humans just for walking in. He's getting straight up bullied for a minute, like for being a cat. Did you lose your ball of yarn? <laughs> <laughs> so funny. But then he sort of turns on the puss in boots and intimidates them. His wanted posters on the wall, that's gotta help. Uh, and he's looking for a job. The people at the bar offer things that he could steal from churches or orphanages, but he refuses to steal from either of those types of places, isn't he? Just that great of a guy. The people in this bar have also heard of Jack and Jill, an outlaw couple that have the magic beans that Puss in Boots has been searching for. One of the men in this bar has the beans tattooed on his arm, the bean stalk on his chest, the golden goose that the bean stalk leads to tattooed on his back, this man is fucking dedicated. He deserves to be the one to steal the beans. We should be taking him on this mission. I don't understand why we left him at the bar. That man is hilarious. I need him here. No! Magic beans could lead Puss to a giant's lair where he could then get those very valuable golden goose eggs. So he says that he will go steal the beans to repay a debt. Turns out Jack and Jill are huge and scary and strong. Uh, Jack locks his hand inside of a magic glowing green box and swallows the key. We find out later he's the beans are in there. He's locking the beans in his hand and his hand in a box, and then he swallows the key. And I don't know, I don't know how he gets the key back. We don't hear about the key anymore. Jack and Jill also have this running bit where Jack is trying to convince Jill to have a baby, and she's not into it. Ever since you fell down that hill and broke your crown, you've been talking crazy. Puss in Boots' thievery attempt is interrupted by Kitty Soft Paws, a cat in a black hooded cloak who's also sneaking in to steal the beans. They escape, they get chased. Puss follows Kitty, I assume, to try and figure out, you know, why she was also there. Um, during this chase, Puss also flirts with a human woman like he stops to do this because his primary character trait has been and always will be that he is horned up as hell at all times. All times. This man is a Tom Cat. My parents actually have a farm with an orange Tom Cat on it and he's he's the same way, so I'm sure he could relate. Um, but that guy is a, is a cannibal. And I really hope we don't see any of that behavior from Puss in Boots. Puss eventually chases Kitty into a cat bar, a bar for cats, and they have a stomp-esque musical number that kicks up and then a dance battle. And I have to say, the way that this animation style does 
cats is so cute. Like all the background cats look so soft and their eyes are so big. It does become a real battle with swords at one point. And then to end it, Puss grabs a guitar and slams Kitty in the head. And then she takes off her hood and reveals that oh, she's a girl. I really thought we were past that <laughs> as a twist, gang, even in 2011. You're, you're a woman? Oh. Puss continues to follow Kitty and ends up running into Humpty Alexander Dumpty. <laughs> Who looks insane. I cannot believe this character design. He's just a big face on an egg. And it's perfect. It turns out Kitty was hired to steal the beans by Humpty, Alexander Dumpty, who was brothers with Puss, but they ended on bad terms like seven years ago, and Puss is pissed to see this guy again. It is good to see you, Puss. There's no boots? No. Humpty has a plan to steal the beans from Jack and Jill and complete this heist. Uh, but Puss turns down the offer to join because he is pissed at this guy. Puss storms out. Kitty robs him on his way out and then uses his money as an excuse to like meet back up with him and try to seduce him into joining them. Hey, baby, you don't need to try that hard. He's very easy, but he still doesn't want to help because he's mad and because, and he shares their very long and complicated backstory. You don't start it no, 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 you really don't have to tell me all that story, please. You may want to see it. Puss and Humpty were orphans together at an orphanage in San Ricardo. They were besties, they were brothers. Puss has an adoptive mother figure uh, at the orphanage, the human woman who runs it, named Imelda. Which means Puss was lying to Shrek in Shrek 2004 when he said that his mother was sick and his father eats out of the garbage. Interesting. Interesting. Puss... It, it could be that Imelda was sick, but Puss does not know his dad, so. While they were growing up at the orphanage, Humpty kept stealing people's beans and trying to grow them to see if they were magic beans. All he wanted was magic beans. He said it felt like it was his destiny to find the golden goose and to find the golden goose to get the golden eggs. You need the beans, you can grow the beanstalk. You know Jack and the beanstalk, you live on earth. Humpty Dumpty in this is a little inventor boy, very much an artificer type. Uh, he's also the one who names Puss because Puss does not speak when he comes into the orphanage. And and uh, baby Puss in Boots is so fucking cute. And baby Humpty looks so silly. They did a lot of fraud and schemes when they were growing up. They kept trying beans. They kept getting caught stealing and getting brought back to Imelda. But when Puss was a teenager, he saved the head guard, the commandante's mother, from a rampaging bull and was celebrated by the whole village. And Imelda gifted him boots and a hat as a sign of his honor. Basically, Puss in Boots was on the hero track. And then Humpty Dumpty kept going deeper and deeper into villain town which made him really mad when Puss decided not to steal at all anymore. We are better than these. But we're partners. We are brothers. And then Humpty Dumpty tricked Puss in Boots into doing a bank robbery in San Ricardo as they fled Imelda watching them flee. All the money goes over the side of this bridge leading out of town. Humpty Dumpty gets stuck on his back like a bug and Puss jumps off the bridge and leaves him there and leaves San Ricardo. So Puss and Boots in the current timeline just told that whole story. Kitty soft paws, I uh, fell asleep. But Humpty Dumpty arrived while he was telling it and convinced Puss that, that he's also sorry, that he wants to be better. Please give me a second chance. And Puss agrees and says that he's doing it for Imelda, not for Humpty. I also like this scene because it made it really seem like Humpty Dumpty and Kitty were close. Like she knew to go up to him and to help him off a ledge because he couldn't get down on his own. The way that they were interacting, I don't know, they just made them seem like buddies without having to do that much, which was really nice. So Puss and Kitty and Humpty go and steal the magic beans from Jack and Jill, and they barely escape back to Humpty Dumpty's little cart, but they do it. Honestly, the action scenes in this movie are super fun and fast, and the music's really energetic without being uh, a Shrek soundtrack with those like on the nose lyrical pieces, which I also love. The Shrek soundtracks are so good, but Puss in Boots does not do the same thing. It just has really nice 
orchestral backing. After Kitty and Puss get back in Humpty's carriage, they go off the edge of a cliff, but Inventor Boy Humpty has actually made it into a flying machine, so it's okay. But he did not explain that to the cats first. He just let Puss and Kitty think that they were going to die, which is a little rude, but I do also see how Humpty might have thought that was very funny, because it would have been pretty funny. They have to travel to a very specific point in the desert to actually plant the beans, where Humpty's research says that the beanstalk will actually take them to the giant's castle. And on the way there, Puss and Kitty start actually bonding. Uh, he says that he'll respect her privacy and not push about why she doesn't have claws, because the big action scene revealed to us, she's declawed. Um, and him expressing that sentiment is the thing that convinces her that he is safe to tell. Baby, if that isn't so relatable. <laughs> It's a super simple backstory. Kitty Softpaws was astray, got taken in by a human couple. They declawed her, and she doesn't know why. But now she's on her own and doesn't have her knife feet. Devastating. They get to the correct place in the desert. They plant the beans, and the beanstalk grows. And the beanstalk forming is like a big blue magical tornado. It is so pretty. And then once the trio is up in the clouds, it's so gorgeous. This movie is so good to look at. All of their voices get high-pitched when they're up in the clouds because of the thin air. It's a short bit. Thankfully, I was terrified that was going to be the next 20 minutes of my life with little chipmunk helium voices. It's not. It's not. Hey, Cloudy. My nose. Humpty's really excited to be there. The cats start chasing each other around. Everyone is just so stoked to be in the sky. And honestly, I would have been much worse in that scenario. I would have forgotten there was a mission at all. Like, I, I would have fallen back through somehow. Kitty and Puss were just rolling around and flirting. Like, that's not so bad. Humpty Dumpty does pull Puss away from Kitty to talk to him. And as he does, he turns back over his shoulder to give Kitty a dirty look. And I will admit, I, I initially was like, is he, is, he je is he jealous? Is he jealous of her? He's not. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I read it, though. Also, Humpty Dumpty does put on a golden egg suit to help him blend in, because golden eggs live up here. <laughs> All right. They get to the castle, and Humpty Dumpty lets them know that the giant is long dead, but they still have to be careful to avoid the Great Terror, the monster that guards the golden goose. There's a lot of fun size gags in this bit, because, you know, they're in a giant's castle. Like, uh, using the force from a popping a giant size bottle of champagne to cross a ravine. It's very cool. They find a whole field of golden eggs and Humpty in his little gold egg suit says he feels like he belongs here. But they do realize that the eggs are too big to safely carry back down with them. So instead of taking the eggs, they decide to take the golden goose, who looks like a, a baby duck, but is approximately their size. Um, and as soon as they grab her, the great terror is after them. And there's another action scene, more running, more action. There's a point where Puss drops the golden goose to go after Kitty because she slipped and fell off of a vine because she didn't have the claws to hold on to it. Then he dropped the goose to go get her. Humpty Dumpty did immediately go for the goose. He was pissed. <laughs> the puss let the treasure go like that. They escape. They cut down the beanstalk and Jack and Jill, miles away, watch as it comes crashing down. There's another little bit of dancing. Puss goes to dance with Kitty and Humpty steps in so he can't again. It made me read jealousy. He even pulls Kitty to the side and demands that she doesn't fall for Puss's animal magnetism. Not fall for his animal magnetism. Okay, dude. But Puss and Kitty do get to dance. And I hate, I truly felt the chemistry between those two cats dancing. And I hate that I felt it so clearly. But I was like, oh, yeah, no, there's sparks between those two cats. <laughs> Look me in the eyes and tell me all you can about these to go. Kitty tells Puss that he should leave now. He says, you can't push me away. Puss is so happy to have his brother back. And then Jack and Jill find them. And Puss gets knocked out. And he wakes up alone in the desert. Puss tracks Jack and Jill back to San Ricardo, assuming they have kidnapped Kitty and Humpty. Um, and he's got a wanted poster hanging out outside of San Ricardo. That's his home. Puss finds Jack and Jill's wagon, and he learns that it has all been a ruse. Jack and Jill are working for Humpty Dumpty. 
And so are the guys from the bar at the beginning that told Puss about the beans, including the one with all the tattoos on his body. Did Humpty Dumpty pay for him to get those? How much did he have to pay that man? Basically, Humpty wants revenge against Puss for turning against him in the bank robbery issue where he left Humpty to get caught on that bridge. Humpty Dumpty says, you didn't know it, Puss, but I was always there. And then there's a montage of Humpty Dumpty obnoxiously and ominously placed into scenes that he was not in. And it made me cackle out loud. It is so silly and so perfect. But then Puss, wanted in San Ricardo, is surrounded by militia and his adopted mother Imelda pleads for him to turn himself in instead of fighting. And he does. This is also where Puss, betrayed, realizes that Kitty was working for Humpty too. Uh, but but he already knew that one. We learned that in the first 20 minutes of the movie. He just didn't know Humpty was mean yet. Why is it surprising the kid he's working for him, man? Come on. Humpty is considered a hero for bringing the golden eggs to the townsfolk, and Puss is brought to prison and checked in by the commandante, who scolds him for having catnip that Puss claims is... This movie is genuinely funny. I laughed out loud alone in my living room many, many times. Also, they take all of Puss's clothes in prison. So he just looks naked in there. I didn't like that. While in prison, Puss meets Andy Jack Beanstalk, um, who is in prison because he's Jack from Jack and the Beanstalk who traded that cow for the beans, um, but it was a different family's family cow that he traded for the beans. And this is like an old man. So I guess he got, I guess he got life for that. Jack reveals that Humpty Dumpty stole the beans from him years ago when they were both in prison, you know, after, the, after that bank robbery <laughs> incident. And he also tells Puss that the great terror up in the clouds is the golden goose's mother, who will stop at nothing to save her baby. That's right, the final big bad is a giant goose. Don't scream at me. Ow, 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 I need to scroll, man, my notes. Uh, Puss tries to warn the guards that a giant goose is coming to destroy the town, but they do not listen to him. Okay, bye. Ow, ow, he's biting me. He is in such a mood today. I don't know what's up. Day six not good for you, man? To continue trying to convince the guards, Puss in Boots uses his big eye, cute face as legitimately a Jedi mind trick to make a guard open the door. And the guard does, but then he snaps out of it. But don't worry, Kitty Softpaws is here and takes out the guard. I hope you can forgive me. Apology accepted. Kitty Softpaws breaks Puss out of jail because she's come to care about him. Puss realizes that it was Humpty Dumpty's plan to lure the Great Terror to San Ricardo this whole time. Humpty wants the town destroyed, uh, and he also wants a big enough distraction for him to slip away with the baby. <laughs> Humpty Dumpty feels like he never belonged here, and that Puss chose San Ricardo over him and their bond, and that is the town's sin, and it must be destroyed. But Puss apologizes, and he tells Humpty that he's better than all of this and convinces him to try and redeem himself by saving the town from what he has wrought. And he says that if Humpty helps save the town, Puss will finally actually forgive him. Which is what Humpty Dumpty wants. Prove to me that you're still a good egg, can you? The Great Terror arrives and hell yeah, that's a 60 foot tall goose that's very angry that everyone in this village is carrying a golden egg. Puss and Humpty use the gosling to lure the Great Terror away. Uh, Puss ends up riding the Great Terror like a horse. Jack and Jill show up to try and take the gosling for themselves because they don't want just the golden eggs, baby. They want the golden egg machine. And then Kitty pushes them off the road. That's introduced and solved in 20 seconds. It's hilarious. But then as they are leaving town, Humpty and the gosling are knocked off of that same bridge at the edge of San Ricardo and end up on either end of a rope. The Great Terror is trapped under a large chunk of broken off bridge far below and it can't come get her baby. And it looks like Puss is gonna be able to save everybody, but he slips. And Humpty realizes that Puss has to make a choice. Him or the baby goose. And if the baby goose dies, 
the Great Terror will destroy San Ricardo and everyone who lives there. But at this point, Puss finally has his brother back and he's not going to let Humpty go, not again, not after seven years. And Humpty knows that. Puss says, I'm not going to let you go. And Humpty says, I know you won't. So I won't make a choose. The Great Terror gets loose and reunites with her baby And Puss discovers that under his shell, where Humpty fell and cracked open, underneath, Humpty Dumpty was a golden egg. The Great Terror takes the baby, and she also takes Humpty, the dead golden egg, back to the clouds, the place that Humpty always felt like he belonged. Gang, I actually got emotional during this part. I was was tearing up. It was happening. I love this movie. The people of San Ricardo see Puss as a hero at the end of all this, but the militia still wants him gone. So he is still on the run. Puss gets to hear his mom say that she's proud of him. And then he runs off with Kitty Softpaws to the Lady Gaga song Americano, the only Shrek soundtrack moment of this entire movie. I was not ready for it. It hit perfect. And then in the ending narration, Puss in Boots reminds us that he is a great, great lover. Like, really? It's crazy. And then the movie ends. And during the credits, Puss and Kitty kiss. They are officially together, which is amazing. Uh, She's not mentioned once in any of the Shrek movies. So we can assume that does not go well long term. But I will not let myself be sad about the cats that had genuine romantic chemistry. <laughs> if you have not watched Puss in Boots 2011, um, go watch Puss in Boots 2011. Even though I just spoiled literally all of it for you and you know what happens in it, I didn't tell you all the jokes and you didn't hear all the good soundtrack and you haven't experienced it. This movie rules, and your life will be better for having it in it. Next! Do you like my costume? I'm Princess Fiona, but a skeleton. Thriller Night, 2011. It's a parody of Michael Jackson's Thriller. You might have caught on. This is a six-minute Halloween special with almost none of the original voice actors, but everyone is doing really good impressions. Like, if you weren't Shrek experts, Shrek experts, like how we are becoming, um, you wouldn't recognize it. They're all, they're all doing an excellent job. I'm not here to insult Sean Bishop. So what happens? We see Shrek, our favorite ogre, running out of a movie theater, screaming and upset because he wanted to see something actually scary for Halloween. And he didn't in the movie theater. So Donkey and Puss in Boots try to cheer him up by singing Michael Jackson's Thriller. And Shrek does say, I hate it when you do this, which I love the implication that Donkey is constantly doing full musical numbers and interrupting everybody's day to get them involved. It's very in character. As the song goes on, many dead characters from the franchise arise from the grave and surround our heroes, Puss in Boots playing the part of the the Vincent Price, the narrator. Uh, The dead characters that arise are pretty much every single villain and also including a drenched, dripping wet Mongo. The giant gingerbread man from Shrek 2, 2004, implying that he never got out of that moat that he was left in during the siege of Far, Far Away? This the worst news I've ever heard. He died in there? It is nice to see Farquaad again, though. The zombie Pied Piper starts playing his flute, and Fiona is turned into a zombie, and Puss in Boots is turned into a zombie, and Donkey is turned into a zombie. And zombie Donkey is actually wildly upsetting to look at. To me, I didn't, I, I don't like zombie Donkey. Not at all. Also, there's a Thelonious cameo. Ah, I feel like it's been years. Shrek breaks the Pied Piper's flute, and then all of the zombies approach Shrek to kill and eat him. Now that they're not being controlled to dance, they're zombies, man. What did you think was going to happen? And Shrek wakes up screaming inside the movie theater. It was all a dream. His wife and best friends tell him that he only slept through the previews, and now he has to watch all of The Sound of Music and he wails in agony. And then Puss in Boots appears and laughs evilly. 
because he's the Vincent Price. I wish that I had gone my whole life without seeing Zombie Donkey or thinking about Mongo sadly slowly dissolving alone and aware at the bottom of the moat surrounding the castle and far, far away. Next. Day six is a sad day for we reach our final holiday short. The Pig Who Cried Werewolf, 2011. We saved the least impressive for last. The best thing about this six minutes short is that it was initially exclusively available for viewing on the Nintendo 3DS the way all good media is. <laughs> it did get an actual home release in 2012, but if you watched it on your Nintendo 3DS in 2011, I wanna know about it. Why was it like that? This short is apparently a, a parody or an allusion to Alfred Hitchcock's movie, Rear Window. And first off, how is this the second time in this video I've had to mention Alfred Hitchcock? Second off, I haven't seen Rear Window. Uh, it's a full movie from 1954 and is not a part of the Shrek canon and is not required viewing at this moment. So I can't tell you to what degree it fits Hitchcock's vision. This is the only thing I've seen so far with no main characters present. I do count Puss in Boots as a main character. I absolutely do. You wanna know who's not a main character to me? The Three Little Pigs and the Big Bad Wolf. I don't think that's a controversial statement. This short opens with the three little pigs heading home from the hospital and they have names. Did you enjoy your stay in the hospital, Heimlich? They have names. It's Heimlich, Dieter, and Horst. Fantastic. Heimlich is coming home from the hospital after having broken his leg while falling, while spying on their neighbors, and his brothers scold him for these actions. This is apparently a pattern of behavior with Heimlich. He's just a very paranoid man who likes spying on people and calling the police and causing problems. In this particular instance, he thought he saw something. It was the cow jumping over the moon, and he broke his leg in the process. They get home. They have a new neighbor. It's the big bad wolf. The three little pigs, do not know the big bad wolf. So we have to assume this takes place before the events of Shrek 2001 because they were already familiar by that point. Heimlich sees that their new neighbor has a bunch of knives in a big bag when it comically spills all over the yard. But by the time his brothers look, they're all put away. Dieter and Horst tell Heimlich he has to cut this shit out, that it's gone too far and Heimlich agrees. He's going to behave, but then immediately starts spying on the wolf like fully through a telescope, watching him bury his knives in the backyard. And the wolf sees him doing that. On the full moon, the wolf transforms into a human woman named Chef. Heimlich didn't see the change, that transformation. He just sees Chef in the house and then Chef digging up the knives. Chef is modeled after Julia Child, by the way. <laughs> Heimlich spies on her digging the knives back up. She sees him seeing her. And then Dieter and Horst catch Heimlich spying. And they grab the telescope like, hey, you said you were gonna cut this shit out. They look through the telescope to see what he was looking at. And it's just the big bad wolf pleasantly waving at them. But then when Heimlich looks, it's the lady with the knives. All signs pointing towards this very paranoid man not experiencing the world correctly. The Dieter and Horst go to their neighbor's house to settle this once and for all, and Heimlich with his broken leg just has to sit and watch them do this. And it looks like his brothers get grabbed and taken by Chef. Chef then breaks into the pig's house, tells Heimlich she wants him for dinner, puts an apple in his mouth, and rolls him into her home, where Dieter and Horst are peacefully eating dinner. I know, isn't that such a crazy twist, saying I want you for dinner, but you meant it in the other way the audience doesn't anticipate? Wow, wow. Sorry, I know this is for children, I just don't care about these pigs. I love the wolf, I do love the wolf. He's not even here right now. When Chef comes back into the dining room, she does turn back into the wolf. We don't know what causes the transformation. It just keeps happening at random points. Uh, and the wolf asks if they've seen him do anything weird. They tell him about the weird things and the wolf tells them to leave because they won't want to be around for. And then he turns back into Chef. Chef immediately begins chasing them with a meat cleaver intending to 
cook and eat them, and they run off. Chef pursues, occasionally turning back into the wolf, and then back into chef, and then back into the wolf. This is just awkward. Keep running. And then it ends. And what we're doing here is treating everything as canon, okay? Anything that the Shrek franchise wants to show me matters and is canon and will come up in Shrek 5 when it appears so soon. What I'm not going to do is sit here and tell you that the reason that the wolf cross-dresses is because sometimes he's a human woman. I don't think that, and I don't want you to think that I think that. I do think that between this and Shrek 2001, uh, the Big Bad Wolf and Chef like worked their shit out. And maybe sometimes he still turns into Chef, but only like when he knows she's not gonna go crazy and try to chop up and murder and eat his friends. Or maybe he found a wizard that finally split them into their two distinct people and then he killed her because she's dangerous and caused him a lot of personal grief. That's what I want to say happened anyway. Anyway, that short sure exists, huh? Next. Not a holiday celebration short, but it is a short. This is Puss in Boots, The Three Diablos, 2012. This hat is the closest thing I own to Puss's hat, but I hate how it looks on my head. This short takes place after Puss in Boots 2011, but before Shrek 2, 2004. So Puss hasn't met Shrek yet. None of that's happened yet, but he went through all that drama with Humpty and the Goose. This short opens with Puss in Boots being captured by soldiers, but not because he is in trouble. It is to get brought to the Princess Alessandra Bellagomba, a gem that is very important to the princess. The heart of fire, Ruby, is missing, and she wants to hire him to recover it. This gem was stolen by Le Chouchouter, or the Whisperer. <laughs> and ain't it just Puss's luck? They have Le Chouchouter's three henchmen locked up in the castle that were captured during the robbery. And those henchmen are not giving up Whisper Boy's secret location. The princess says that these henchmen are the most vile mercenaries they have ever encountered, but Puss insists on meeting them to get information out of them, and they are three kittens. And they're cute as hell. These guys? The people in this palace are calling the kittens the Diablos. I love the Diablos so dearly. The Diablos agree to help Puss in Boots as long as at the end of it, they gain their freedom. Uh, they don't talk. These three kittens do not talk. It's, more, it's a nodding and shaking their head situation. Yes or no only. Puss in Boots takes them out to the desert, asking them questions about Le Chuchuter, the work that they do. And honestly, it seems like the Diablos are barely sentient creatures, but they slip their chains and use them to tie up Puss. Then they beat him up and they bury him alive. Now, because Puss in Boots is Puss in Boots, he does escape being buried alive and goes to find them. And he and the Diablos have, have, a, have a cute face off. They can all do the big eye cute face. Puss eventually wins and he ties the Diablos back up with the chains. No fish sticks for you. Puss threatens to send them back to jail and says they're going to make their mothers very disappointed and then somehow immediately realizes that they have no mother, that the Diablos have no family, they are orphans, just like Puss. And Puss and Boots really empathizes with them in their situation. Uh, Whisper Boy is leading them down the wrong path, just like Humpty Dumpty did to him. So Puss bonds with and he trains with the Diablos. He also names them because they did not have names. They were just the three Diablos. And Whisper Boy didn't even call them the Diablos. So I guess he was just like, that one? Puss in Boots names them Perla, Gonzalo, and Sir Timoteo Montenegro III. The Diablos at this point have learned that they can trust Puss, they genuinely like him, and they agree to show Puss in Boots the Whisper Boy's secret hideout. Uh, also, Puss in Boots tells the Diablos the story of Puss in Boots 2011 as a bedtime story. That's adorable. We find Whisper Boy. He's a human man who only whispers using his pointy hat as a, as a megaphone to be heard. I am the Whisperer. And he's also wearing the Heart of Fire ruby on his belt. So, a little obvious, man. Whisper Boy is angry that he has been betrayed and he threatens the Diablos, like is genuinely very rude to them. Oh, hi. So Puss in Boots fights Whisper Boy. The Diablos escape, but then 
They return and they fight the Whisperer using tricks that Puss taught them during their training. And the Whisperer falls to his death from a great height. Puss in Boots reclaims the Heart of Fire Ruby. They get the gem back to the princess. Puss in Boots gets a lot of gold. And the Diablos become the personal guards to the princess. And they all have cute little outfits now. They all bow. And Sir Timoteo Montenegro III fails to bow correctly, falls on his ass, and then eats a gold piece. So we know exactly the role that he will play in this trio in the future. Puss in Boots tells the Diablos that he'll never forget them, and he rides off. Never forget the name. This short is so cute. I'm so glad it was only 13 minutes long. I think as a longer concept, it would have been a bit much. And also, I think if the Diablos talked, it could have been a bit much. In this, they just mew. And they're perfect. And I love them. And I hope they come back in Shrek 5, God damn it. I'll spend the whole movie waiting for a Gonzalo ex machina. I swear to God, I will. Next. I'm going to be so honest with you right now. It is 1.52 in the morning. Day six. I guess day seven. Now. You're not happy to be reminded that this exists. I'm not happy to be bringing it up. This tapestry is falling down. This wig Cheapest one I've ever purchased. This makeup looks exactly as good as this moment deserves. And we're gonna reminisce about Shrek is love, Shrek is life. I know it doesn't belong here. I know, I know. This is not an installation into the Shrek franchise. This is an upsetting, intentionally offensive meme. But I cannot talk about Shrek without talking about how intense the memeing is and was. Shrek is not just a franchise. Shrek is a movement. Shrek is an icon. Shrek is my best friend. Shrek is the only thing I can think about. He lives behind my eyes and in my dreams. Shrek is truly love and life. Shrek is Love, Shrek is Life had its humble beginnings as a green text post on 4chan, one of the internet's worst websites. And it was then made into the upsetting meme video that you may be more familiar with. Shrek is Love, Shrek is Life became its own phenomenon. You still can't talk about Shrek on the internet without someone telling you that he is both love and life. Not if you're reaching a significant audience anyway. If you're in your own well-curated niche of the people who are kind and nice to you, you won't hear it. But with a lot of people, if I didn't bring this up, some, somebody else was gonna. I was 13 when this occurred. I was the prime age for this kind of content, okay? I'm sorry. I had to mention it. If I have to remember, if I have to, if I have to become this, so do you. I'm also literally not gonna summarize it for you, okay? I'm, I'm not going to. So why bring it up then? I had to. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Overall, I wanted to take this moment to emphasize for you the cultural staying power of Shrek, fully fueled by its own fan base, ironic or unironic. This happened in 2013. Shrek Forever After, the last Shrek movie, happened in 2010. And, and I wasn't clear enough about this earlier, Thriller Night 2011, that six minute long Michael Jackson parody that we saw earlier, is the last time that a DreamWorks animated Shrek is appearing in this video at all. The last time DreamWorks animated Shrek for us was in 2011. There he goes. And I know 2013 is not that long after, okay? It's two years later, I understand. We're gonna touch on some more stuff later. This is an important touchstone for us, okay? Shrek is a self-fueling phenomenon. People love this big green man and it's died down some, but you'll still see it everywhere. The fact that the Shrek online fan community space reputation hit this kind of both peak and low in 2013, but still exists in this self-perpetuating format that 
intensified even, we'll get to it later, is fascinating and is, I think, a huge reason why Shrek 5 was announced to be in pre-production at all. Yeah, in the early days of Shrek, Katzenberg was saying there were going to be five Shrek movies. But by the time Shrek Forever After came out, they were saying, this is it, this is done, the arcs are complete, four is all we've got. And if people had just let the ogre go, he'd be gone. But they didn't. So we're not going to see a DreamWorks animated Shrek again in this video. That does not mean we've seen the last of Shrek in this video, but he, he will be a very rare occurrence. So before we get fully lost in the feline sauce, I just wanted us to stop, to reflect and remember, and think about what we've done. Next. It's day nine. 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 The last segment, that was back in day six. This is day nine. Welcome. The Adventures of Puss in Boots, 2015 to 2018, is a television show that premiered on Netflix, the streaming service. It is six seasons long, containing 77 episodes. Why did I choose to do this? The episodes are all 22 minutes long, meaning there was 28 hours of TV show. I started watching this right away on day seven, and Adventures of Puss in Boots became my entire life while I was eating, packing, taking my hot girl mental health walks. It was all with Puss in Boots. I was a fool to think it would be Shrek who would consume me. No, sir. It's Puss in Boots. It's always been Puss in Boots. Here's what's not gonna happen. I am not going to make you sit through me recounting each of the 77 episodes, all 28 hours of this show. Partially for your sake, mostly for mine. Instead, what I'm going to do is give you an overview of each season as a whole and do my best to be really brief and not get too in the puss and boots weeds, which is gonna be hard because I love getting in the weeds. But I don't want this to be a two hour long segment. Some important context, this show takes place before Puss in Boots 2011, meaning that it happens before anything that we have discussed so far because Puss in Boots 2011 happened before Shrek 2 2004 and probably also before Shrek 2001. So this comes first. Season one of The Adventures of Puss in Boots. Episode one has to hit us with all of our world building, our context, and it does so with noticeably cheaper animation than we're used to. And at many points, I felt like I was watching a TF2, like fan animation. Are you familiar? It's the thieves, I think. We see the thieves in this episode and then they're also in every other single episode. There's just sort of this unending mass of identical, thieves with covered faces, and they're just there as like cannon fodder for Puss in Boots. And they look like they belong in a Team Fortress 2 fan animation. I'm sorry. Puss in Boots is in the desert at the thieves market. It's like a black market, like how children and also many adults picture the black market, like a little setup of shops and stalls of illegal goods that you can go and <laughs> hand them your bloody cash and get, I don't even. Puss is basically on model. He looks like he did in Shrek, uh, but a lot of the other main characters that you're going to see do not look like they would belong in Shrek. So he just doesn't match, uh, which would be fine. It probably wouldn't have even hit me at all um, if he was the only cat in this show. But instead, Puss saves a naive, innocent, perfect little Barbie-voiced pretty cat lady named Dulcinea from The Thieves. I need to buy some fabric and I have so much money. Her eyes are so big and her ears are so big and her head is so big. <laughs> Littlest pet shop core, doll core. Next to Puss in Boots, she looks like an alien. We also learn right away that Dulcinea lives her entire life by the rules outlined in this little book of fun facts and platitudes and rhymes. Uh, and she is our love interest of the show. Puss in Boots follows her home to make sure that she stays safe. And he watches as she magically opens a portal 
to a legendary hidden crime-free city called San Lorenzo. San Lorenzo was kind of created as a safe haven for orphans and outcasts and uh, the people there don't see the outside world much, if ever, which is why Dulcinea acts like that. And Puss in Boots follows her through. He sees the town. He sees their big treasure house with all of these amazing, incredible treasures. She just shows it to him like it's nothing. And he steals a coin, one coin, uh, as a souvenir, which breaks the spell that kept San Lorenzo hidden from the rest of the world. And now it is in danger. This spell was cast around San Lorenzo by the great mage Sino, who we will hear a lot about sometimes and then forget about for entire seasons. Puss in Boots, of course, realizes that the spell being broken and San Lorenzo being in peril is all his fault, so he dedicates himself to staying and protecting the town. That's episode one. That's our premise. There it is. The entirety of season one, outside of episode one, where they're setting out the premise, has two types of episodes. The first one is there is a problem happening. Uh, Puss in Boots solves it. And because of the way that he solves it, a new person is subsequently brought into San Lorenzo. The second type of episode is there is a problem. Puss in Boots solves it. And the status quo is completely restored at the end with no change at all. That's season one. Overall, season one's job is to establish the characters. So I'm just gonna tell you about some of the characters we meet. In the town, there is an orphanage. We all know Puss in Boots has a soft spot for orphans and orphanages. It is run by Senora Zapata, who does not like Puss in Boots much. And there's quite a few orphans, but there's really only four that have names and speaking lines. One of them is Esme. She's tiny and cute with pigtails. One of them is Vina. She's taller and teenage-ish and full of fun facts. One of them is Kid Pickles. His entire bit is that he likes pickles. Pickle me, Kid Pickles. My mama was a cactus. And one of them is Toby, and Toby's a pig. Toby has four older brothers that are like evil ninjas. They're basically the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but they're pigs and they're bad. They show up as minor antagonists in this season and occasionally crop up throughout the rest of the entire show, but never too much effect. Also already in town at the beginning, we have Artifius. He is the town alchemist, mage, and macrame expert. He's a very old man, and his entire bit is that he's very, very forgetful, and they have to remind him his name, the other characters' names, what he's doing, where he is, constantly during the whole show. That That's Artifius's bit. He's great, though. Artifius has some trouble with his memory. Oh, it's true, and I have some trouble with my memory. There's also the tavern keeper Bahuna and the paranoid mayor Temoroso, who stays in barrels all the time because he's a very nervous man and does not want to face the outside world. During the season, we are also introduced to new characters to the town, of course, particularly bad guys, because San Lorenzo's never had those before. One of them would be the unfulfilled valley girl tattooed sphinx that Puss goes to at one point to get an artifact and solve riddles, but he's terrible at riddles. Uh, and she just sticks with him. She lives in San Lorenzo now. She guards San Lorenzo. She flies them around whenever they need to leave San Lorenzo. Another antagonist who stays an antagonist for a little bit longer is the Duchess, who comes in looking for Artifius, her former lover. She's here to collect his soul because the Duchess cannot do magic on her own, but really likes doing magical things. Later in this season still, uh, the Duchess sends in another orphan into town, Cleevel, a little goblin. The Duchess sends Cleevel in to like do her evil bidding, uh, but Cleevel is very quickly taken in by the other orphans and by the town and enjoys the real concept of family and stays there. Cleevel also lives here forever now. Uh, we meet Jack Spratt, Puss's old adventuring buddy who's incredibly French and also kind of a coward and a traitor. And he's voiced by John Leguizamo. And here is another surprise. Jack Spratt never does much except put Puss in danger and make Dulcinea 
really, really mad. She hates that guy. <laughs> One episode, Puss has to go fight a golem that was created by a wizard that got mad at Puss in the past. And at the end of it, Puss and the golem are buddies. The golem does not live there forever. Uh, he does come up again later, but he doesn't fully get adopted into San Lorenzo. We meet Puss's old mentor, El Guante Blanco, which means white gloves. He's a little tuxedo cat with little white feet. In the El Guante Blanco adventure, we also meet the Sphinx's twin sister, Callista, who guards a forest full of fountains, including the Fountain of Youth. The Sphinx and Callista look identical, except Sphinx has tattoos and piercings, and Callista does not. That, that's you can tell them apart. Also, Callista does not come to live in San Lorenzo. She stays at her forest. Oh my god, more minor antagonists to bring up. Uh, Fartholomew Fish Flinger is an evil wizard that Artifius turned into a mouse back in the day. He shows up for an episode and we'll have to remember his name, so keep that in your mind. Fartholomew Fish Flinger. I will give you such a slap. Fair enough. And then I will conquer the world. Why? Puss in Boots goes back to the thieves market to get some stuff and a goblin curses him with bad luck, which means he's banished from San Lorenzo. Also, the bad luck means he's a, a black cat. It turns him into a black cat. And as he's banished, he meets up with a trio of three other black cats. And one of them is voiced by H. John Benjamin, like, 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 like Bob's Burgers and Archer. OK. Yeah, all black cats can do that. We just made up that field stuff because we wanted to keep you around. Voice actors who only do one voice. I love you. I love you. You're so distracting. <laughs> and then Puss gets uncursed and goes home and the status quo is returned. The last antagonistic force that we meet is the scimitar who's being wielded by a man named Thrifith. And we meet the scimitar because Dulcinea pulls a magic sword out of a stone. It's called the good sword. <laughs> It's very creative. You'll get used to it. A talking sword, said the talking cat. She gets super strength and magic sword fighting skills and learns how to fight. And she has to go fight Thrifith and the scimitar. But it turns out that the scimitar is corrupting Thrifith, who's actually the rightful owner of the good sword. So Dulcinea gives up the good sword and loses her magic powers. That's actually only the first of two times in this season that Dulcinea gets incredible power and then loses it. The second time being when Dulcinea befriends a magical wishing star named Esteban, but that's kind of that classic careful what you wish for episode. And at the end, she has to let Esteban go because of all the chaos that's been caused. Poor Dulcinea. And that's what happens in season one. Are you confused? Did that seem just sort of like a disjointed list of characters that were barely explained to you? Weird. Season one is the longest season of this show. It's 15 episodes. It was five and a half hours. And boy, at the end of it, was I really considering just pretending I didn't know there was a TV show. Oh my God, I didn't mean to leave it out of the video, guys. I didn't know it was real. Like season one is fine. It's fine. The characters are simple. They're fun. There was at least one really good joke per episode that kind of kept me there. But I was praying, praying for connecting plot threads. There was, there was a couple repeated villain moments. The Duchess was in there twice. So I knew we were capable of it. I just hadn't seen it yet. But I was waiting. And season two is where the shit starts to get good. The first half of season two is just as disjointed as season one. They were not done introducing us to a list of characters. <laughs> In the first episode, Puss goes to slay a dragon, but the dragon is nice, but a big scary bandit leader named El Moco, voiced by Danny Trejo, uh, also showed up to try and slay it. And he's a recurring antagonist now. In episode two, Jack Spratt comes back to drag us underground where we meet the mole people and the mole king, voiced by John DiMaggio. Ah, you can't really have it. Mm -hmm. It was a test. You guys passed. You are right. The mole king's whole thing is that he has a big, shiny silver sphere that he he calls his Bali. It's my Bali! My Bali, my Bali, my Bali, my Bali! And it has his show in it. And the show 
is that it reflects his own face back to him. And it's his favorite show. Puss in Boots seduces a mermaid that he actually finds horrendously unattractive. Puss in Boots is really afraid of bees, which is a problem when a swarm of bees terrorizes San Lorenzo and they have to get the piper, not the Pied Piper, the piper, to come and help them, but she scams them in the process. Puss has to train that group of orphans to be fighters, but he gets kidnapped by El Moco. And then I was like, hello? We just met that villain and he's back. He's back, causing problems. What's he doing? Also, El Moco is just kind of in charge of all the thieves and the bandits now. And one of the bandits, this is so small, one of the bandits at the end of season one, when Puss in Boots got cursed with bad luck and became a black cat, that bandit was cursed by a goblin to have donkey ears. And for the rest of the season, you will occasionally see a bandit with donkey ears. I love it so much. That's so small. Don't you call this a curse? <laughs> I can hear everything. Anyway, Elmoko wasn't carrying any plot, but Puss in Boots decides to help Artifius restore that spell that he broke in episode one of season one that cloaked San Lorenzo and kept everybody safe. And he and Artifius find a scroll to restore the spell. That's also a prophecy written in a dead language that they're going to need to translate. But Artifius can translate one line of it. It says, San Lorenzo is, well, what's his word? Happy, healthy, a great vacation spot, doomed. Plot? Plot? Are we getting, we're getting a plot? <laughs> For the spell that they found to work, every single piece of San Lorenzo's treasure must be in the treasure house, and they are currently missing some stuff. So let's spend the rest of the season getting that stuff. Let's go! Puss and Dulcinea use that evil scimitar to find a magical dowsing rod that's gonna point them to all of their missing magical items. And on that quest, they meet Uli, who's a little fawn, a little Goat person voiced by Alan Tudyk. I am Uli Schlagzudenbock, but you can call me Uli. The scimitar corrupted Dulcinea nearly kills Puss and Uli saves his life. And then they abandon the scimitar like in the middle of the desert. Good plan, dudes. One of the treasures that they need is the Mole King's shiny ball that has his show in it. It's That's part of the San Lorenzo treasure. So their plan is to just trade it for a different big shiny ball. Uh, but before he'll allow the trade, <laughs> Dulcinea and Puss have to fix his relationship with the rabbit queen that is in charge of a different underground nation. They are really very droopy, are they not? Kind of uh, tempting. Hey, pretty boy, my eyes are down here. The final treasure that they need to get is actually the coin that Puss initially stole from the treasure house, which is currently in the hands of the Duchess, and she wants it because that coin says 1829, which is hundreds of years in the future. So I guess canon, it's like the 1500s. All right. Also, while Puss and Dulcinea and Uli are off getting all the treasure, Tyrannus, a thunder god, like a real god, gods are real, comes to San Lorenzo looking for his scepter of lightning. And all of the orphans in Artifius tell him crazy stories about how powerful and strong Puss in Boots is to scare him away. And, and nobody there is surprised that gods are real and present and talking to them and looking for their scepters. This Puss in Boots is very strong. Boy, if you like that story, wait till you hear this one. One day, my owl Bestifer was sitting on my weather vane. True story. At the end of this season, the great mage Sino arrives back to San Lorenzo, the mage who made the spell that Puss broke in episode one, season one. Artifius seems kind of skeptical. A lot of people seem really confused, but it's the great mage Sino and he banishes Puss for his sins. Uh, we do find out pretty quickly that the great mage Sino is a fraud. He's actually Fartholomew Fishflinger in disguise. He's not a mouse now. Now he's the great mage Sino. While Dulcinea is out getting Puss back to bring him back to San Lorenzo, uh, the great mage Sino is giving Artifius a spell to use to restore the protective barrier. That's a mighty nice robe, by the way. I used to have one just like it. But it's not the restoration spell. It's not. In fact, nothing is as it seems as Uli the little fawn boy turns out to be a traitor 
who is working for the Blood Wolf and is summoning him from the Netherworld, using Fartholomew Fishflinger as a mere distraction, as a mere way to get his spell cast. The spell to summon the Blood Wolf from the Netherworld is cast. San Lorenzo is raised into the sky upon a statue of the Blood Wolf. As Uli starts wearing, everyone will suffer. The whole world has lost. Everything will be destroyed. You lose. You all lose. The whole world loses. <laughs> And the final shot of this season of San Lorenzo on top of this spooky wolf statue, backlit, kind of rules. It's good. After two seasons, that was pretty much just, and here's a character, and here's a character, and here's a character, and this one lives here now, and then you're going to collect this magical item, and I'm going to take this magical item. They were suddenly like, and this guy that I gave you is a traitor, and there's a blood wolf. Now what? <laughs> they had never, they had never said the words blood wolf or netherworld. <laughs> Before this happened, I'm not like hiding it from you. Incredible? No notes. We're a third of the way through the show. Season three starts with Puss in Boots having an existential crisis because he has failed San Lorenzo and the Blood Wolf has been summoned. And the Mole King and the Rabbit Queen invade with their armies, blaming Puss for the Blood Wolf thing that lifted their underground kingdoms into the sky. This is the worst thing that ever happened to anybody, ever! In this first episode, we do see a bandit reading a book that has a picture of human Shrek from Shrek 2, 2004 on it. Shrek 2, 2004 hasn't happened yet, so we just have to assume that human Shrek is the peak of male beauty, the sort of thing you would put on romance novels. Anyway, the Mole King imprisons Uli because of the Blood Wolf thing actually being Uli's fault. But Uli knows things about the Blood Wolf. He knows how to defeat the Blood Wolf. He knows his weaknesses. So Puss goes to try and break him out of prison. He fails. He gets the shit beaten out of him by the Mole King. But he does learn that there's a great prophecy that the Blood Wolf can only be defeated by the One. And that the One is a great cat. A very special cat. This can only be me. I am a hero. I am the hero of the great prophecy. Even after learning that, they're like, clearly there is more and we need to get Uli back still. I don't see it, but sure. And then the game of the season is gather the forces, go back to the characters that were introduced and didn't stay adopted into San Lorenzo, go grab them, bring them back to San Lorenzo so we can get our armies together for this Blood Wolf thing. They go get El Guante Blanco. They go get the Golem, saving him from being enslaved by the Duchess. And then also while they're there, recruit the Duchess. Oh, let me go! Hiya. Puss, I know we've had our differences in the past. Fully that trope where you take a very minor antagonist from season one and they're everybody's best friend by the finale. It's that, it's that, that's the Duchess. They go to get Thrifith and the Good Sword, but they get there just in time to see Thrifith breaking up with the Good Sword. So they just keep the sword. Thrifith, we need you. For what? Having a tantrum? Shut up, no face. The orphans back in San Lorenzo, who Puss is like training how to fight, and they do have their own little plot lines while everything else is going on. We, I just, I can't get into that with you right now. Anyway, those guys call themselves the Junior Puss Squad. Uh, this group of like real actual fighters, Puss in Boots, Dulcinea, El Guanto Blanco, the Duchess, Sphinx, and the Golem, and the Good Sword are the Senior Puss Squad. The Senior Puss Squad goes to rescue Uli from the Mole King and they clear up the whole situation for King and Queenie about how it's Uli's fault and they just let him go. It was, it was a miscommunication the whole time. You're not gonna talk, you're gonna listen for once. Puss, tell him about Uli and the Blood Wolf. But I wanna sit there. And Uli lets them know that the Blood Wolf will arrive in about two months. Which is such an annoying amount of time. That is that is too much time. Like, you're just going to sit around and worry about it. But it's also not enough time to, like, permanently relocate everyone. 
That's a really terrible amount of time. I would be annoyed too. There's a couple episodes that do nothing for the blood wolf stuff. Uli gets tricked into being helpful making a feast. Atifius makes a clone of Puss. Pahuna, the tavern keeper, gets everyone hooked on a coin toss game. Puss teaches Kid Pickles how to love his birthday. And then Puss in Boots joins a sky pirate crew, a crew of sky pirates, to look for the Crown of Souls, which is an artifact that Uli tells them, uh, can be used against the blood wolf that they need it if they want to defeat him. The sky pirate ships can also go in water. Like they could be sea pirates or sky pirates. They're just usually sky pirates, which is cooler. They're correct for that. And then Puss and his pirate friends find the crown of souls. And in the process of getting it, befriend and liberate a group of skeletons. Puss brings the crown of souls and the skeletons back to San Lorenzo. And for the rest of the show, amidst the townspeople and the orphans and the senior puss squad, there's just a group of skeletons living there and they mean the world to me. You see, Gregor, I told you everything would work out. <laughs> yes, I do not know what that means, but here, come ahead. Uli and Dulcinea have a whole talk, and Uli comes to the realization that maybe being evil is bad? Couldn't be. Uli, people respect those who do good, not evil. Kindness is always returned with kindness. There is no way this is true. And that's season three. They are looking for ways to defeat or to stop the Blood Wolf. And they have one thing, they have the Crown of Souls but they need more things. And immediately in season four, we find out something they need is actually to finish the Crown of Souls because there's a big ass gem missing and it won't work if it's not complete. Guys, this gem was split into pieces. Each one of those pieces given to one of the Eldritch sisters, these sisters that are all witches and magic users. So Post, Dulcinea, Artifius, and the Duchess go to find and defeat the Eldritch sisters. The first one is Malvolia, who thinks witches aren't allowed to like anything girly, and she paints herself green because that's what witches do. She's pretty easy to defeat. They just kind of have to tell her, like, you can be whatever you want to be. And she just gives them her piece of the gem. Here, take my piece of the gem. Oh, I can't wait to get this makeup off. Uh, the second is Malarena Eldritch, who has big, like, Doc Ock spider things going on. She rules. The third, Malaflua Eldritch, is actually the Piper, who scammed San Lorenzo with their swarms of bees, who I mentioned for, like, five seconds earlier. But then they find out. There are not only three Eldritch sisters, there is a fourth secret Eldritch sister, Maldona. And Maldona Eldritch is the Duchess. Maldona Eldritch, or the Duchess, had her magical ability and memory revoked after publishing a tell-all about her sisters, and her sisters got mad about it. Uh, but now she can just have it back. Her sisters miss her. They forgive her. Here you go. And now for the rest of the show, this character who couldn't do magic but was always trying to find ways and build inventions to do magical effects can do magic. It's pretty cool. Artifius cries. Oh, I just love it when people get their memories back. Oh, I wish I could forget everything so that I could remember it later. He's never remembered a single thing. This entire show, four seasons in, they're still reminding this dude what his name is. Puss in Boots is kidnapped and hunted on an island by a jilted ex-lover, a tiger named Alessandra. Dulcinea starts a school for wayward thieves that Uli takes over and does a bad job and causes chaos. And then Dulcinea goes to find the author of her book. I mentioned it so briefly. She lives her life by this book that she has. It is full of little rhymes that mean nothing, and they guide all of her principles. And occasionally, 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 this book has little snippets of information that they use to find magical items or to point them in the right direction. So she goes to the author of this book looking for more information on the Crown of Souls. The author, Miguela, hates this book. She says it ruined her career, it's the worst thing she's ever written, and it's garbage. Which makes Dulcinea very sad. But they work it out, and Miguela takes Puss in Boots, Dulcinea, and Uli to go get a book that's actually about the Crown of Souls from an ogre who is 
playing at being like a noble aristocrat in his fancy clothes and his fancy little house. And I suddenly remembered, you know, three and a half seasons in that, oh my God, this takes place in the same world as Shrek. I'm watching this because, because this all relates to Shrek somehow. We see that romance book with human Shrek on it again. <laughs> Glad to see you here, man. They get that book they were looking for about the crown of souls and Miguel stays there with the ogre because he has such a big library. And also, what were we going to do with the rude author back in San Lorenzo? Not a loss. Promise me you'll write me every day. Not a chance. What does people couple episodes that are just complete one-offs. A bounty hunter named Roz, who's one of Pahuna's old friends, shows up to try and collect the bounty on Puss. Tyrannus, the thunder god from earlier, comes to get Puss in Boots' help to stop the king of gods to Atatus the Allfather from destroying all mortals. You know, a really casual one-episode plot point that's resolved in 22 minutes. Back to the real plot. The gang goes to Callista, Sphinx's twin sister, the one with no tattoos, for information on the obelisk of night, the other thing that they need to stop the blood wolf. They need to use the crown of souls and the obelisk of night together. There's more shenanigans. They find out that the obelisk of night is actually underneath San Lorenzo and has been the whole time. They did not need to be traveling the whole world for it. The final two episodes of this season are wild. Dulcinea is being tormented with nightmares where she is surrounded by eyeless black and white versions of herself being like hunted through an empty San Lorenzo. It's actually quite creepy. While the gang was gone, El Moco came back to take over San Lorenzo and they fix that very quickly. That man is not a threat to us. So the gang finds the obelisk of night, this huge thing beneath San Lorenzo. And Puss, because the prophecy said that only the one could do this and that the one was a great cat, uh, goes to attempt to do the ritual, which would be putting the crown on your head and putting their, their little cat paw in the correct indentation on the obelisk. But the crown doesn't fit him and he has too many fingers to properly fit his paw in there. He's got four fingers and a thumb, and the indentation only has three fingers and a thumb, so it can't be puss. No, in fact, the one from the Great Prophecy is Dulcinea, because she's only got three fingers and a thumb and is also the purest of heart. She puts on the crown of souls, puts her little paw in the indentation, and vanishes, because this ritual is not one to stop the blood wolf. This ritual summons him and opens a portal to the netherworld. Bully's been evil the whole time. He never had a change of heart. He was a big, big liar, manipulating everyone to do what he wanted to make this happen, to bring the blood wolf to San Lorenzo. And in the finale of this season, with a portal to hell, the netherworld, opened up in San Lorenzo, wolf demons flying around, attacking everyone. The blood wolf arrives and he's amazing. He's big and he's scary and he was so well hyped up. I am the source of all fear. I have existed since before time began. And after I am done with this world, fear will be the only thing left. And he does not like Uli, <laughs> his most loyal servant. And the blood wolf says he will destroy him the way he will destroy everyone else. Dulcinea, post vanishing, is haunted by those eyeless Dulcinea nightmares again, but it turns out they're friendly. Now, I imagine you have many questions. They are actually collectively one creature. They're a tulpa a sort of magical thought form conjured by a sorcerer. And they are one of three such tulpas created by the great mage Sino. Uh, and her name is Orange. Oh, that's not a name, it's a fruit. And her job is to protect the realm of shades, this sort of in-between place where the blood wolf could be banished to if he was ever summoned into this plane. Dulcinea and Orange have some lovely conversations. They bond. Dulcinea says, oh, I've never met a tulpa before. That's what she sounds like. Uh, and Orange laughs at her hysterically. <laughs> <laughs> you never, you never met a tulpa. <laughs> Why is that funny? 
And then Orange gives Dulcinea a magical amulet that can be used to banish the Blood Wolf to the Realm of Shades forever, but using it would banish Dulcinea forever as well. Dulcinea is the only one who can activate it, and then it has to be used very shortly after. So she decides to make that sacrifice back in the real world in San Lorenzo. She activates it, and then Uli jumps in, grabs it, and uses it. And Uli's last words to Dulcinea are, I'm sorry. Uli actually really liked Dulcinea. Everybody likes Dulcinea. They can't help it because Dulcinea is perfect. The blood wolf is banished to the Realm of Shades. Uli is banished to the Realm of Shades. And San Lorenzo sinks back to where it is supposed to be as that huge ass statue of the Blood Wolf is gone. Um, But the portal to hell remains open. (laughs) And that's season four. Season four is genuinely so good. It's so good. I think season four has a really good blend of episodes that actually push the sort of overarching plot forward and those one-off little character beat filler episodes that are still really fun. I really liked the filler episodes this season. I thought that the plot threads they were weaving were really interesting. We got the payoff for two seasons worth of buildup for the Blood Wolf, and he was so cool. Even Uli's banishment was like actually emotional because they spent all of season four thinking he was on their side, and then there's the betrayal of he's not on their side, and and then it didn't even work out for him, and the man that he's been campaigning for didn't even like him, and he has to very quickly realize that the people who are actually there for him were Dulcinea, were Puss in Boots, or the people of San Lorenzo, and, and he has to do what's right for them in the end. It's quite good. If this whole show were six seasons worth of season four, I would recommend it in a heartbeat. It's not. We are now two-thirds of the way through this TV show. Season five, the Blood Wolf is defeated, so the senior Puss squad disbands. They literally all leave town. The Duchess leaves town. The Golem leaves town. El Conte Blanco leaves town. Uh, the Sphinx stays because she lives there. And Puss in Boots has an existential crisis about not being a hero the exact same way that he did at the beginning of season three. He goes through a lot of crises in this show. There's sort of a continuous loop of Puss in Boots has too much of an ego and overestimates what he can do and does something crazy, but then it goes wrong or somebody else has to step in and save the day. And then he sits there like, wait a second, that was my entire self-identity. What do you mean it was wrong? And he has a crisis. And this happens over and over and over and over again. And I'm sure if you watched it in a spread out format, that would be fine and normal and expected even. Um, I watched it wrong. And in a way that made Puss in Boots mildly annoying to me. But I I still love him. I do, I do, I do. Artifius starts to slowly work on a spell to close the portal to the netherworld because monsters are pouring out of it. There's a really silly looking monster that everyone in town thinks is a group of children in a costume. And that monster is so beloved by the town that they keep him and he lives there for the rest of the show. There's a headless horse monster. There's a big sort of pig-esque demon. And then the Netherworld portal shoots out a bunch of clones of Puss and Boots. And they have some little shenanigans. Um, All of these clones are actually like alternate reality versions. Uh, And one of them is a spooky, mean version that they call Evil Puss, who is actually the emperor of the world that the Netherworld portal pulled him from. He and Puss and Boots have a big fight. Puss and Evil Puss are identical, except Evil Puss has a red feather in his hat instead of a yellow one. So that's how you know he's evil. And at the end of that episode, Evil Puss just jumps into the netherworld portal. There he goes. You should have killed me when you had the chance. And then a gargoyle comes out of the portal. And then an ice monster named Tim that hates Puss in Boots comes out of the portal. What is your name again? Tim. That ice monster who appears in the desert that San Lorenzo is in starts instantly melting, uh, spends the episode sort of getting everyone to sympathize with him and then chooses to die at the end being held by his new best friend Puss in Boots watching the sunset as he melts into nothing. 
it was uh, <sighs> Cleveland, the little goblin orphan, does notice there was a little crystal left behind, and it turns out that little crystal held Tim's spirit, and they could bring him back if they just go put the the crystal in the frozen north, and they make Sphinx go do that because any time that they need to travel, they make Sphinx do it. She is the one with wings. And then it's Lord Crispentine's Day, which is like San Lorenzo's Valentine's Day. Uh, Puss and Dulcinea both want to ask each other to be their date. Uh, they don't manage to do so <laughs> until the last 20 seconds of the episode. Uh, they have been having a slow burn romance the whole time. I've been trying to work up the nerve to ask you all day, but... <gasps> I haven't really mentioned their slow burn romance because it hasn't been plot relevant and this is very much just the main plots, but it is plot relevant now, okay? Puss and Dulcinea are into each other. They're in love. A bunch of fairy demons called the Tiny Tufts come out of the portal and the Tiny Tufts let the people know that the blind king is sending all these various creatures because he wants San Lorenzo destroyed. And then a really stinky monster comes out of the portal. And then a hippie dingo named Sheila with an Australian accent comes out of the portal. And Sheila is going to dance the world to its doom by dancing to summon a big bad guy named Kafagnar. But they find out she's wearing an anklet that is controlling her actions and that anklet is being controlled by the Blind King. Who is this guy? You seriously gotta stop throwing things into the portal. It's not an evil dumpster. Oh, I know, but I find it so satisfying. Yeah, and take down, Brock. Dulcinea discovers that one of the orphans who has not like had speaking lines or done anything, but has been around for at, at least all of this season, uh, is secretly a 1,000-year-old evil fairy agent sent by the Blind King. The orphan's name is Lil Pequina. She's been four years old as long as anyone can remember. She's also been here in San Lorenzo as long as anyone can remember. No one actually knows when she got here because she can manipulate memory and also shapeshift, which is a terrifying combination. You shouldn't be allowed to do both. Lopakina is also sending messages uh, back into the netherworld, presumably to the Blind King. She also uses her memory manipulation powers to make everyone else think that Dulcinea is evil and caused the apocalypse. Uh, but Puss breaks out of that because, you know, he and Dulcinea have a connection. And then, defeated, Lopakina jumps back in the netherworld portal. <laughs> Welcome now to the last two episodes of season five. The last two episodes are like always the best two episodes of the season. Except for season one. Puss in Boots, Dulcinea, Toby, the pig orphan, and Artifius all go through the netherworld portal so they can face the blind king before he can get to them. And everybody except Puss gets superpowers by going through the portal, including Puss's horse, who's also there. I can move stuff with my mind. You all thought I'd lost it, but it's right here moving stuff. While there, they team up with sorceress Hecate. They either called her Hecate or Hecate. It's Hecate, right? That's how we say that name, Hecate? Hukata is the leader of the Grand Netherworld Resistance Army, who also wants to take down the Blind King, and she lets them know that no one's ever even seen the Blind King. He took over this entire realm, and no one's ever even seen him. Puss gets captured by a group of buff purple lady cyclopses called the Zephalim. They also do not like the Blind King. The Blind King has kidnapped and mind-controlled a lot of their own with those, like, anklets and bracelets that he used on Sheila, the Dingo, who wanted to summon Kafagnar. You remember? The Zephalim make Puss do some nonsensical challenges, and then they're on his side to help him out. The rest of the gang gets captured by the mind-controlled Zephalim and brought to the Blind King, who it turns out is... Evil Puss. So they must fight Evil Puss in Boots with his army of buff purple Cyclops ladies. And our heroes... Dance and dance to summon Kafognar. Kafognar, it turns out, is a big t 
turtle. And he can only be controlled by the true ruler of the netherworld. And now the blind king is not the true ruler. He overthrew the last ruler. That is not how we transition power down here, apparently. I don't know what he was supposed to do to become the true ruler, but he's not. He's not it. No, no, no. The true ruler is the tiny queen. That is who the Zephilim serve. That is who the netherworld and Kafognar recognize as their leader. And the tiny queen is Lil Pekina. <laughs> Lil Pekina, it turns out, was being mind-controlled by the blind king, again, with the, the bracelet anklet situation after he overthrew her. Kafognar squishes evil puss with his big, big foot, uh, but he just vanishes and could have vanished, they say, into any other reality. Now, does that have a payoff? Does that come back later? No, it does not. Lil Pekina, or the tiny queen, agrees to have Kafognar block the portal from their side to effectively close it off. It'll still be open, but there won't be anything coming through on either side. So the gang crosses back into San Lorenzo where they find their own graves. And that's the end of season five. There is one season left of this show. And I fear that I've been explaining it so quickly and with so few details that none of it has made any sense. But I assure you, this is the better alternative. I spent 28 hours getting this summary for you. Do you understand that? Do, do you understand that? I enjoyed, truly enjoyed, about nine of those hours, I would say. Season six, the final puss. <laughs> it turns out that our heroes have missed an entire year in the real world because time moves differently in the netherworld. While they were gone, El Moco and his army of bandits have taken over San Lorenzo, and it is Puss's job to bring the San Lorenzo population back. It takes him a couple episodes to do so. Some of the folks are living down with the mole people. Some of them are living with just regular bears. Some of them are living with the goblins, the ones who Cursed Puss with bad luck and one of those bandits with donkey ears. When Puss goes to get the orphans from the goblins, the goblins pull him aside to ask him what the hell Cleevil is. Cleevil, the goblin orphan. <laughs> He's like, um, she's clearly a goblin. And they go, no, she has a neck. Goblins don't have necks. And Puss in Boots is like, I don't know what to tell you. And then he takes her home. <laughs> Look at her and look at me. Neck, no neck. Neck, no neck. Neck, no neck. It's freaking me out. They get everyone together. They take on El Moco. They reclaim San Lorenzo. The Duchess, in particular, is overjoyed to see Artifius alive. They had a complicated relationship that was established way back in season one. They had a thing before the series began. And they've had like a weird sort of flirtation ship going on this whole time. Um, this season, in, in particular, they really kind of bring it home that the Duchess is in love with this weird old man, and he thinks she's pretty foxy. San Lorenzo begins suffering from earthquakes that start off sort of infrequent and small, but over the season get more and more devastating and happen more and more frequently. A loan shark comes to collect Puss in Boots' boots because they were collateral for a loan. Pahuna summons ghosts for funsies. Puss has to learn that running the tavern is a hard job when Pahuna runs off on some of her own adventures. Guy Fox, named that because he's a fox, who's an author and an adventurer, shows up in San Lorenzo and it turns out he's Dulcinea's hero. Dulcinea thinks he's pretty dreamy. Puss is pretty jealous about that. Guy Fox tries to lure Dulcinea with some nice words to come travel with him, but he stole those words and those sentiments from Puss in Boots, who truly thinks those things about Dulcinea. She's brave, and she's good, and she deserves every happiness. She was brave, and she was good, and she deserved every happiness. Turns out Guy Fox is broke as hell, and he wants to use Dulcinea as a sales tactic, because he'd sell more books about his adventures if he had a female sidekick. Dulcinea says, never meet your heroes. Puss in Boots says, I have a hero, and she's the best. 
God, that's cute. Puss and Dulcinea go on a picnic by the lake where they will not admit if it's a date or a platonic friend trip. Turns out, after getting ousted from San Lorenzo, El Moco had a psychotic break and is wielding planks of wood that he believes to be eels to fight the townsfolk and is making all the other bandits do the same. El Moco takes his final defeat in this episode as his sign to fully abandon civilization forever, and they just let him do that. This picnic lake date and this El Moco fight happen outside of San Lorenzo, which is why it's very concerning when Puss and Dulcinea almost kiss, but they're interrupted by an earthquake. Because they all thought the quakes were just happening in San Lorenzo, but if they're all the way out here and they're still shaking, something is clearly more wrong than they thought. I don't know why I'm dancing. I don't know why I'm talking like that. I'll stop. With the earthquakes getting worse, Puss and Boots meets back up with those sky pirates from earlier to rescue their captain because he's in trouble and also search for the cause of the earthquakes. The pirates are also friends with that aristocratic noble ogre with a library now. That's fun. When Puss in Boots returns from that sky pirate adventure, San Lorenzo is falling apart and on fire from all the earthquakes. So Puss looks to his sky god besties for help stopping the earthquake, uh, Tyrannus and Teutonus. Those gods he's just been buddies with that are real and love him. Uh, Those gods are leaving the realm forever because all the earthquakes make it seem like the world is ending and they don't want to mess with that. The gods grant him divine power, which turns out to be just a whole host of superpowers that he has no control over. And when Puss gets a little too stubborn and overconfident and is ready to sacrifice his entire self to stop the earthquakes with these powers, Dulcinea intimidates the gods into taking the powers back. Tuatatis goes to talk to Brigantia, another god whose area is actually Earth, because Tuatatis and Tyrannus are sky gods, and Brigantia stops the earthquakes. We never get to see Brigantia, we just hear her angry voice. Hey, Brigantia, love, got a favor to ask. Day you come to my realm. And the earthquakes stop. That's all it took to stop the earthquakes. What do you mean the earthquakes just stopped? There's two episodes left in the entire series. Wait, Lulpakina, the tiny queen of the netherworld, sends a message. She tells them that the netherworld portal in San Lorenzo is unstable. Even though it is blocked off, it was never closed. Their worlds, the real world and the netherworld are going to collide. And in less than a day, the entire world will implode in an apocalypse. Insane! They say all of this as though it has been foreshadowed, as though it has been set up, as though just saying the world ends tomorrow (laughs) is fine. So here we are, the final two episodes of The Adventures of Puss in Boots. My friends, you are not ready. (laughs) The second to last episode, the penultimate episode, is called The Moving Finger Writes. And the finale is called And Having Writ Moves On. That's so fucking dramatic. So the San Lorenzo gang decides they must find the great mage Sino to stop all this from happening. He is their only hope. They have to find those other two tulpas. We met Orange before, but there are two more. They announce this, and Duchess lets them know that she knows where one of the tulpas is. She brought one of the tulpas here. She brought Cleveville here. And Cleveville is actually green. One of the tulpas. And that's why she doesn't look quite like a goblin. Because she's not a goblin. Cleveville herself did not know she was a tulpa. Sino hid that knowledge from her. Uh, So she's just as surprised as the rest of us. But Cleveville and Artifius have some glowing eye white moments and agree that it is time and some knowledge gets unlocked and Cleveville leads them to the Forbidden Citadel. By them, I mean Cleveville takes Puss, Dulcinea, and Artifius. And nobody else, I guess that's all we needed to save the world. The protector of the Forbidden Citadel has a magical ability that they can turn into any enemy that the gang has ever fought. So the action scene is pretty cool uh, as the enemy keeps shifting into all of these different forms that they fought before. It's a really fun thing to do for a finale. In the Forbidden Citadel, they find a spooky looking chained up fella who looks a lot like he could be Artifius's twin, saying he's a prisoner and he's been chained up here for some time. 
and we find out what's really going on here. This guy, this chained up prisoner, is one half of the great mage Sino. He is the evil, he's the ambition, he's the obsession with order. He, he is the left brain of the great mage Sino. The right brain, the side that is good, that is friendly, that's extroverted, that is a lot more concerned about like pleasures of the flesh and not being organized, is Artefius. Artefius has been one half of the great mage Sino all along. He's evil, can't you see? No! Can't you see? No! See? No! See? No! See? No! So Artefius and this chained up prisoner fuse together and create Sino once again. He's Back, baby. There is one single episode left in the whole season, and Artifius is dead, kind of? He's gone, at least, certainly. The finale, and having writ moves on, starts with Cleveland Green, the green tulpa, going back to be with her sister Orange. Now that her job is done, she just sort of fades from existence. So now Cleveland's gone too? Orange's job was to protect the Realm of Shades. Green's job was to guide folks back to Sino when it was time. The third tulpa, White, was created to protect the Arcanum. Something we've never heard of before, but is now the most important thing in the world. The Arcanum is the power source that Sino used to initially banish the Blood Wolf, and he also then used it to split himself in two and erase his own memory of the third tulpa. Basically, the Arcanum is so powerful that he had to hide the knowledge of its protector even from himself. Sino also breaks the news that the Netherworld portal has been open too long to undo the effects that have happened. This apocalypse cannot be stopped. Like the fissures in the earth are too deep or whatever. The worlds are colliding. It's going to happen. They can't fix it. So their only option is time travel to make sure that the portal was never opened in the first place. And they need the Arcanum to do it. Dulcinea knows where it is. It is within the Obelisk of Night. She remembers seeing it when the whole Blood Wolf situation occurred and she vanished and then met Orange. And I know, if you remember... They go to the Obelisk of Night, they find the Arcanum, and the Arcanum reveals that Dulcinea is the third tulpa. She is white. And Puss has to fight her to gain access to the Arcanum as she is its protector. Dulcinea is too powerful and kills Puss in Boots. She kills him. Dead. He dies. You have to bring him back. Bring him. <laughs> In her resulting grief, Dulcinea, sobbing, leans over the body of Puss in Boots and kisses him and revives him. That's right, it is true love's first kiss, baby. We are back in Shrek rules. I feel like it's been so long since we've been in anything resembling Shrek rules, but true love's kiss is here and it is here to stay. True love's first kiss even. Good for them, good for them. However, the entire world explodes. Big cracks through the whole world bust it open, and San Lorenzo is safely bubbled in space by Sino, and they just watch it happen. Here in the safety of the bubble, Sino tells Puss in Boots that no matter what, any world in which Puss comes to San Lorenzo is a world that gets destroyed. His very presence in this powerful place brings enemies and danger that will always, every time, result in the entire world imploding. So the only way to save the world is for Puss in Boots to go back in time 
and never come to San Lorenzo. Sino agrees to let him keep his memories, but nobody else will remember him. Not the junior puss squad, not any of the senior puss squad members, Sphinx, Golem, Duchess, any of that. Um, not Artifius, because it would be Artifius again, not Sino. Not Dulcinea. Puss has a tearful goodbye with all of his orphan children. Tells the entirety of the town farewell. Tells Dulcinea he loves her. And vanishes. And then Dulcinea asks Sino for one last favor. Puss in Boots is sent back to the moment he entered San Lorenzo. He watches Dulcinea on her horse, open that portal, sneak through. He goes to put his own hand through and then turns around and goes back to the thieves market. He has himself a sad drink surrounded by bandits. And then Dulcinea appears behind him, not in her pretty little dress, that he just saw her in and that she's been in pretty much the whole series, but in her final Tulpa battle outfit that he just left her behind in. Are you ready for adventure? And they ride off together towards the horizon for adventure. And that's the show. Okay, so let's talk about this. <laughs> so none of it, none of what I just spent, however long that was telling you about, actually happened. The whole show didn't happen except for Puss. It's very Shrek Forever After 2010 in that way, except Shrek Forever After as a story as a moral, was meant to validate and comfort Shrek about his life and his life choices. And I can't think of an ending that would send a protagonist on more of a spiral than this. No matter what you do, Puss in Boots, you entering this place and meeting these people and joining this affirming community and, and feeling at home here will end the entire world. You cannot earn this, no matter what you sacrifice. That's insane. That's literally insane. And, and the orphans aren't any worse off for it, right? Uh, Senor Zapata, Pihuna, the mayor, the townsfolk, they're not any worse off for it because they don't know. So it's just puss in the knowledge that he spent months potentially years. I don't know how long he was in San Lorenzo. They don't tell us. But a long time making a home there. And he was wrong for doing that. Objectively, morally, him doing that was wrong. It caused the apocalypse. It's just, it's, it's so bleak. That's so bleak. Dulcinea comes with at the end. We do see Episode one, Dulcinea, heading back into San Lorenzo before finale, Dulcinea shows up at the market. So I think there's two Dulcineas now, but honestly, her coming with is extra wild and, and extra bleak because Dulcinea is not in the movies. She's not in Puss in Boots 2011. I haven't seen Puss in Boots The Last Wish 2022 yet. That's coming up. I don't think she's in there either. And the adventures of Puss in Boots 2015 to 2018 happens before Puss in Boots 2011. So at some point, at some point, Puss loses Dulcinea, his magic confirmed true love that saved his life and the only other person who knows what he's gone through. And he just, he just goes on just continues seducing women to fill that void. Why would you do this to him? They give him a whole family, a whole community, a literal, actual, true love, knowing he has to lose it to fit with the canon of Puss in Boots 2011, and they make him lose it reluctantly. Sadly. Also, the Tulpa thing apparently explains why Dulcinea looks like that. Cleveville didn't look like other goblins because she was a Tulpa. Dulcinea doesn't have to look like every other cat in the show. Cause she's a tulpa. It's just really convenient that the tulpa magic 
makes her look hyper feminine to a monstrous degree and has her falling into the same trope as like Stitch's girlfriend in the Lilo and Stitch spinoff and the light fury from How to Train Your Dragon. That's really cool and convenient. And that I lo- that's awesome for her. Did I like the show? Did I enjoy the show that I found out existed and then immediately had to experience for 28 hours? I love the Sphinx. <laughs> I liked a lot of the characters. I love Puss in Boots. I do. It was nice to have so much Puss in Boots content. I really enjoyed Dulcinea. The orphans kind of ran their course jokes-wise, but I liked their Tifius. I liked the Duchess. A lot of the villains were pretty cool. The Blood Wolf was awesome. I loved season four, having that tangible build up to a really cool bad guy. It left these crumbs about Dulcinea's eventual fate, the prophecy stuff, all the reveals. There was still fun bits and like intercharacter connections and moments. It was awesome. You should watch season four. You're gonna be missing some of the like context, but yeah, you'll be all right. You're a grown up. You'll you'll get it. And I did really like the final two episodes of the whole show as well. They were really fast and dense and they had a lot of payoff, which is what I needed after all of this. <laughs> Obviously it's a children's show and the slow pacing, the filler episodes, all of that are good. They're normal. The characters are simple and fun. The jokes are good. This is a great show for children to experience over the span of many weeks. I just don't think slamming 28 hours of it in three days was good or helpful or fun. And I don't recommend that you try it because now I'm so sad about Puss in Boots. Next. It's day 11, the final day. And I am still stuck in the adventures of Puss in Boots. Puss in Boots Trapped in an Epic Tale 2017 is a 30-ish minute long interactive special that was put directly on Netflix where the rest of the TV show lives. The special was released during and set during season four, which you'll remember is the best season of the show. So good. It has nothing to do with the events of season four. And I don't know why it matters that that's where it's set, but that is where it is. It is set. This interactive special begins with Puss in Boots finding a storybook called Adventures of Puss in Boots. And he opens it up, excited to see a story about himself and gets sucked inside of the book. A narrator called The Storyteller starts narrating everything that Puss is doing and immediately giving very Stanley Parable vibes. The Storyteller lets us know that he controls everything except that the Storyteller is controlled by eldritch forces. That's us. We're the Eldritch Forces. And honestly, I cannot think of a single better thing to be called. Eldritch Forces? Yes, please. And then the interactive portion of the interactive special begins. It's a choose your own adventure. Um, If you don't choose, if you wait too long, the choice is made for you. And you can always go back and choose the the branch that you didn't pick earlier. For example, the very first choice is should Puss in Boots fight a god that turns out to be Tyrannus or a tree? Fight a god? What if I do not want to? But sort of no matter what you pick, you end up following the same structure to the end. Uh, Puss in Boots has to try and get to the end of the book by going through different fairy tales and also trying to determine who the storyteller is. Puss goes through the story of Goldilocks, of Snow White, uh, Little Bo Peep gets mentioned. You get to make choices, like if the three bears and Goldilocks are gonna be friendly or if they're gonna be mean. Over in Snow White, you get to choose if Puss in Boots is going to kiss Snow White, who's uh, being played by Senora Zapata, the uh, orphanage owner in this version, or go find the evil queen for another way out. And the evil queen is Dulcinea. (laughs) Magic mirror over there. Who's the fairest of the fair? In the Snow White portion, the dwarves are being played by the thieves, the bandits, uh, but they're really small. (laughs) It was such a good choice. Are you meant to be dwarves? Should there not be seven of you? Don't believe everything you hear in the lamestream media, man. 
and Dulcinea portraying the evil queen uh, kind of slays. Honestly, the outfit's good. You, me, us, the eldritch forces can go through and make all your choices, but eventually Puss realizes that the world is a, a painting and he can break right through it. And the storyteller all along was Fartholomew Fishflinger, that really important, relevant villain from The Adventures of Puss in Boots, 2015 to 2018. Uh, and he is a mouse again now. Puss and Fartholomew Fishflinger fight. Puss in Boots breaks Fartholomew's magic pen that is allowing him to maintain all this magic. And Puss in Boots is sent back to the real world. Puss puts the book back where he found it, saying that not all stories need to be read and that maybe this one's a little bit dangerous. And then he just walks away where the book is immediately picked up and opened by Artifius, who gets sucked inside of it. And that's where it ends. I love a good choose your own adventure. I think this was really fun. It's always nice to see familiar models in new outfits playing new roles. Uh, decent time. If you don't want to go through and watch all of the adventures of Puss in Boots 2015 to 2018, which, you know, I wouldn't recommend you do, you could go onto Netflix and enjoy a half an hour of the same vibes and animation style and some of the same characters. A good small dose. Next. She was looking down with finger and thumb in the shape of a nail on her head. Shrek Retold 2018 is one of the best things I've ever seen. This green eyeshadow is not only incredibly patchy and hard to work with, I think I have discovered I'm allergic to it. That's why it's only on this much of my face. Hello? Shrek Retold 2018 is why we needed to talk about Shrek is Love, Shrek is Life, because I needed to give some context for this. Yeah, I never felt so alive. What are these thoughts inside my mind? Could it be love? Could it be love for the very first time? This is a full recreation of Shrek 2001 made by fans. It was spearheaded by a man named Grant Duffin, uh, also known by his online name, 3GI. Over 200 people worked on this. Crazy amounts of effort. Watching Shrek Retold 2018 is an experiment in Whiplash. Some of the contributors created amazing animation segments for this. They're smooth, they're fluid, they're bright, they're colorful, they're fun to look at, and then it instantly transitions into live action shitposting. And there's no warning either way. The voiceover shifts just as often as the visuals, which changes just as often as the music and the tone. <laughs> It's incredible. And it is a representation to me of the cultural staying power of Shrek. This came out in 2018. That is 17 years after Shrek 2001 came out. That is eight years after Shrek Forever After 2010 came out. That's seven years after Puss in Boots 2011 came out, which was the last full length DreamWorks Shrek spinoff movie. And still here we are. Shrek Retold 2018 also serves as a great encapsulation of what my brain looks like here and now on day 11, completely consumed by Shrek and Shrek content. Watching this all the way through in one sitting made me feel like I had really and truly lost it. So it's perfect, and damn it if it wasn't nice to see Shrek again. Not, not my Shrek, necessarily, but he was present in spirit. Shrek Retold 2018 is honestly so hard to talk about. It's difficult to describe. There's live action segments, animated segments, stop motion, it's all original voice work, song covers of the songs in the Shrek soundtrack. The all-star cover at the beginning of this is so soft and beautiful, and it is paired with the visuals of a man in a Shrek suit gallivanting about. And I don't know, I don't know what else to tell you about it. 
It's a faithful recreation of Shrek 2001. Earnestly put together by people who love Shrek and his meme status so much, they poured in days and weeks of their human lives. There is also a segment done by Chris Chan. So if that name means literally anything to you, and you watch Shrek Retold 2018, prepare for that jump scare. And if that name doesn't mean anything to you, I'm not going to explain Christian to you. Don't look it up. You don't need to fall down their rabbit hole. We are here for Shrek. If this concept sounds even a little bit interesting to you, I recommend checking it out. Support Ernest Fanworks. Enjoy Shrek, okay, as the Lord intended it to be enjoyed. It's on YouTube for free. Uh, there was also a time where you could buy copies of Shrek Retold 2018. Remember again, it came out in 2018 um, on VHS, on 3GI's website. Those are unfortunately sold out. You can't get the VHS copies anymore. You can still buy it on Blu-ray. Shrek Retold 2018 is obnoxious. Uh, I could do without some of the like South Park references and the lol random and gross out animation of it in places. It is bizarre. It is tonally dissonant. It is sensory overload. And I'm obsessed with it. It's so impressive that this exists. And apparently there is a Shrek 2 retold in the works. Looking forward to it. 3GI, the man who spearheaded and put this together, also hosts a Shrek Fest every year in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. This man is the Shrek fan. And it was really important to me to bring up things like Shrek Retold 2018 and to a lesser extent, Shrek is Life, Shrek is Life 2013, because I 100% believe that enduring fan works and interest in this franchise is what spurred confirmation that there are still talks to produce Shrek 5 after 13 years with no Shrek movie. Though I think there's also one other big thing that spurred that announcement. Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, 2022, a movie that came out 11 years after its predecessor, after a decade of true development hell. I don't know if anyone actually expected this movie to get completed and made, much less for this movie to receive critical and financial success to be nominated for Best Animated Feature at the 2022 Oscars. Uh, it lost to Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio, which is fun, because Guillermo del Toro uh, also worked on this movie for a time. Puss in Boots The Last Fish 2022 is stunning. It's amazing. Audiences loved it. Critics were so surprised that it was even decent, much less very good, and I actually hadn't watched it until today. So I'm so excited to tell you about it. Puss in Boots, The Last Fish 2022 is set after Shrek Forever After 2010. Uh, that makes this the furthest thing in the timeline that we have experienced. Puss in Boots gave us both the earliest thing in the timeline with the Adventures of Puss in Boots TV show and the latest thing in the timeline with this. And, and you may be asking, do we need to know anything from the Adventures of Puss in Boots 2015 to 2018? You already know we don't. Babe, he has long forgotten that white furred lady and all those orphans. His life is ogres and parties now. The beginning voiceover tells us that long ago, a wishing star fell to earth and it has one last wish left in it, waiting to be granted to whomever may find it. And then we cut to Puss in Boots partying and singing in a town called Del Mar in the governor's house while the governor's not home. He's a hero, everybody loves him, the town has made him a little theme song, they're all grooving. The animation, immediately, is so bright, it's stylized, and beautiful. After 28 hours of The Adventures of Puss in Boots animation, Seeing this movie, just, just the visuals of it, could bring tears to my eyes. The governor comes home and demands that Puss in Boots be killed, and the band plays Puss in Boots' little theme song that they made for him while he fights off the town guard. Uh, Puss in 
In the scuffle, he sets off some fireworks, and those fireworks and all the noise awakes the sleeping giant of Del Mar, which Puss must then defeat in battle. The action is so bouncy and flowy. There's bits where it slows down and gets really choppy to emphasize things that are going on. The colors are so pretty. The soundtrack is so lively, a perfectly matched to what's going on. And Puss wins. Surprise! And then he's luxuriating in his victory in front of the townsfolk, and he is crushed to death by a large bell. I call this one, the legend will never die! And thus is the end of Puss in Boots. JK, Puss wakes up in a hospital where a doctor asks how many times he has died, and Puss has to count. <laughs> <laughs> to see how many lives he's got left. We see a montage of increasingly silly ways that he died, including death by allergy and a uh, gingy cameo. Gingerbread man cameo. I am so starved for Shrek characters. <laughs> Turns out Puss in Boots has died eight times, including that bell incident. Out of nine total lives, he is on his very last life. The doctor recommends he retire and gives him a business card to Mama Luna's Cat Rescue. And Puss says, no thank you, and then goes to a bar to drink his sorrows away with some heavy cream. While at the bar, Puss hears an ominous whistle. <laughs> and a wolf in a black hood appears seemingly out of nowhere to sit next to him. Puss assumes he's a bounty hunter. Puss in Boots has wanted posters everywhere. That makes sense. And this wolf fights him, wounds him, and disarms him. Puss in Boots' lives flash before his eyes and Shrek, Shrek cameo, Shrek and Donkey cameo hits her boys. It's just for a second. It's just for a second and they don't talk, but they're there. They are there. Also, we see Imelda again, Puss in Boots' adoptive mother from Puss in Boots 2011, and Kitty Softpaws. No, um, no Dulcinea or San Lorenzo, which is fine because repression would be my chosen coping mechanism in that situation as well. And in fact, is probably the one I'm going to take on for me personally. At the end of this fight, the wolf advancing on him, Puss flees through the sewers and leaves his sword behind. And the wolf, again with his ominous whistle, is in pursuit. Puss flees to Mama Luna's cat rescue. He buries and abandons his clothes, holding himself a funeral and making a little grave site for himself. Mama Luna names him Pickles and insists he acts like a regular cat, just like every other cat there. And he's resistant at first, but he assimilates and also grows a beard. And this is where Puss meets Perito, a chihuahua who's in a little sweater disguised as a cat who also talks. Uh, Perito lives under the porch, but he does come inside for food and he's ready to be Puss's best friend. And he also plans to be a therapy dog someday. <gasps> oh no, want over my belly? And this is where we meet Goldilocks and the three bears. They want to hire Puss in Boots to steal a map from Big Jack Horner that would reveal the location of the wishing star. So they have tracked him all the way here to Mama Luna's cat rescue. But they do not recognize him. This is definitely not Puss in Boots! I found him! Puss in Boots. Dead and buried. And they find that grave that he made. So they leave to go get the map themselves. But having heard all their plans, Puss in Boots realizes he could just use the wishing star to restore all his lost lives. He just has to go get it. And now he knows who has it. Big Jack Horner. So off he goes. And Perito comes with... Big Jack Horner owns a bakery empire. He runs this really dark, industrial-looking bakery, and he has a trophy room full of hundreds of powerful magical items. He's very jealous and resentful towards magical creatures. Um, he spent his childhood performing his own nursery rhyme to sell his pies, but was always outshone by other various creatures. Pinocchio cameo. P Pinocchio cameo. 
I know the cameos are supposed to be fun, but every time one showed up, I was like, ha! <laughs> my guys. <laughs> it was fun, but it also elevated my heart rate. It was very... <laughs> Big Jack Horner wants to be the master of all magic. He wants the wishing star so that he can take away everybody else's magic and be the only one that can control it, which is such a noble and heroic. He's the villain. He's the villain. <laughs> also, he's voiced by John Mulaney. Break with the box! After so many years of searching, this is my moment. Which is a crazy choice for this character design. <laughs> voice actors who only do the one voice. I love you. I respect you. You're so distracting. Happy to have you here, John. So Puss in Boots breaks in to Horner's bakery and he gets the map, the map that will lead to the wishing star in hand, but he is stopped by Kitty Softpaws. <gasps> Kitty Softpaws in this movie is established to be Puss's ex-fiance. The most fraught relationship you could possibly have. <laughs> ex-fiance is so brutal. That's so brutal. Kitty Softpaws is here double crossing the bears to get the map. But who else crashes in but Baby Bear, quickly followed by Mama Papa and Goldie, also here to get the map, and them crashing through the ceiling alerts Horner. Everybody sees each other. All of these characters established, they do know <laughs> each other, and they have antagonistic relationships. Uh, so Puss Puss grabs the map and gets out of there. He escapes with Kitty Softpaws and Perito in a cart, and they go off to follow the map. Kitty's very glad to see that Puss has a therapy dog because Finally, you need therapy. And as they are leaving the bakery, Puss sees the wolf in the crowd of people. Horner loads up a bottomless Mary Poppins bag with all his magical items to go after Puss and also packs up 13 bakers to help him out. Uh, Goldilocks and her three bears are also in pursuit. Everybody's coming for this map. Everybody's going for that star. The map leads them to the Dark Forest, which is a sort of separate dimension that they have to enter. And the Dark Forest's landscape changes based on whoever's holding the map. When Puss in Boots holds the map, the Dark Forest is full of lava and the path requires a very dangerous, violent, heroic quest. When Kitty Softpaws holds it, there's big pools of acid and the path requires facing trials of sorrow and loneliness, babe. And when Perito holds it, the whole world is flowers and sunshine. So um, th they let Perito man the map. You hold the map. Really? Three bears and Goldie show up into the dark forest. Goldie telling the bears that when she gets her wish, everything is going to be better for all of them. Everybody's gonna get what they want. What kind of wish can do all that, Goldie? Oh, I can't tell ya. If you say what your wish is and it don't come true. Further down the path, we find that Perito's dark forest requires them to take their time, smell the roses, be appreciative of the world around them. Kitty Softpaws calls him corny and asks for his backstory, which is Perito's family tried to get rid of him over and over and over again, but he always found his way back, silly little game they were playing. So they put him in a sock with a rock in it and threw him in the river. His little sweater that he's wearing is the sock that his family tried to drown him in. Hey, buddy. I got a great story and a free sweater out of it. Win, win. Dude, you didn't win. This movie is about accepting the inevitability of death and appreciating the life that you have. And I guess Perito is the best example of that. But oh my god. Kitty Softpaws bonds with Perito. She really likes this weird little dog. And she also shaves off uh, Puss's beard, finally, when he asks. Because um, he hated it. And the two of them continue to bicker and argue. And they keep bringing up Santa Coloma. But we don't have time to get into that right now because Horner is also here in the dark forest with his crew of bakers and his carriage and a bunch of his guys get eaten 
by the big flowers and he's misusing all of his magic items. He's treating the phoenix, a, a beautiful magical creature, as a flamethrower. He has no disregard for any life whatsoever and also believes that all magic is just to be controlled at his will. He's real fun. You're losing a lot of man. I'm not really stressing about the manpower. Horner, Goldie, the Bears, Puss, Kitty, Perito, all get in an altercation, all fighting for the map. Horner's accidentally killing a lot of his own guys. And Puss in Boots sees the wolf during the fight and panics and runs off, meaning that Goldie gets her hands on the map and the entire world transforms into a nostalgia forest. Perito chases after Puss and calms down his panic attack. This scene got a lot of attention after this movie came out for being an incredible, beautiful portrayal of a panic attack, and it's very intense. It's a very intense scene. Puss admits to Perito that he is on his last life and that he is afraid, which he finds unbecoming of his own legendary status, his own station, and the way that he views himself. Kitty Softpaws sneaks up just in time to eavesdrop on the part of the conversation where Puss admits that Santa Coloma, which he and Kitty keep referencing, was not a battle, was not a town, it was a church that he and Kitty were supposed to get married in, but Puss never went to the wedding. That's right. He left her on their wedding day. Puss in Boots does later apologize directly to Kitty for this, telling her that that day was the first time he ever felt fear. I don't believe you, dude. I really don't. And then Kitty reveals she also never went to the church on their wedding day. Uno reverse, she left him at the altar. Because she came to the realization that Puss would never love anyone more than he loved himself and she could not compete with that so she also just didn't show up i don't know if she knew that he left her at the altar she must have she was very much acting like he did goldie and the three bears find in the nostalgia forest their own cabin they frolic about for a bit in their chairs with their porridge, their beds, you know, the story of the three bears. And they also see a little vision of the day that Goldie broke in and stole their hearts. The day when our world became just right. Thank you, Mama Bear. I will cry. Kitty Softpaws tells Puss in Boots they might be able to share the wish, that they could have a wish together that would get them both what they wanted. So they go and they steal the map back from Goldie. But in the process, Perito gets stuck with Goldie and the bears. And when they run off, Puss gets trapped in a crystal cave alone. So Kitty has to go back for Perito by herself. As Kitty heads back for Perito, Goldie and the bears build a giant bear trap with Perito in the middle as Baby and Goldie trade insults with each other. And then Perito jumps in to this fun game where we're insulting each other and he gets to swear as much as he wants because his curse words are bleeped out. And this boy, he says a lot. Thank you, nugget. And your snooter. <laughs> I would give anything for the writers to just type up an, an uncensored version of what they think Perito was calling Goldie and Baby. I want to know. I want to know. Perito does end by telling Goldie that she won the orphan lottery because she ended up with such an incredible family that loves her. And then Kitty Softpaw swoops in and saves him and takes him away. <laughs> Back in that crystal cave, Puss in Boots meets his egotistical past lives, who all start roasting him for being soft and scared and not being as devil may care as the rest of them. You know, the one that's down to his last life. And then sauntering in, smashing all of the crystals with the past lives in them, is the wolf who reveals himself to Puss as death. Theoretically, or any other fancy way, I'm death straight up. And because Puss has no care for all of his lives and he's already had more than most will ever have, death has come to collect his last life early as payment for the disrespect. Puss panics and makes a dash for the wishing star alone so he can immediately wish for all of his lives back so he doesn't have to face this without Kitty, without Perito, and they see him making this escape and believe that they have been betrayed. 
Goldilocks finally tells the three bears what her wish is going to be. And it's for her biological family. It's so that she can finally have a proper family. And the bears are all devastated. Well, I'll get something. We'll just stick around until the poets has come. Hey, Goldie. But Mama Bear says if that is what is going to make Goldie happy, then they will all help her get it. This is something that will actively make them all sad, will make their life worse, but it's what their girl wants, so they will fight tooth and nail to the end to help her get it. I love the bears. I love Goldie and the bears. I think they're the best part of this movie, and Puss in Boots is in this movie. At the Wishing Star, Puss begins to make his wish to get his lives back, and Kitty Softpaws appears to scold him for being selfish and abandoning her. And Perito, also for abandoning Perito. The wish that Kitty was going to make would have been to finally, finally find someone she could trust. And Puss finally breaks and tells her that he is on his last life, that he has to do this, that he has to get them back. And Kitty says she still can't compete with his one true love. Him himself. Goldie, the bears, Horner and Horner's last surviving baker that he brought with arrive to fight for the map and for control of the wish. In this fight, Goldie abandons the map at one point to go save Baby Bear because she's the smash and he's the grab. <laughs> and that's her brother. The last baker dies because Horner won't even turn around for a second to save their life. And then Kitty Softpaws traps him in his own endless Mary Poppins bag. Perito tells Puss that maybe one life is enough, that if you live it correctly, that's all you need. And that is when death arrives at the wishing star. Who's that? He's here for me. He challenges Puss to a duel and finally gives Puss his sword back. He hasn't had it all movie. Puss accepts the duel, and they fight! Uh. At the end of this fight, Puss accepts that he can never beat death, that it is inevitable, that it will be coming for him, but that he is going to fight for his last life as long as he has to. Now that Puss has learned this lesson, and he's not this arrogant little man who doesn't value the sanctity of his own life, death spares him, under the agreement, of course, that they will meet again someday, and he leaves. You know we will meet again, right? Si, hasta la muerte. Puss tells Kitty that she can have the wish, but she already has what she wished for. Inside the endless nanny bag, Horner eats a magic snack that lets him grow huge and escape. Uh, he gets control of the map. He starts to wish to control all the magic. And then Perito distracts him with the big eye cute face that he learned from Kitty Softpaws. The distraction works just long enough for Puss, Kitty, and Goldie to destroy the map, all working together. And the wishing star implodes and destroys Horner along with it. Hey, sidebar, is this for real the fourth feminine man who desires limitless power being murdered in this franchise? I guess uh, third, because Rumpel was just captured indefinitely. He wasn't murdered. At least this one isn't trying to be king, because that would be, you know, one too many. <laughs> Why is this the only villain they know how to do? Goldie tells the bears that they're her real family, and the four of them go to take over Horner's bakery, now that there's a sort of power vacuum occurring over there. Puss and Kitty are going to give it another go. Perito helps them steal a ship from Del Mar, and they sail off to far, far away with a Shrek motif in the soundtrack. I literally forgot to be excited for Shrek 5 until that happened. <laughs> And that's how the movie ends. Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, 2022. Everyone said it was great, and everyone was correct. 
I do have to say, because I am the resident Shrek expert who knows all the lore and watched all of the Adventures of Puss in Boots 2015 to 2018, it is very funny to me to compare Death to the Blood Wolf. They're quite similar in design. Different motivations, obviously. They're very different characters. But I do think it's funny to imagine Puss in Boots meeting this and being like, fuck, not this again. <laughs> is Puss in Boots The Last Rush 2022 some sort of masterpiece that we've never seen before? No. Is it a very, very good family movie? Yes. The Shrek franchise, I have realized, is at its core about acceptance. Self-acceptance is a huge one, that sort of self-love, accepting your own self for who you are and recognizing that whoever you are is good and worth it and you don't have to be at the mercy of other people's expectations. There's also themes of accepting other people, not being one of the forces that that hoists expectations that are unwanted on other folks. That, that self-acceptance message broadened to everyone else. Accepting your own situation, your own life, loving what you have, and trying not to yearn for greener pastures, which is of course normal, but you also have to find the beauty in your own life, your own family. And taking that idea of the acceptance of your life, your situation even further, to accepting the inevitability of death, which is sort of the darkest and most profound way you can take it, but it works really well. And it fits into the ideas and the themes of the franchise overall. And it gave us a great movie that is so good to look at. It's so pretty. I could not, in good faith, recommend that you do what I have done to prepare for the fast approach of Shrek 5, which is definitely finally happening after years of being told that it's coming. But I do recommend you watch Puss in Boots 2011 and Puss in Boots The Last Wish 2022 if you haven't. You don't need to watch The Adventures of Puss in Boots 2015 to 2018, though. That's okay. And now that we have an understanding of the themes of the entire franchise and all of the information that we have gathered, all of the lore that we understand, we can deduce the real plot of Shrek 5, which will probably be about the ogre triplets going through puberty or something. Felicia's rebellious streak and Shrek learning how to be a good dad again, playing on the inherent tension of a father not understanding his daughter. Fiona and Shrek will argue because their, their upbringings taught them different things. Donkey will be oblivious to social cues. An effeminate man will, uh, will lust for power and, and then be killed for it. The Dronkies will still be infants somehow, and Puss in Boots will find a third soulmate. Dragon saves the day. Thelonious rots beneath Dulok. And no one mourns for Mongo. How did all of this even start? Some. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. I hereby pronounce you a Shrekspert. Here is your certificate. Your mother will be very proud. I'm very proud. That's right. I, you're, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm sorry that this meager token is all I can offer you after you have sat through the entirety of this video. I don't know how long it's going to be. I've been on an 11 day spiral just to get it recorded. So I do hope that you've enjoyed this peek into what all of Shrek does to a man. And I hope that you're excited to go into Shrek 5 with all of your facts and figures and lore straight, because now you can be the guy in the audience loudly pointing out when things mildly grind against existing semi-canon. And the world will thank you for it, I'm sure. Thank you for joining me. I'm going to go finish packing because I have to move in two days, but I'm not ready because I instead decided to watch all of Shrek. I did it. I moved. Don't make fun of it. I'm not done with moving. I am done with Shrek. Thank you for being on this journey with me. I hope you learned something. For me, it's been a month since I went through that whole gauntlet, but for you, you just finished. Did you like it? Please tell me. Comment about it. Like the video. Subscribe to the channel. And if you wish you could have seen the first nearly hour and a half of this early before anybody else, you should have been on my Patreon, baby. <laughs> that would, of course, be patreon.com slash Whip. 
Jack, that's my name. And you could join my beautiful, stunning, ethereal patrons over there, such as A Bitter Taste Of, Amalia, Beard Acknowledge, Foolery with Nori, Jane, John Haynes, JT Frazier, Kathleen, Lawson, Martine, Marty R., Oski the Bard, and Rebecca B., as well as all of the folks whose names you are seeing. If you want updates about things that I'm working on, sneak freaks and previews of videos that are on their way, uh, extra pictures of my beautiful son who's currently sitting on the floor, and exclusive extra videos every month, hop on over again. That's patreon.com slash Haley Whip Jack. <laughs> The real joke of this video is that I don't think we're getting Shrek 5. I don't think it's coming. I think it's a lie. I think it's a joke. I think I did all of this for nothing. And that you watched all of this for... That's right, the honor of becoming a Shrekspert. You nailed it!